Chapter 12 Spells to Dust High magic is strange and savage and splendid for its own sake, whether one's spells change the realms or no. A crafter who by dint of luck, work, skill, and the great Lady Mistra comes to some strength in art is like a thirsty drunk in a wine cellar. He or she can never leave it alone. Who can blame such a one? It is not given to all to feel the kiss of such power. Illustrial, High Lady of Silvery Moon, A Harper's Song, Year of the Dying Stars. Yasail slipped softly into the bedchamber. Alistal straightened from dragging the chest aside, and they shared a smile. Worth hearing? Yasail asked softly. Alistal nodded. I'll tell you later. They crept to the bed. Among the twisted covers, Narm and Chantrel lay asleep in each other's arms. The lady mages gently laid a fur coverlet over the sleeping couple before Ysail leaned close to Chandral and said, "'Tis time. Rise, hurler of spellfire. Elminster awaits.' Chandral shivered in her sleep and clutched Narm more tightly. "'Oh, Narm, how it burns!' The lady mages exchanged glances. Carefully, Yasail laid a hand on Chandral's shoulder. Heat tingled under her fingertips. She holds yet more power, Yasail whispered, and this cannot be of the bal here. Things are as Elminster suspected. She bent again to Chandral's ear. Awaken, Shan. We await. Eyelashes flickered. Norm? Narm, we're called to... Oh, where? Chandral lifted her head. In the leaping glow of the lamp Alistal lit, she saw the two ladies of art standing over her. She involuntarily tensed to hurl spellfire, and then relaxed. My pardon, Lady Yasail, Lady Alistal, for a moment I knew you not. She shook her head ruefully. Up, love, arise. Uh, oh, gods, tis time already. It is, Yasail said gently. Elminster awaits. God's belt, Narm growled, rubbing his eyes and flinging back the fur. Just as hastily, he pulled it up again. Ah, uh, my clothes... Chandral laughed helplessly and handed him his robe. Alistal smiled. We'll await outside the door. Come when you're ready. In the passage, she turned and whispered, Tell no one yet, yes, but the symbol came in by the window and listened, even as I did. Eyebrows lifted. What did you hear, aside from lovemaking? The life tale of Norm Tamaraith, full open and unadorned. His mother may well have been a harper, Alistal replied. They both had cause to thank that mysterious group of bards and others who served the realms. Yasail nodded. He thinks so. Alistal shook her head. The thought hasn't crossed his mind. Twas his description. The door opened, and the two hastily dressed guests stepped out. Norm looked at the ladies curiously. I mean no disrespect, but is there a secret way into this room? That chest... We workers of art have our secrets, Alistal replied crisply. I dragged it. Oh, Norm said. I see. Uh, sorry. They descended the stairs, nodded to the guards, and went out into the night. It was very warm and still. Selyun shone overhead, and Merith and Lancerel waited with mules. Well met, the elf said softly. Where are we bound? 
Shandrel asked as he knelt to help her into the saddle. Harper's Hill, Merith replied, a name that meant nothing to either Narm or Shandrel, and they set off. Save for its heights, cloaked in silver moonlight, Shadowdale lay dark around them. Narm spotted guard posts atop the tower, on the old Skull Tor, by the bridge, and at the crossroads ahead. Silently, the guards watched as the small party rode through the dale, east into the trees. It was very dark, and the mules slowed to a walk on the narrow forest trail. Someone by the path saluted Merith. As they passed, Shandrel saw a grim man in dark leather, a sword ready in his hand. A harper, Ysail explained. There will be others. The forest changed as they went. The trees became larger, older, and closer together. The dark stillness deepened. Thrice more they passed guards, and at last came up a steep slope onto a bare hilltop. On the smooth earth, moonlight lay like a sheet of silver. Torm and Rathen waited at the edge of the light. More leather-clad harpers, men and women, bareheaded with swords drawn, stood beyond. The thief and priest greeted Narm and Shandrel with quiet smiles and encouraging pats. They took their mules. Merith drew Narm to one side, proffering a cloak. Remove your clothes and leave them here, he said. Cover yourself with this. A little way along the hillside, Ysail did the same with Shandrel. Boots, too. The ground's soft. Will this be dangerous? Narm asked Merith. The elf shrugged. I, but no more than spending your night any other way. Come, off with it all, lad. The newly robed couple were brought together again. Norm saw Shandrel shiver. He doubted it was from cold and reached for her, but the two knights stepped smoothly between. Taking their hands, they strode at a brisk pace to the top of Harper's Hill. Elminster stood in the moonlight at the center of the hill, flanked by Florin and Storm. As Shandrel and Narm were brought to them, Elminster scratched his nose and said, "'Sorry to get ye from bed for all this mystery and ceremony, but tis necessary. I need to know thy powers. Shall we begin?' The earlier to be done. The knights embraced Narm and Shandrel, and then left them alone with the old mage. He drew from his robes a small, battered book and handed it to Shandrel. First, can ye read this? The book was old, but on its brown and crinkled pages, runes sparkled clear and bright. Shandrel stared at them, but she recognized nothing. Even as she looked, the runes writhed and crawled, moving as if alive. She shook her head and handed the book back. No, she said, rubbing her eyes. Elminster nodded, opened the book to a certain page, and extended it to Narm. And ye... Only this page, mind, and at the top only. Tell me the words aloud as fast as ye can make them out. Norm nodded, peered, and said, Being a means both efficient and correct for the creation of... Elminster waved him to silence, took the book back, and selected another page. Norm looked longer this time, Forehead furrowed. I... I... A means to confound, I think it says here, Narm said at last. But I can't be sure, nor is a word more clear to me anywhere on this page. 
Elminster nodded. Enough, and well enough. He turned to Shandrill. How do you feel? Shandrill looked at him with a little frown. Well, in head and body, or at least nothing amiss, but there is a stirring, a tingling. Elminster nodded, as if unsurprised, and looked to Norm. Have ye any spells or cantrips in thy head? Norm shook his head. No, I've scarce had time to study since... His voice trailed off under Elminster's grin. Aye, and good, the wizard told him. From somewhere else in his robes, he drew forth a scroll and handed it to Norm. Read this and cast it at thy lady. Tis but a light spell. Have no fears of harming her. He stepped back to watch. Norm glanced around the bare, moonlit hilltop, feeling the watching eyes amid the trees. He took a deep breath and then carefully cast the spell. He centered the art on Chandril, who stood waiting. Light flared around her, but instantly died away. Elminster strode close to peer at Chandril. Nodding at the fire in her eyes, he handed another scroll to Narm. As before! Narm cast another light spell. Again, it was absorbed. Chandril's eyes glowed brighter. A third scroll, a third casting, and Chandril's body took it in. The old mage waved at Narm to back away and went to Chandril. She reached out in welcome, but he stepped back so as not to touch her. Lady, see yon boulder. Shatter it with spellfire, if ye will. Chandra looked at him, trembling. Fire leapt in her eyes. Yes. Fire coiled and raced within her, roiling in her veins. She bore down on it with her will and thrust it into one arm. It built to a soundless thunder. Spellfire burst from her hand in a long, rolling gout. The boulder was enveloped in orange flame that built to a blinding white inferno. Watchers felt heat on their faces. An instant later, the rock shattered with a sharp crack, spraying shards across the hillside. Chandril let her flames die away, and silence fell. It stretched for a long time. Elminster turned to Narm and growled warningly. Stand back, over beneath that tree. The young mage hastened to obey. Beside him, Merith gave a tight smile, but his eyes scarcely left the hilltop. Narm stared back into the moonlight, too, in time to see the white-bearded old wizard cast a light spell of his own at Chandril. It, too, was absorbed. Elminster cast two more light spells, using no scrolls, and Chandril's body drank them. Her eyes flamed like burning coals. The old mage wove a more complex spell, creating a shimmering, translucent wall in the air, what mages called a wall of force. Elminster nodded to it. Chandril obligingly raised her hands and hurled spellfire. The flames clawed at the wall and raged, becoming blinding as Chandril bent her full will upon the barrier. At last, she gave up and let her flame die, shrugging. The wall still stood. Elminster asked, How do ye feel? Chandril shrugged, a little scared, but not hurt. She pushed with her will, letting flames leap from her palms and then wink out, in a little spurt. I hold more yet. 
The old wizard's response was swift. I'll raise a wall of fire there before thee. When I nod, kneel before it and hurl spell fire through it, angling into the sky so as not to harm the forest. Only a little mind. Cast it for the length of a long breath, then cease. Chandral smiled, flames dancing in her eyes. As you will, a short but steady burst. No sooner had Elminster raised the wall of flames than Chandral knelt and sent spellfire roaring through it. Fire snarled into the night air, drawing the mage's flames with it. When the burst ended, curling away with a rippling and tearing of air, the wall was gone. Tendrils dimmed and vanished in the starlit sky. Chandral rose from her knees and sighed. Are ye well? Elminster asked, his voice alert. Chandral nodded, and the old mage added, Right, then, raised his hands, and without warning hurled a bolt of lightning at her. It crackled and struck, and Chandral reeled. Narm cried out involuntarily, but already his lady was standing upright again, and the lightning was gone. The sharp smell of the bolt hung in the air. She turned, bleeding a little where she'd bitten her lip, and smiled reassuringly at Narm. Elminster took a step closer. How fare ye now? Well enough. She wore the ghost of a smile. I feel weary, but not sick or strange. Good, the old mage said gently. I shall cast more lightning at thee. Gather and hold it as long as ye can. If it starts to hurt thee, or ye feel it trying to burst out and cannot stop it, let it flow into yon boulder. Release it not until then, so that I may learn thy capacity. We have healing means near at hand. Be not afraid. Chandral nodded and stood waiting, hands at her sides. She flinched when the next lightning struck her, but then stood quiet. Elminster hurled bolt after bolt at, no, into her. The very air crackled. Norm twisted his hands, but could not look away. The old mage poured more bolts into Chandril. She stood silent and unmoving. Lightning arced over Harper's Hill. At last, she bent at the waist with a sob, threw her arms wide, and burst into a pillar of coiling flame. Mother Mistra, Norm gasped in horror. Merith laid hands on him quickly to prevent his running to a fiery death. Norm screamed his beloved's name, wrenching and twisting in vain. Through sheer fury, he dragged the silent elf forward until Florin set his strength against the young mages. Norm struggled in their combined grip. On the hilltop, a pillar of living flame writhed where Chandral had stood. Abruptly, flames shot from it, lancing to strike the boulder. There was a flash, and everyone who stood watching ducked. Small, red-hot shards of stone showered down through the leaves around them. Yasail hastily worked a wall of force from a scroll she held ready. Lancerel used muttered magic to quench many little fires. A smoking scar was all that remained of the boulder. On the summit, a pillar of flame roared, higher than the twisted tower, as if to touch the glimmering stars. Elminster watched it calmly, a fragment of stone cooling in his hands. Slowly, the roaring flames died, faded to an angry red, and winked out. Chandral stood nude in the moonlight, sniffing at the stench of her own scorched hair. Its ends were burned, 
but she was otherwise untouched. Her cloak had burned to nothing, but the flames hadn't marked her. Narm burst free of Merith and Florin and ran across the hot stone, heedless of the pain in his bare feet. Elminster moved to intercept him, and Chandral backed away. Keep back, love, she warned sharply. My touch may slay just now. Norm came to a halt barely a pace away. I'm well, she added gently. Her long hair rippled and stirred in the calm air as if with a life of its own. Norm stared at her, terror and worry warring on his face. When she smiled again, he whirled to face Elminster. And what now? I'll touch thy lady myself to end the test, the old mage replied firmly. I'm protected by potent spells where ye are not. A moment longer, lad, if ye can contain yourself. If ye cannot, expect not to live long or rise far in the art. He strode forward and took Chandral's hand in his own. Well met, sir, Chandral said, greeting him with grave courtesy. At thy service, fair lady, Elminster replied, bowing. His face was expressionless, but his eyes twinkled. Norm shook his fists in impatience. Is she safe? The old mage nodded, and was fairly bowled over by Narm's rush to embrace his lady. Elminster stepped back with a wry smile and waved at the trees. Harpers, knights, and guardsmen of the dale appeared from all sides at a swift trot. Elminster looked almost fondly at Narm and Chandral, then smote his forehead. Gods, I must be getting old. He swept his cloak about Chandral's shoulders. As he did, the stone he held twisted from his grasp, landing with a thump rather than a clatter. In an instant, it grew into a strange-eyed woman in tattered robes. Her long, silvery hair strayed wildly about her shoulders. Approaching harpers reached for their blades. Well met, Elminster greeted her calmly. Chandral Chassaire, I present to thee the symbol, Queen of Aglarond. A murmur broke over Harper's Hill, followed by silence. Everyone waited for the infamous archmage to speak. Chandral gently freed herself from Narm, and bowed solemnly. The symbol almost smiled. Impressive, young lady, but dangerous, perhaps too dangerous. Elminster, all of you, have you thought on this? Here stands a power you might need to silence. She may have to be destroyed. There was another brief babble, and another hush. Chandral stared white-faced at the archmage, but Elminster stepped between her and the witch queen. No, he said simply. He swept everyone on the hilltop with eyes that were sad and wise and very, very old. Ye, he said to the symbol, I and all gathered here are dangerous. Should we then be destroyed out of hand forthwith because of what we might do? Nay, tis the right and the doom of all creatures who walk Faerun to do as they will. This is why we of the art frown at those who cast charms. Elminster drew himself up and seemed to gather brightness until he glowed. 
Not even the gods took unto themselves the power to control ye or me so tightly that we cannot walk or speak or breathe save at another's bidding. Tis their will that we be free to do as we may. Slay a foe, sure, or defend thyself against a raider. But to strike down one who may some day menace thee, that's as monstrous as the act of the usurper who slays all babies in a land for fear of a rightful heir. Aye, well said, Florin agreed in grim, deliberate challenge to the woman in black. No other of the gathering spoke, but waited in breathless silence. The witch queen stood in their midst, alone and terrible. They'd all heard of the awesome art she commanded that held red wizards at bay and hurled back their armies time and again. They knew the tales of her temper and cruel humor. The hilltop smelled of fear. Not a sword moved. The symbol nodded, slowly. I, great one, you truly have the wisdom lore grants you. I agree. If others had not thought likewise, many winters gone, I would not have lived to stand here on Harper's Hill now. She stepped around Elminster, and he did not bar her way. Norm moved protectively in front of Chandril. The symbol came to a halt, facing him. I have trusted, she whispered, her eyes very proud. Will you not also trust me? Norm stared back at her for a long, tense breath and stepped aside. The symbol bowed her head and glided up to Chandril. My forgiveness, if you'll take it, I wish you well. Chandril nodded, swallowing, and managed a tentative smile. I... I hold nothing against you, great lady. The symbol smiled back. Her hand went to the broad black belt about her waist and drew from it a plain brass ring. A gift for you. She leaned close until Chandril could smell a faint, strange perfume at her throat. Chandril had never seen eyes so steel-gray, stern, and sad. Use this only when all else is lost, the symbol whispered. It will take you and anyone whose flesh touches yours to a refuge of mine. It works only once. For the going, and not a return journey. Its word of command is on the inside of the band, invisible save when you heat the ring. Reveal it as often as you like, but speak it not aloud until you intend to use it. Your spellfire will not harm this. Cold fingers touched Chandril's, pressing the ring, strangely warm, into her palm. One last thing, the symbol added. Walk your own way, Chandril. Let no one control you. Beware those who stand in shadows. She smiled again and kissed the wondering girl gently on the cheek. Her lips were like both fire and ice. As Chandril stared at her, lips trembling into another smile, the Queen of Aglarond winked, patted Elminster's arm, and whirled away in writhing black cloth that seemed smoke. The brief tumult sprang up in the moonlight and became a black falcon. It soared among the stars and was gone. Everyone spoke at once. Amid the hubbub, Elminster said firmly, The test is at an end. Norm, take thy lady home and sleep. 
My thanks, Shandrel. Keep thy spell fire quiet within until ye've need of it. I know now twill not harm thee to carry it. Guard well that ring. A gift from the symbol is rare indeed. Behind them, Florin quietly arranged a ring of guards to escort the couple back to the tower. Think on this, and let us know what ye decide, Elminster added as they went down into the trees. Yesel and Elistel will train thee, Narm, if ye wish, and I'll show thee what I can of working together spell fire and spells. The cloak is thine to keep. It will protect thee in battle. I'll say more on the morrow. Tis old, its art no longer strong, so take care not to drain its magic without intention. The wizard coughed. Go now and get to bed, where these old bones would be if I'd any sense. After all, ye could be needed to save Faerun tomorrow. Shandrel nodded, suddenly exhausted. Thank you, Lord, she replied. Elminster winced at the title. I fear I must sleep soon, or fall where I stand. Thanks, Elminster, Norm added briskly, and good fortune this night and hereafter. After I get our clothes back from the nights, we'll think on your words as we fall asleep. They chuckled together, and then the young couple went down the wooded hillside. The guards closed in around them. Florin and Merith flew watchfully above, leaving the old mage behind with Ysail and Elistel. Satisfied? Elistel asked her sometime master. Elminster looked at the scorch marks on the rocks. The power to unleash Spellfire. Her mother had it. Both lady knights looked at him, startled, but Elminster merely smiled a distant smile that warned he'd say no more. So, what did ye hear of interest, Elistel? Ye may edit such things as ye feel mine aged ears should not hear out of consideration for my vulnerable heart. Well then, Elistel said impishly, there's precious little to tell. Mist streamed through the trees as Corvin of the Rising Moon reached the butcher's shop. Fair morn, said a stooped stranger. The man leaned on the stockyard fence, the mud of travel on his boots and breeches. Morn, Corvin replied sourly. He had come for meat, not talk. Since that little brat, Shandrel, had run off, he'd had to get his meat earlier, when he'd rather be abed. Buying lamb, I've thirty good tails in the pen there, just down from Battledale. The herder jerked his head at the muddy paddock behind him. Lamb? Well, I'll look. If I can find two good hand counts among them, I might do business, Corvin begrudged. The herder stared at him. Two hand counts? You must have a monstrous large family. No, no. I buy for the inn down the road, the rising moon. Do you? Why, I've a tale for you, then, about that young lass who left your inn. Oh, Corvin said, turning his head sharply. Shandrel? That's her name. Pretty, that, the herder replied. I saw her in the mountains a few nights back, while I chased strays. The Thunder Peaks? Corvin asked, nodding toward a gray and purple wall of mountains above the trees. Aye, near the Sember. I came on a great crowd of folk, asking this girl if she was all right, after she'd unleashed something they called Spellfire. Spellfire? Corvin snapped in astonishment. 
Aye, I heard it plain. I hid, mind you. There were gold coins all over the place, and they had swords out. I wasn't sure an uninvited guest would be left alive. Corvin nodded. Aye, but who were these people? Folk of Shadowdale they were, that old wizard, and the ranger who rides about the dales, speaking Shadowdale's will. Falcon Hand, is he? And the elf warrior who lives there, and a priest, I think. They were all excited over the lass. Seems she burned up a dragon or such like with this spell fire. There was something about someone called Shadowsill, too, but I couldn't rightly hear that bit. Never found my sheep, either. But I got their price, and better, in gold, by keeping hid and coming out for coins after they'd gone. Thanks, too. The herder grinned. North, friend, down into the forest, to Mistledale, I suppose, and Shadowdale beyond. Corvin sighed, feigning sorrow. Too far to follow. If she'd wanted to come back, she'd have headed our way by now. He shook his head. Well, my thanks for your tale. She's alive, at least. That's good to know. Now, you'd some sheep? The faster I buy, the faster I can be smoking and hanging. The herder threw open the gate and waved him on. Corvin's mind was busy on how best to pass this news to certain ears. He never noticed the herder's unlovely smile, or how the man's arm reached a few inches farther than any human hand could as he drew the gate closed, or how his fingers, just for an instant, seemed like black tentacles. Chandral must die, decided Malark. Not yet, but after these altruistic fools of Shadowdale have trained her to her full powers— Somehow, she'd destroyed Roglithgor and the Dracolich's lair, slain or escaped the Shadow Sill, and driven away Manshoon of Zental Keep. She'd been lucky. It would be simply impossible for a slip of a girl to defeat the gathered mages of the Cult of the Dragon. The wagon rocked through a particularly deep pothole. Malark cursed. Through the wagon's open front door, Arkel grinned apologetically. Malark snarled a wordless, mirthless reply, rubbed his aching shoulder, and considered how best to separate this chandrel from her protectors in the Tower of Ashaba. The cult had a loyal agent in its guard, Kalthar. He could strike at chandrel when the time was right. Malark snorted. He did not trust his underlings to saddle a horse unsupervised, let alone make such a capture and escape, given the art and the swords that would come against them. On the other hand, the longer the cult waited, the more likely someone else would try to snatch the source of spellfire, the Zentarum, or the priesthood of Bane. Perhaps that would be for the best— in the ensuing confusion, Malark could storm in and prevail for the greater glory of the followers. The archmage was jolted out of that pleasant daydream by a pothole. One wheel struck, bounced, and sank, and then another wheel pitched sharply down into an even larger hole. The rattling wagon surged upright just as its rear wheels skidded alarmingly sideways on loose stones. Claws of Shargrailer. The gods alone knew how fat little merchants managed this, day in and day out, and this was one of the better roads in the north. Malark questioned the wisdom of his own plan for the forty-third time, as the wagon blessedly, slowed for the guard post that would admit him, a traveling merchant who dealt in love filters and medicinal remedies, into Shadowdale. Well, it was underway now, for good or ill. Let the killing begin. Chapter 13 Gods Help Us All 
Look to your priests and prayers and altars, for salvation comes from the gods. All aid, all beauty, all fortune and reward and plenty. It almost makes up for the beasts and bloodshed and heart ravages they also send. When red war sweeps the land and swords rise, is it not curious that every third warrior calls on this god or that and swears divine favor is with him? Yet the blood runs, and whenever one war falters, another bursts forth. Truly, the gods must starve for entertainment. Hameth Ilkarth of Telflam A somewhat honest merchant's say, Year of the Weeping Moon Morning light made the bare, fissured rock of the old skull a warm and pleasant place, despite the whispering wind. When it howled, the gnaw top was the coldest, bleakest guard post in Shadowdale. Three leather-clad figures stood there now, looking down over the green meadows and farms to the south and the grim, defiant, twisted tower. God's help us if the red wizards hear of Shandrel before she and Norm are grown wise at battle and art, Storm said. Without my sister, the defense of this little dale falls on a few knights and Elminster, and for all his art and holy mistress' favor, he is but one old busy man. Things will get bad enough with just the Zenterum, if Manshoon sends them, Charantir replied. You all miss Silun very much. She must have been special indeed. They still speak of her often and wistfully in yonder inn. Florin smiled. She fell defending the dale against dragons, a danger we may soon face again with Shandrel here. Cultists must be searching for her now, and with the testings bright fires in the night, it won't take them long to find her. Storm smiled ruefully. Elminster plays a deeper game than we do. He did that in front of everyone quite deliberately. Though why? Florin's smile was every bit as rueful. You think the public display was unwise. I, too. Yet Elminster seemed an actor in the streets of Suzale, playing to a larger audience than those standing around him, hoping to attract other eyes. Our old mage is no fool, and not feeble in wits, unless the gods have given him some feebleness that affects judgment, but not power of art. There is such a thing? Charantir teased. It strikes the young, too. It makes us adventurers when we could stay safe at home, doing dull, honest work to earn local respect slowly as we grow gray and bent. Storm nodded. Well said, yet I agree with Florin. Elminster has some purpose in displaying Shandrel's power so dramatically. Storm shook her head. I've not spoken formally with others who harp, but I can say that most who saw the testing were of like mind. Twas the act of a rash youngster. Florin nodded, turning his gaze thoughtfully to Elminster's small fieldstone tower below. Shandrel's a danger to him, more than any other in all the realms. With one hand, she can smash spells to dust. If ever she moves against Elminster or is duped into foiling him, the old mage can be destroyed, and our defense against Zentil Keep will be gone. Those who'd work such a deed are far too many for my comfort. I, Storm said, her silver hair stirring in the breeze. She looked to the tower where Shandrel was, and her eyes were very dark. So that must not be allowed to happen. A lot of folk have died here, it seems, Shandrel said, her voice too soft to hide the fear in it. Alistal sat down on a cushion, waving Shandrel to the next seat. 
Many have died, yes. Zental Keep has attacked the Dale twice since the knights came. Almost half the farmers I grew up with are dead now. So are more adventurers than you could cram breast to breast in this room. She shrugged. Real life is not all tavern tales and fond memories. In the crypts ten levels beneath us, three nights sleep forever. It's a price they never intended to pay, but pay it they did, most without choice. Alistal leaned forward, took Chandral's arms, and looked her full in the face. The adventurer's life may well take Narm from you, or cripple one of you beyond putting right. Once folk know you've power, though, you've little choice. You become a foe and a target for many, and must become an adventurer or a corpse. So I fear, yet I chose to leave the inn. All else has followed on that. I suppose there's no other choice left. Chandral smiled. Yet... I regret none of it, for it's brought me Narm. Hold to that, Alistal said, almost fiercely. Never forget you've felt so. Hard times lie ahead. Your power, wielded with deliberate intent, is a menace to all weavers of art. Many folk will try to destroy you or wield you as a weapon. On the verge of shaking Chandral, she let go and sat back. You'll see wizards enough to sicken you, and no matter how mighty you become, there's always someone more powerful. Learn that quickly. The lesson's fatal if ignored. It can happen to you too, Chandral. Something of art may well counter spellfire. Perhaps something as simple as a cantrip. Chandral nodded. Sometimes I think I can't go on with this, and yet hurling spellfire feels so good, even with the pain. I see how happy Ysail is with Merith, too, and both of them are adventurers. As an elf, Merith must know his lady will die hundreds of winters before he does, yet they wed and seem happy. It can happen. Alistal nodded. It's good you see that. It takes work and patience, mind. How does Ysail seem to you, in manner, her character? Warm, kind, yet strict and proper. Understanding. I can say little more. I barely know any of you. Indeed, yet I'd say you've seen Ysail well enough. But there's more. Her control's so great that one doesn't notice she's passionate. Not just romantically mined, but strong-willed. She and the priest Jeldi were lovers when I first came to the tower. There was a great fight between Jeldi and Merith over Ysail. Ysail decided she loved Merith more, so she set out to win him, before all the elven court and mindful of her brief span of years. She seeks longevity by her art, but she's never thought to outlive even his youth. Alistal rose and started to pace. That sort of self-discipline is required to master art. You'll need control to stand at Narm's side through all that will come against you both. Hear and heed, Shandral, for I would be your friend for more than a few years. The mage grinned suddenly. I seem to be one for long speeches this day. Chandral shook her head. No, no, I thank you. I've never had someone my age, or close, that I could talk of things to, and not have to curb my words. Even Narm. Especially Narm. Yes, especially Narm. Alistal glanced around. Remember the places I'm going to show you now. One day, you and he may be glad of a place to hide away in, together. As Chandral rose to join her, the lady mage turned and gave her a grim look. One day soon. Chandral could only nod. 
Night had fallen, deep and dark, before Raz Saren Dathan rose from his table in the old Skull's taproom, waved a wordless goodnight to Jehail, and staggered to the door. The plump innkeeper shook her head ruefully as she went to mop up the table where two of Razarin's fellow guards slumped snoring in their chairs, dice and coppers fallen from their hands. They're like children betimes, she thought, lifting one leather-clad sleeve out of a pool of spilled ale and adroitly avoiding the instinctive yank and punch its sleeping owner launched. Good lads, but not drinkers. Outside, in the cool night air, Rosserin reached the same conclusion, albeit slowly and less clearly. Hitching up his sword belt, he set off hastily toward the tower. An overcast sky made the night very dark, and a brisk walk might make him feel less rock-witted before he reached his bed. Late duty tomorrow, praise Helm, he could use the sleep. A silent shadow rose out of the night, clutching a horse leather knotted about a fistful of coins. The figure tipped Rosserin's helmet sharply forward to expose the back of his head and gave sleep to him. The guard slumped without a sound. Sold caught him under the arms and heaved him upright. Arkul caught his boots, and together they hurried him into the trees. There, Malark worked magical darkness and commanded Arkul to unhood the lamp. In its faint light, the cult archmage cast a spell of sleep on the guard. Strip him, he ordered. When it was done, he studied the man's face and hair intently and had his underlings turn the body, seeking birthmarks. None. Right, then. Slowly and carefully, Malark cast yet another spell. His form twisted, dwindled, and grew again. A double of Rosarin stood where Malark had been moments before. The disguised wizard donned the real guard's clothes, ensured that his magic-warding amulets were still secure under them, and ordered coldly, Wait here. If I return not by dawn, withdraw a little way into the woods and hide. Report in Esembra if I come not back in four days. Understood? Aye, Lord Mage. Understood, Lord Malark. Well enough. No pilfering, no wenching, and no noise. I don't plan to be long. And Malark was gone, adjusting his sword belt. Irk! How did guards even lift such blades, let alone swing them as if they were wands? This one was as heavy as a cold corpse. The false guard felt his way back out of his enchanted ring of darkness and reached the road. There he found two guardsmen weaving slowly toward the tower. They were half asleep, irritable, and smelled of drink. Ah, it's Roz! One greeted him, nearly falling. Bladder the better for it, old sword! Fall over any trees? Arg! Malark answered, loudly and sourly, thinking it the safest reply. He deftly ducked and rose up between their linked hands, putting an arm about the shoulder of each. One of the guardsmen gave at the knees and almost fell. Malark winced at his weight. "'Tis good y you came," the collapsing guard rumbled. He hauled himself up Malark's arm and rocked on his heels before catching his balance. "'I need your shoulder, I fear. God's my head!' Ah, Malark said again, stifling a grin. "'Ugh!' the guard on his other arm agreed sagely. They stumbled on. Ahead, the torchlight at the tower gates grew brighter and closer, step by bobbing step. 
Elsewhere, Malark might have crept or flown in the shape of a bird or vermin to a window and dispensed with all this dangerous foolishness. But not here. Not with Elminster about and all these knights. Best I ever drank, one of his companions said dreamily, was at the lonesome tankard where the roads meet an evening star. That's in Cormier, old sword. Mm-hmm, Malark noted. Somehow, he got the three of them through the guards and inside. He let them stumble slightly ahead to guide him down a long, high hallway to the guard room. Luck was with Malark. His spy, Kulthar, was one of the two guards standing duty. The other was just rising, with an oath, to answer a bell three floors up. On his way to the back stairs, he growled to no one in particular. Why can't Rold relieve himself before he takes his post? Malark's companions stumbled across the guard room, catching at the table for balance, heading for the bunk room door. One began to sing under his breath. Oh, I once knew a lady of far utter sea. She'll never come back now. No, never come back to me. The door banged, and there came a fainter crash from the other side of it. Kulthar rolled his eyes. He's always falling over that chair. It'll be broken now, sure, and we'll have to fix it again because... Kulthar's voice rose in vicious mimicry of the vanished guard. I'm not too good with my hands. At that moment, Malark's other companion heaved, shuddered, and made a sickening, gulping sound. Oh, gods, Kulthar cursed. Quick, get his face into that bucket. Hurry, I should have known Krimen would drink himself sick. Malark scooped a leather bucket from its peg just in time. When the retching was done, Krimen roused himself blearily and walked toward the bunk room. No more for me, I think. I'd best be getting back, you hell. Yes, dearie, Kulthar said in disgusted mockery. Krimen passed into the bunk room, and another splintering crash came. Malark chuckled despite himself. After a moment, Kulthar joined in. Krimen's curses trailed away. Shaking his head, Malark put down the bucket closed the bunk room door, and turned to face Kulthar, who frowned at him. And how much have you had to drink? Malark let his face shift back to its own features for two slow, deliberate breaths before he said, Nothing, Kulthar. Sorry to disappoint you. When he grinned an instant later, it was Rosserin's own lopsided grin. Kulthar stared at him in astonishment. Lord, why are you here? He whispered. Is Roz... Sleeping. I've little time for talk. Take this. He pressed a ring into Kulthar's palm. Hide it well, on your person, and do not part with it. Magics on it serve to hide it from normal scrutiny by one of the art. But wear it openly only when you intend to use it. Its command word is the name of the first Dracolich you served. Speaking that while wearing this will instantly take you and one other creature you're touching flesh to flesh to Thunderstone. Specifically, a hill above that town where one of us lives as a hermit. Brosson, by name. If he's not there, go to... Several more instructions followed. Then, one thing more. I may appear to you and give the sign of the hammer, or a red crest may fly into this guard room. An illusion, mind. These both are signals that you're to swiftly take Chandra Chasser and escape with her by means of the ring. Otherwise... 
You're to take her when you think best. You guessed the task before I said it. Good. You'll do this? Kolthar swallowed. Aye, for the glory of the followers. Malark nodded, smiled grimly, and picked up the reeking bucket. Before your fellow watchmen return, I believe I'll go be sick outside. Holding the bucket before him, he staggered out and down the hall, every inch the drunken Rosarin. It was a white-faced and thoughtful Kulthar who drew off his boot and slid the brass ring onto his little toe where he'd feel its reassuring presence at every step. A loudly and realistically sick Rosarin staggered between the guards at the gate, out into the night, but a coolly efficient night cat loped from where bucket and clothes had fallen, heading for a certain spot in the trees. The night cat became a rat, crept close to the waiting cultists, and listened. Do you hear anything? Sold asked suspiciously. Probably the master coming back, Arkul said. Just sit quiet now, or we'll both catch it. Sit quiet yourself, clever jaws. It wasn't me who bought a wagon whose seat was as full of splinters as a carpenter's beard. Pierced your wits, did they? You shouldn't carry them so low down, Arkul said smugly. Well met, said Malark dryly, stepping from the darkness in a spot neither of them faced. I'm glad to hear you both so happy and good-natured. He pointed at the sleeping Rosarin. Take up our sleeper and come. Hood the lantern, and I'll carry it. When the light was hidden, the mage dispelled his darkness and set off back toward the tower. There he raised darkness again, and within its ring they dressed Rosarin and left him with the bucket in his hands for the other guards to find. Back to the inn, Malark commanded simply, banishing the darkness. He raised his arms, and his fingers flowed and grew, and then branched and branched anew. In moments, Malark's upper body looked like a large bush. A mouth opened high on one of the branches. Come, stay behind me. Together, they crept through the night to behind the inn stables. The dogs sleep. Arkul whispered. Yes, but the stable master does not, Malark hissed back. Withdrawing a few paces, he became himself again and murmured a spell. Arkul and Sold stood guard, swords drawn. Rejoining them, Malark eyed their blades with contempt. Put those away. We'll not be carving roasts. The stable master, then? Arkul asked hopefully, but his blade slid back into its sheath. In the hills to the north, a wolf howled. Axe in hand, the stablemaster stood and glimpsed a faint, bobbing glow. He's watching something of my making, by the well, Malark replied. Come, now, quick and quiet. He crept across the inn yard, his underlings at his heels. At the base of the wall, the archmage's body shifted shape again. He rose into a long pole with broad rungs, a ladder that gripped the windowsill of their rented room with very human hands. The ladder sprouted two eye stalks that peered across the inn yard. Hurry, commanded a mouth that appeared on the cross brace Arkul was reaching for. He flinched back and almost fell from the ladder. Don't do that. Move, the ladder responded coldly. You too, Salt. Our luck can't hold on that. They all reached the chamber and closed the shutters without incident. As he cast a wall of force between himself and his underlings, Malark wondered what would go wrong when the time came. 
Everything had gone smoothly, yet he could feel in his bones that Spellfire was not fated to come within the grasp of the followers. Such hunches had given him sleepless nights before, but this time he fell asleep before he could fret. Soon he was falling endlessly through gray and purple shifting mists, plunging towards something he could not quite see that glowed red and fiery below. Horse cobbles, he said to it severely, but the scene did not go away. He went on falling until he reached morning. I would speak with the cook, the traveler said. I eat only certain meats and must know how they are prepared. If you've no objection... None, Gorstag rumbled. Through there, on the left. Corvin's the name. My thanks, the dusky-skinned merchant said. Tis good to find a house where food's deemed important. He strode off, leaving Gorstag staring after him in bemusement. After a moment, the innkeeper caught Lorene's eye and nodded at the kitchens. She straightened from a table where a fat Sembian merchant was staring into her low-laced bodice. Turning with her hand on her hip in a way that made the eyes of every man at the table involuntarily follow her, she glided toward the kitchen. Within, a silky voice asked in Corvin's ear, What news have you for the followers? A dusky hand helpfully took up a bowl of chopped onions and conveyed them to the board beside a pan of mushrooms sizzling in bacon fat. Corvin shuddered, looked up, and nodded briefly. Well met, he muttered as he added the onions to the pan. Little news, but important. A herder saw a girl who used to work for me here, a little nothing named Shandrel, who ran off a few ten days back. She was in the Thunder Peaks with the Knights of Mithranor and Elminster of Shadowdale. She'd just wielded spellfire, and with it burned a dragon or such like. Roglithgor the Undying, I fear. The man heard the Shadowsill's name and said there were gold pieces all around. There will be indeed, Sir Cook, if you do the boar just so, the merchant replied smoothly. Corvin looked up with knife in hand and saw Lorene gliding into the kitchen. He glared at her. What keeps you, girl? Can't seduce patrons as fast as you used to. I'll be needing butter and parsley for those carrots, and I need the fowl spit turned now, not on the morrow. Turn it yourself, Lorene replied crisply, with whatever part of you first comes to hand. She swept rolls from the warming shelf into a basket and was gone with an angry twitch of her behind. The merchant chuckled. Well, I'll not keep you. Domestic bliss, indeed. My thanks, Corvin. Is there anything more? They all went off north, from near the Sember. Nothing more. The onions sizzled with sudden enthusiasm. Corvin stirred them energetically, to keep them from sticking. Well done, and well met. Until next time. When Corvin turned to reply, the merchant was gone. On the counter beside Corvin were three gleaming red gems laid in a neat triangle. The cook's eyes bulged. Spinels, a hundred pieces of gold each easily, and three gods above. Corvin snatched them up in one meaty fist, and then his eyes narrowed in suspicion. What if this were some trick? He'd best not be caught with them about the kitchen. The outside door banged. Corvin glared all around until he was satisfied no one watched. With a grunt, he put his shoulder to the water barrel beside the back door. Ignoring the water slopping down its far side, he tipped it so that he could lay the gems, and a dead leaf to cover them, 
in a hollow beneath the barrel's base. Carefully, he lowered the barrel again and straightened to look about for spying eyes. Finding none, he rushed back into the kitchen, where the smell of burning onions greeted him. Gods blast us, he spat as he raced across the kitchen. Loreen stuck her head in at the door and grinned at him. Something burning? She inquired sweetly, and withdrew her face just before the knife he hurled flashed through the doorway and clattered off the passage wall. Corvin was still snarling when Gorstag found the knife minutes later. How many times have I told you not to throw things? And a knife, man? You could have killed someone. If you must carve something to work off your furies, let it be the roast. The tap room is filling up right quickly, and they'll all want to eat. Gorstag tossed the knife into the stone sink and left. Seeing his face as he went behind the bar to draw ale, Loreen sighed. Gorstag smiled all too seldom now, since Chandril had run off. Perhaps the tales whispered in High Moon had been true, the ones that insisted Chandril was Gorstag's daughter. He'd brought her with him as a babe when he bought the inn. Lorene shrugged. Perhaps someday he'd say. Lorene remembered the hard-working, dreamy little girl snuggling down on the straw the other side of the clothes chest and wondered where she was now. Not so little anymore, either. Oh, my pretty statue! The carpenter, Ulsinar, called across the tap room. Wine! Wine for a man whose throat's raw with thirst and calling after you! The gods gave us drink! Will you defy them by denying me my poor share of it? Lorene chuckled and reached for the decanter she knew Ulsinar favored. The gods also gave us patience to cope when drink is not at hand. Would you neglect the one in your haste to overindulge in the other? Other regulars in the tap room roared their approval. A little patience, a good motto for an overworked inn, eh? I like it, another laughed. I'll wait with good will, and a full glass, if one's to be had, for Corvin's stuffed deer or his roast boar. Oh, aye, he makes even the greens taste worth the eating. Wah! The man fell silent as his wife turned a cold face to him. And I do not? Ulsinar, and not a few other men, laughed. Let's see you wriggle, Pardus. You're truly in the wallow this time. Wallow, wallow, others called enthusiastically. The wife turned an even stonier face on them all. Do you ridicule my man, who's worth more than all of you twice over? She inquired icily. Would you like to lose the few teeth you collectively own? The roars died away. Gorstag strode over. Now, Yantra, he said with a perfectly straight face, I can't have this sort of trouble in the rising moon. Before I serve all these rude men who've insulted you and your lord, will you have the deer or the boar? The boar, Yantra replied, mollified. A half portion for my husband. Gorstag stared quickly around to quell the roars of mirth. The innkeeper winked as he met the eye of Pardis, who, seated behind his wife, was silently but frantically trying to indicate by gesture and exaggerated mouthing of words that he wanted deer, not boar, and most certainly not a half portion. Why, Pardus, Gorstag said, as if suddenly recalling something. A man left word here for a saddle maker that he'd like a single piece, but a good one, for his favorite steed. I took the liberty of recommending you— but did not presume to promise times or prices. He's from Selgont and will call by again in a few days, on his way out from Ordlin to Cormir. 
Will you talk with me, in the back, over what I should tell him? He winked again, lightning swift. Oh, aye, Pardis replied, understanding. There was no Sembian saddle coveter, but he'd get his half-portion of boar out here, in the tap room, and as much deer as he wanted in the back, with Gorstag standing watchful guard a little later. He smiled. Good old Gorstag, Pardis thought, raising his flagon to the innkeeper. Long may he run the rising moon. Aye, let it be long indeed. Later that night, when all at last were abed and the taproom was red and dim in the dying firelight, Gorstag sat alone. He raised his heavy tankard and took another fiery swallow of dark, smoky-flavored wild root stout. What had become of Chandrel? He was sick at heart at the thought of her lying dead somewhere, or raped and robbed and left to starve by the roadside, or sweltering in her own sweat and muck in slave chains in the creaking, rat-infested hold of some southern slave trader wallowing across the inner sea. How much longer could he bear to stay without at least going to look? His glance went to the axe over the bar. In an instant, the burly innkeeper was up from his seat and vaulting a table. Another quick whirl, and he soon stood behind the bar, the axe in his hands. There was a little scream from behind him, a girl's cry. Gorstag whirled, snake quick and expecting trouble. Slowly, he relaxed. Lorene? he asked quietly. He couldn't go. They needed him here, all these folk. Oh, gods, bring her safe back. His waitress saw the anguished set of his face and came up to him quietly, her blanket about her shoulders. Master, you miss her, don't you? The axe trembled. Abruptly, it swept into the crook of the innkeeper's arm. With wet stone, oil flask, and rags, he came around the bar in almost angry haste. I, lass, I do. He sat. Loreen came on silent bare feet to sit beside him. He worked, turning the axe in his fingers as if it weighed no more than an empty mug. After a long silence, Gorstag pushed the tankard toward her. Drink, Loreen. Tis good. You'll be the better for it. Loreen sampled it made a face, and then took another swallow. She set the tankard down, two-handed, and pushed it back. Perhaps if I live to be your age, I'll learn a taste for it. Gorstag chuckled. The axe blade flashed in his hands. Firelight glimmered down its edge. Lorene watched him work. Where do you think she is? The strong hands faltered and then stopped. I know not. Gorstag reached for the brass oil flask and stoppered it. I know not, he said again. That's the worst of it. Abruptly, he clenched his hand. The flask in his grasp was crushed out of shape. I want to be out there looking for her, doing something. He said fiercely, and Lorene put her arm about him impulsively. She could tell Gorstag was on the edge of tears. She'd never heard his voice like this before. Why did she go? What did I do wrong that she hated it here so much? Lorene had no answer, so she kissed his rough cheek. When he turned his head, startled, she stilled his sobs with her lips. When at last she withdrew to breathe, he protested weakly. Lorene, what? You can be scandalized in the morning, she said softly, and kissed him again. Chapter 14 
shadows creep. The hawk circles and circles and waits. Against most prey, he will have but one strike. He waits for the best chance. Be as the hawk. Watch and wait and strike true. The people cannot afford foolish deaths in battle. War to slay, not to fight long and glorious. Armhar of the Tangle Trees, advice before the council in the Elven Court, year of the Hooded Falcon. I, I'm too tired, lady. Narm apologized. I can't concentrate. Yasail nodded. I know. That's why you must. How else will you build your will to something sharper and harder than a warrior's steel? Her smile was wry. You'll find, even if you never again go adventuring, that you'll almost never have quiet, comfort, good light, or space enough to study. You'll always struggle to fix spells in mind whilst overtired or sick or wounded and in pain or in the midst of the snoring, groaning, talking or crying of others. Learn now and you'll be glad of it then. My thanks in advance, good lady. Yasail grinned. You learn, you learn. Well... Why stare you not at the pages before you? The spells won't remember themselves. Ah! Norm struck the table with his fist. I can't think with you talking to me, always talking. Merima never did this. He died in an instant because his foolishness far outstripped his art. Yasail replied. I expect more of you than that, Norm. Moreover, you must expect different ways of mastering art with each tutor. Question neither their methods nor the opinions freely given, even if they make you flame within, or they'll shut off as a turned tap, and you'll get no more for all your pleading in coins. You'd be a mage and know not what sort of pride you'll have to deal with. I know. I'm dealing with your pride right now. I, my apologies, yes, Lady Yasail, I've no wish to offend, I can avoid such offence by looking to your pages and trying to study through my jabber, and not wasting my time. I'm older than you by a good start, lad, I've less left to me than you do, if you've wits enough to live to full growth, an increasingly doubtful prospect, tis true, Norm flung up his hands in wordless despair and bent his head to the open spellbook. Yasail grinned again. Well enough. Remember. No, don't look up at me. You already know I'm beautiful, and I know it too, but the art of Mistra is far more beautiful. Its beauty lasts where mine will wither with the years. Remember that I've learned art from Elminster himself. Norm looked up in surprise, but Yasail scowled and pointed severely down at his book again. And I'm fast running out of severe things that he said to me to parrot back at you. So for the love of Mistra, Norm, look down at your spells and try. That way I can lecture you on the kings of Cormier or the court etiquette of Aglarond or recite the love songs of Sulcius the Bard and not have to tax my wits so. Norm looked up at her. I, I, I'll try. One question of you if I may, lady. Yasail smiled and nodded. Elminster spoke so to you. Why? because it is necessary at this stage in the training of one who wields the art. Your Merrimar never knew such discipline. Elistal, who wields far less powerful spells, has known it and is the better for it. Elminster thinks his tutoring remiss if a mage knows not such frustration. Norm's opinion must have shown in his face because Yasail leaned forward, silver-gray robes shimmering.
The art is a thing of beauty in itself. It can also be helpful and creative. Too many mages neglect such facets in their haste to gain wealth, influence, and enemies by mastering fire and lightning. Remember that, Nam. If you forget everything else, remember that. You saw the Shadow Seal die. Elminster trained her for a long time. You saw what a fascination with power and power only can do. I. But why else become a mage? Why? Why become anything other than a farmer, a hunter, or a warrior? The world forces those three professions on any who try to scratch out a living in the wilderness. All else, carpentry, painting, weaving, smithing, one does because one has the aptitude and the desire. If power is all you want, become a warrior. But mind you, always strike at the weak and unprotected. Your arm may grow weary with all the slaying, but power you'll have and power you'll use over others until you fall before the greater power of another. Keep up questions of this ilk, Nam, and you'll find I can keep up the testy temper of Elminster. Why aren't you looking at your books? I, I, sorry, Lady Ysale. This time, Ysale flung up her hands in despair. Gods above, to think I once behaved as this one does. Tis a wonder Elminster didn't deem the form of a slug or a toad more apt for the end of my days. Patience, above all, patience. Pity the poor student of art. This lesson still waits ahead of him. Narm looked up, alarmed. Ysale winked and then screamed. Again, you allow meaningless noise to distract you. Call yourself a wizard. She rose in a rustling of robes and strode at Narm, snarling. Have you ever seen a rat? Oh, they'll crouch back to avoid a stick. But if you run about yelling and they're eating in the grain sack, they'll bite and chew as long as they can. If they must run, tis with mouth full, intending to return. Have you no more brains than a rat? Study, boy, study. Kings are born to their station. Rats are born to theirs, too. All the rest of us must work for ours. Study, I say. The door opened, and a listel peered in. Quite a performance, she remarked. Now, if you could only imitate Elminster's voice... She closed the door again hastily as Ysail hurled a quill stand in her direction. After its crash, Alistal looked in again, rather anxiously. You haven't any more of those, do you? Unfortunately not. He's using it. Using it? Whatever for? He hasn't written a line all this time. He seems to have been otherwise occupied. Alistal declared with exaggerated innocence. Her eyes found Narm, staring up at them both in astonishment, and she grew a head taller upon the instant. Her hair rose, and her eyes flashed. What's this? We exchange a few words, and this student breaks off studying? Is he weak-minded, a prankster, or is he just wasting his teacher's time? Elistal rushed at a frightened and dumbfounded Norm and halted only a hand span away, whereupon she smiled sweetly. Norm, how are you ever going to advance your art if you can't concentrate as well as any three-year-old playing in the mud? Norm looked as if he were about to cry and then burst into helpless laughter. I've never learned art like this before. You must be used to a lot of ponderous dignity and mystical mumbling, Alistal said. Now look down at your book again. You can't read runes while you're looking at me. Narm sighed loudly and feelingly. Mistra, aid me. She'll have to, but give her a little help too, eh? 
Alistal turned to Ysail. Well, it's nice to know I'm not the only one to climb stone walls in frustration at this stage of your teaching. Ysail raised an eyebrow. You think I didn't? In my turn, Elminster continually threatened to spank me with an unseen servant spell while I studied. Then he threatened to force me to battle him with the spells I'd managed to memorize through all of that. Alistal chuckled. You never told me that. Did he make it any more than a threat? No, I learned to study through nearly anything with astonishing speed. Think he'll do as well? Alistal asked quietly, nodding at Narm's bent head. Ysail shrugged. For himself, I, but as protector and mate to one who'll be attacked day after day because she has spell fire, that's less certain. Are you listening again, Narm? Narm looked up. Sorry. Much better, Ysail replied. See that you apply yourself in this, Narm. Your life and your lady's life depend on it. Chandral looked around the cavern in awe. It was vast and dark and littered with rubble. An accident long ago, Elminster said gruffly. Be ye ready, little one? I... Shandrel answered in mimicry. What now? Elminster looked grave. A few more tests. Things better learned before thy life depends on it. He walked a few paces from her. My art shields this chamber against prying magic, he added. First, hold thy hand up. So, now the other. Chandra looked at him, a little afraid. Do you want me to turn my spellfire upon myself? Elminster nodded slowly. We must know, he said. But mind ye, proceed very gently. Stop at once if it affects thee. Chandra nodded back and bent her will to the task. The thought of burning herself made her feel sick. She set her teeth, glanced at the old mage, and then stared at the hand she was to scorch. Spellfire blossomed from her other hand in a small, delicate flame to lick at her unprotected hand. No pain came, but a tingling that grew in intensity as she wreathed her hand in fire. She withdrew it from the raging, blistering heat, found it unmarked, and plunged it in once more. The flames roared. Her uncontrollable shuddering grew. Elminster grasped her arm, drawing her hand from the flames. His hand took its place. He grunted in pain and drew back. With his good hand, he touched her shoulder, and then, slowly, and deliberately, her bare cheek. No flame erupted. Enough! The flames died. Elminster faced her, working the fingers of one blackened hand. His frown mingled interest and pain. Well, then, it does not burn thee, but the force may harm thine innards circling back in. It does burn another, regardless of defenses of art. When ye are not so full of energy that it burns in thine eyes, it harms only where ye intend it, and not at any touch. Narm should last longer than I'd feared. Chandral giggled at his tone. You'll want to watch the two of us abed to further your investigations? Elminster looked disapprovingly up past his brows at her. It may not surprise ye to learn that over many hundred winters I've seen such things a time or two before. He grinned. I'd have seen far more, too, 
if I'd had the courage to keep my eyes open at a younger age. But tis an unsuitable topic for an old man to discuss with a young lady alone in the dark. Turn thy spell fire on this wall. Nowhere else, mind. This cavern may not be entirely stable. Let us see what befalls. Again, Shandrel set her will, and Spellfire flamed out. It struck the wall with a hollow roar and burst in all directions. Sparks and tendrils of flame leapt among the rocks. The wall held, despite Shandrel's fierce efforts to hurl all she could at it. When Elminster patted her on the shoulder to desist, the cavern wall was red hot. How does it feel to hold such power? Elminster asked softly. Eerie, Shandrel answered truthfully. Exciting, fearsome. I, I never seem able to relax any more. Could ye at the inn? Well, yes, short moments by myself, now and then. But it's not just the adventure, nor the spellfire. It's Narm, Elminster said dryly. Would ye try something else for me? Yes, what's your will? See if ye can hurl spellfire from thy knee, or forehead, or foot, or behind, or eyes. See if ye can hurl it in a spray or curve the flames around sharp bends, or hurl small balls or streamers of flame. Knowing the accuracy of thy aim would also be useful. How long do you... Never mind. Guide me. Shandrel mopped her sweating forehead. Her fire had made the cave hot. Elminster held out his pipe wordlessly. She pointed one finger and pushed, just a little, with her will. A tiny spurt of flame shot out. The old wizard turned the pipe bowl adroitly to catch the flame and puffed contentedly. Aye, we'll start so. That night, the hall was quiet despite the gathered nights. They sat at the great trestle table that stretched thirty paces down the center of the warm, smoky chamber. The remains of a good feast still lay upon the table. The guards, who usually lined the walls, and the servants scurrying between table and kitchen, were absent, barred by Morngrim. The Lord and Lady of Shadowdale sat at the head of the table, and Elminster at its foot. On one side sat Storm Silverhand, Shandrel, and Narm, facing the knights on the other. The rest of the seats stood empty. Ysail rose. My lords and ladies, Norm Tamaraith has advanced his art considerably since his arrival. He lacked not aptitude or dedication, but merely suffered from poor and insufficient training. She smiled, and to Norm's intense surprise added, He was a joy to train. Alistal and I have no hesitation in presenting Norm before this company as an accomplished mage. It is my understanding Elminster wishes to examine and train Norm yet, to further him for the special task of art required in supporting the unique power of his betrothed. I yield to my master. As Ysail sat smoothly, Elminster rose. Aye, I'll talk to Norm of that before long. But I'm here this night in answer to Morngrim's request. His subtle emphasis on the last word made the Lord of Shadowdale suppress a smile. I'll report on what I've learned of the powers of Chandral Chasser, specifically that unique ability we call Spellfire. 
The power to wield spellfire has been known in the realms in the past. Tis my duty this time, I fear. Florin interrupted, standing with a polite bow to Morngrim and to the old mage. Elminster, the short version, please. No disrespect intended, but we lack both your lore interest and patience. Elminster eyed him sourly. Patience certainly seems in short supply these days. Tis a lamentable state of affairs when things happen at such a pace that folk can scarce grumble before the land changes again. Woeful days indeed. He forestalled several knights who'd opened their mouths by saying, But I digress to the matter directly at hand. Lady Shandrel, betrothed to Lord Narm Tamaraith, both of whom sit among us. He nodded at the small figure sitting between Storm and Norm. Shandrel can now without benefit of the ball here that apparently awakened her spellfire, draw in spells without much personal harm, though some occurs with certain magic, and store it for an unknown length of time and without apparent ill effects. She can subsequently send it forth upon command and with some precision as a fire that burns through most magical defenses and affects all things and beings I've observed it against thus far. Shandrel has a finite capacity for absorbed magic, but we're presently uncertain what that is. We know neither the precise effects of the spellfire upon Chandral, nor the limitations of the spellfire she wields. The old mage felt for his pipe, forgetting that it floated serenely by his ear. I can tell you what spellfire is. The raw energy that all workings of art are composed of broken down by Chandral's body in some unknown manner. As the symbol, distinguished ruler of Aglarond, pointed out at the test, such a power is dangerous to Chandral personally and to those nearby. When her body holds so much energy that her eyes flash, her very touch can harm through unintentional discharge. She's also a threat to those who work magic everywhere in this world. Those who see this threat will act to destroy or possess her. Elminster discovered and took hold of his errant pipe. Certain fell powers undoubtedly already know of her abilities and will act soon. There's much more to be said, but um, ye asked for the short version. The old mage sat down. So you're saying war will come to the dale again because the source of spellfire is here? Lady Cheryl asked. Aye. Elminster replied, and we must be ready, to arms and alert. We must defend Chandral's person with our swords and whelm the art at our command to defend against the many mages who will come for her spellfire. She cannot be everywhere to battle all of them. Were she the most willing slayer in the world? Our spells we must also cast at Chandral to feed her spellfire. Tis this her man Norm does best. Days of blood, I fear, are upon us. Morngrim rose and looked down the table. Tis hardly fair. 
you powerful and experienced adventurers, to drag these young folk into a battle that will almost certainly mean their deaths, just to use them as weapons against those who come. They are in such a battle as we breathe now, Elminster said sharply. We delivered them out of it once, as a knight drags a weary fellow out of the fray for a time to catch his breath, quell his pain, and set to again. Tis the price of adventuring, such strife. And don't tell me they're not adventurers. One ran off with a chartered company, while the other willingly returned to Mithranor, alone and unarmed, to seek his fortune after the death of his master at the hand of devils. We do not intend to use them as weapons, but to see they know their powers fully. The old mage glanced around at the knights. Why invite such peril? Why see a young maid become a threat to one's own powers? Why build her strength and that of her consort to make them an even greater menace? Because, because after all these years, it still feels good to have helped someone and accomplished something. This first fight is part of that, and we cannot avoid it. When tis done, our duty will be to let them go whither they will, and not compel them or make their choices for them. As the last words left Elminster's mouth, a large green glass bottle on the table, full of wine and unopened, began to grow and change shape. As all watched in astonishment, it became the symbol, kneeling atop the table with proud and lonely eyes. The witch queen nodded to Narm and Chandral, and then looked to Elminster. You'll let these two walk freely? she asked. Truly? The archmage nodded. Aye, I will. We all here will. Then you have my blessing, she said softly. Her tall, slender body shifted, blurred, and shrank again. Suddenly, it was a black bird. With a whir of wings, she darted up the chimney and was gone. The knights relaxed visibly. One day, I suppose, I'll be used to that. Torm remarked. Old mage, can't you tell by art when she's near? Elminster shook his head. Unless she actively uses art on her own, nay, her cloak of art is as good as any great archmage's, which is to say, well nigh perfect. Such as yours, perhaps? Torm pressed him. Elminster smiled broadly, and suddenly wasn't there. His chair was empty, without flash or sound. Only the faint smell of pipe smoke hung in the air. Ysail sighed, cast a spell, looked about keenly, and shook her head. Faint magic all about, and those things I know to be enchanted. But no old mage. You see... Elminster said, appearing and kissing her cheek. "'Tis not as easy as it might seem, but it works. "'Now that's a trick I'd give much to learn,' Torm said. "'Much it will cost ye,' Elminster replied. "'But enough. Be thankful, all of ye, that the symbol favors our desires in this matter.' If she did not, all of my time would be spent thwarting her. My art would be lost to you. Who knows what foes we yet face? Ye may have need of me. We always need you, old mage, Morngrim answered, 
a twinkle in his eye. Is there anyone else who'd now speak? Norm and Chandral, you needn't say a word you don't desire to, nor answer any queries put to you. I would speak, Lord of the Dale, said Storm Silverhand softly. She rose, silver hair swirling about the leather that sheathed her shoulders, and looked at Norm and Chandral. We who hop are interested in you. Think on whether you might want to walk our way. Eyebrows lifted in silence all around the table. Rathen looked about and asked noisily, "Is all the formal tongue work done? Can we enjoy ourselves and let all the others back in?" Morngrim grinned. I think you've cut to the heart of the boar, mighty of Timora. Open the doors. Let us feast. Elminster, don't go. I pray you. The old mage had already risen. I'm a mite old for all the babbling and flirting of your feasts. I look at all the comely lasses and see only the faces of those I met at feasts long ago. In cities now dust, truly, Morngrim, I enjoy it not. Besides, I've work to do. My art stands not still, and more things unfold under the eyes of Selnune than just spell fire. Fare ye well, all. He strode forward, crouched before the fire. And was suddenly a great gray-feathered eagle. He soared up the chimney just as the symbol had. Show off, Yasale said affectionately. Rathen saluted the departing wizard with a rude noise, waving a bottle in either hand. Torm, meanwhile, dragged Narm up out of his seat and led him in the direction of a sideboard that sported gleaming decanters. Chandral leaned to speak to Yasale, Lady, who call me? Yes, Yasale responded fiercely. She bent her head conspiratorially, hair almost falling into a dish of cheese-filled mushroom caps. This lady business keeps me thinking a noble matron stands behind me, disapproving of my every move. Yes, then. Forgive me. Why does Rathen drink so much? He never seems to get drunk, but, but he drinks a goodly lot. Yasale agreed. Yes, you should know. Twas what our companion Doust Solwood gave up lordship of this dale for. Rathen's drinking. No, no. I meant they face the same problem. A good priest of Timora must continually take risks. Reckless ones, most would say, worshiping Timora truly and trusting in the lady's luck is a problem. If you're sensitive to what your recklessness does to others, or are by nature cautious or considerate. The life of trusting to luck sits not well with contemplating consequences or desiring security and comfort. You see that. Yes, Chandral nodded. But how? Well, Doust, as Lord, had to make decisions that affected the lives of the Dale folk. Concern for their safety was his duty. He couldn't do well by them and serve the Lady of Luck. In the end, his calling proved the stronger, and he gave up the Dale rather than rule poorly. I wish more who fought such battles within themselves, between office and belief, reached the right choices. Yasale looked fondly across the room at Merith, as my lord too has done. She looked at Rathen. As for yon buffoon, his jesting's but an act. He's sensitive and romantic, easily moved to tears. He hides it and overcomes the barbs of Torm with his drunken sot act. Rathen gave them a merry wave. Both women returned it. 
He drinks because he's sensitive and prudent. Yasel continued, and must favour luck and live in danger. He steals himself with drink, as he doesn't want to become falling down drunk. He eats like a starving wolf. This makes him fat and able to take in more drink without staggering and slurring. Do not think him a drunkard, Shandral. He's not. Nor is he a lecturer or fraud, but a true servant of Timora. I'm proud to ride with him. Rathen roared with laughter at a jest of storms. You've given me different eyes to see him by, lady. Yes, remember. Yasail said softly, "The most valuable thing I've learned from Elminster is to look at all things and folk, however strange they seem, from all sides." Shandral nodded, and it seemed tiny flames leaped in her eyes. "Act as you must," Yasail added, "but think as you act. You'll see things as others do." As well as the way you're used to. If you walk with the Harpers, she nodded toward Storm. They'll tell you the same thing, dressed up in grander words. The room was filling up as the good folk of Shadowdale and the staff and guards of the tower crowded into the large, high vaulted hall. There was much laughter and chatter. Norm joined Shandral in the tumult, kissing her. They party with a right good will here, Shandral said in greeting. We drink, love, laugh, and eat as if we may be dead tomorrow, Yasail replied. For death hangs over us. What? Asked Norm, taken aback. Zental Keep could sweep down on us any morn. Hillsfar's new ruler has intentions unknown. Devils walk in Mithranor to one side and Daggerdale to the other. Now you're here, and powerful foes may attack any time to slay or capture you. Some know a duty to defend you. Some merely fear they'll be caught in the way. They fear you too, Shandral. No little bit. Your spell fire on the hilltop is a scene told often and vividly in the old skull. Your lady spell fire now. Norm and Shandral stared at her, stricken. We should leave, Shandral whispered. Yasail caught at her sleeve and smiled. No, stay. The Dale folk accept you and will fight for you as they would for any guest before their hearth. You're welcome, truly. Besides, you'll upset Elminster terribly if you run off now. He's not finished with you. Come, let us dance, you two, and Merith and I. But I, we've never learned. No matter. Merith shall teach us all a dance of the Elvin Court. We'll all be new to it. Come. The lady mage pulled them out into an open space, her long hair swirling about her shoulders, and let out a bird-like call. Merith looked up, excused himself from two fat farm wives, and joined them. Storm, will you harp for us? The bard smiled and took down the harp of the hall from the wall where it hung among rusting shields of long dead lords. It was of black wood inlaid with silver, and it sang like a mournful lover as Storm ran her fingers over its strings. A gift from Mithranor, Yasail murmured. You'll be wanting to dance, my love, Merith asked. Of course, one of the gentler tunes, my lord, one that human feet can follow, Norm and Shandral, and you and I. Merith bowed. Of course. What say you to the frolic that of old we danced on the banks of the Ashaba? Storm, you know the tune. It was late, or rather very early. 
Stars glittered coldly in the clear, dark sky as revelers climbed the stairs, foot sore and happily sleepy. Elves must be stronger than I'd thought, Narm grunted as he and Shandral mounted the last flight to the bedchamber. The twisted tower was quiet around them. Far below, revelry continued unabated, but no sound carried this far. The guards stood silent at their posts. At the head of the stairs, Shandral stripped off her shoes and set her aching feet on cold stone. The chill on her bare flesh roused her somewhat. She slipped out of Narm's grasp and, laughing, ran ahead. He grinned, shook his head, and made haste to follow. They were both running when the blow fell. Shandral heard a dull thud behind her, followed by a thumping and scrabbling sound. Norm, she called, turning as she reached the door. Norm, did. A grim-faced guard ran hard for her. The mace that had felled Norm raised in a mailed fist. Shandral had no time to dodge or fight. She ran. Lady Spellfire fled on bare feet down the long, dim hall. The guard rolled, stood far ahead under a flickering torch. He turned to look at her. A wild rage grew in Shandral out of shrieking fear for Narm's life. She looked back through streaming hair. A mailed hand reached for her. Without thought, she dived to the rugs of the hall and rolled. Armored boots struck sharp, numbing blows on her back and flank. A startled curse rang out as her assailant tripped, landing in a crash of metal. Shandral rolled free and to her knees. The guard, fast and well-trained, spun about, his legs kicking the air, and drew back his mace to hurl at her. Their eyes met across too little space. Fire exploded from Shandral's raging glare. The guard yelled in fear as his mace whirled from his hand. Large, dark, like a bolt from the gods, it smashed aside hastily raised fingers and struck her hard on one side of the face. Shandral slid into a yellow haze of confusion and down into darkness. Without mercy, Rold struck Kulthar from behind, Warhammer crashing down his helm. Are you mad? You're sworn to protect her. Kulthar slumped limply aside, blood running from nose and mouth. He crumpled against the wall and was forgotten as the man who'd felled him scrambled to reach Shandral. Rold recalled that her touch was said to be death when she hurled spellfire, but he drew off a gauntlet and gently felt her temple. He wiped away the blood, cursed, and flung his gauntlet at the nearest alarm gong. Wrapping her shoulders in his half-cloak, he held her close and drew a silver disc on a fine chain from his belt. Lady Timora, he prayed hoarsely as the hollow singing of the gong rolled around him. If you favor those cursed to be different from most folk, aid this poor lass now. She's done no wrong and needs your blessing dearly. Hear me, bright lady, I beseech you. Turn your bright face upon this Shandral. The old soldier held Shandral in his arms, waiting for the sound of running feet, and prayed on. A turret on the inner wall of Zental Keep held a small, circular room with no window, and in that room, Ilfond waited with scant patience. The time was come. Still Manshun came not back to the city of the Zentalar. If Ilthond held spellfire and knew how to wield it, such a return would not have to be feared overmuch. 
The young mage paced before his crystal. The eagle that had to be Elminster even now came to earth by the door of the old, slightly leaning tower where he dwelt. The eagle became Elminster, pipe, battered old hat, and all, and went into the tower. Ilthond watched an instant more, and then drew forth a scroll tube fashioned from the hollow wing bone of a great dragon. He opened the scroll, a teleport spell, set down by the wizard Hacklesteer of Selgaunt. Since his bony back had met with a dagger, thoughtfully poisoned by the ambitious Ilthond, Hacklesteer wouldn't need it any more. That same ambitious mage rolled out the scroll on the table beside the crystal. He set coins, a dagger, a candlestick, and a skull at the corners to hold it open, fixing in his mind a clear picture of a certain blanket room on the third floor of the Tower of Ashaba, he began to cast the spell. From below him, from another room of the turret, came the faint piping of a glorist blowing the mournful melody of an old ballad. Good fortune comes fleeting, and then it is gone. But the heart, heavy with weeping, must carry on. Ill luck comes and stays like winter's cold snow. Always you must weather more than one blow. Ilthond spread his hands in a grand flourish to finish the casting, and vanished. The floating, disembodied wizard eye that had been watching him from beneath the table winked out an instant later, leaving the little room once more as dark and uninhabited as it was supposed to be. Chapter 15 Hawks Weep, Fool's Plan Afterward, the greatest victories always look like the work of brilliant war captains. In the midst of the fray, they're just as much cursing and slipping and tangles of death and disaster as the greatest defeats. The trick is to wind up among those who survive such battles relatively unmaimed. The gods reward those who die gloriously in their service. The rest of us have to reward ourselves. Rolavan Emmertide of Suzale, Sword Lord and Survivor, Forty Summers Under the Purple Dragon, Year of the Bright Blade. Of course she'll live, if ye get out of my way for a breath or two, Rathen roared. Lancerl, stay and heal. Rold, ye saved her. Ye stay too. Florin, bring Narm over here. Be he awake yet? All others, get hence. Downstairs, the lot of ye. Morngrim, ye and Cheryl may stay, of course. The rest, clear out. Get gone. Narm stirs, Ysail reported tersely. We'll take this guardsman, if Rold hasn't quite slain him, and learn the wise of this. All others, back to your posts. Our thanks for your haste in coming. The guards saluted her and left. Florin laid Narm gently on a sleeping fur, letting his bruised head down with care. How is she? Florin asked, looking at Chandril's still face. Well enough, Rathen replied, considering the blow she took, I only hope it hasn't somehow harmed her ability to wield spellfire, now that half Faerun will attack her to gain it. Why would just one guard attack? Morngrim muttered, frowning. One seemed to do well enough, Cheryl remarked gesturing at the two still forms. No, love, I meant I'd expect to find other attackers near at hand, 
Rold, I want this tower searched forthwith, this floor first. Yasail, will you rouse Elistal and stand guard over our two guests? I'll remain also. Morngrim drew his slim, jeweled sword, set it point down before him, and leaned on it. Cheryl nodded and knelt by Narm, who had begun to moan faintly. Florin was ready with strong, sure arms when the young mage suddenly surged up, arms flailing. Where's Chandral? Danger! Beware! Danger! I, I, Florin agreed gently, holding him. Danger twas, indeed. Stay still now, and we can see to your lady. Shan, how is she? Sh. Quiet and still, please. She lies behind you. Rathen and Lancerel tend her. I... yes. Norm sank back, as pale as snow, wincing as his head came to rest on the firs. Norm, lie quiet and still, as you were bid, Lady Cheryl said. Norm grimaced, and then he heard Chandral say softly, I thank you. Norm was hurt. Have you seen to him? His heart knew peace, and he sank into the warm, waiting darkness, and was asleep, not even hearing Rathen's reply. It was dark and close in the blanket room. The smells of pomander and moth mix were strong. Ilthond stifled a sneeze, nodded in satisfaction at his accurate journeying, and listened. He could hear nothing. Well enough. To work, then. The mage worked invisibility on himself and eased the door open. The passage beyond seemed empty. He stole forth and looked about. Better and better, he thought. Muttering a spell of flight, Ilthond rose to drift unseen along the corridor. No guards. Why? Was Shadowdale truly so lax? No, there must be some strife or alarm. Around the corner came a dozen guards with drawn swords and forbidding glares. Ilthond floated over and passed them in careful silence. Where might the young maid be? The tower's mortar was mixed with substances to prevent scrying, but all he needed to do was find enough grim guards gathered before a closed door, and she'd be beyond. She might be above, in the plainer but more secure rooms, or below, as befitted a guest of importance. The greater risk lay downward, but so, too, did all chance of learning who was where. Ah, well, a short, risky road leads fastest to the top, they say. Ilthond reached a stair and headed down, keeping near the sloping stone ceiling. Carefully and quietly he went, nosing through rooms and along halls like a silent shadow, flitting swiftly, yet taking care not to be brushed against. After a time, his search brought him to a long hall where torches burned every twenty paces. At its far end, humans in rich garb stood or knelt near two more who lay on the floor. Ilthund drifted slowly and silently closer, straining to hear. How do ye feel? Rathen growled. Better, I trust? Shandral nodded slowly. My head still aches. My thanks indeed, good Rathen. Again, I'm in your debt for healing me. Not in my debt, Rathen corrected. The lady, tis whom ye owe... With the middle finger of his right hand, he traced a circle about the disc on his breast. 
Yes, I'll not forget the lady's favor, Shendril replied. How fares Narm? Rathen looked over at Narm. He sleeps. Best to let him sleep on. But ye must try thy spellfire. Shandril had risen onto her elbows. Drawing her legs under her, she extended an unsteady hand. From her spread fingers, spellfire spat down the hall in a long tongue of flame. It died away, curling into air. As before, I can still... A pain-racked groan came out of empty air down the hall. Florin and Morngrim drew steel and stepped in front of Shandril. Cheryl drew her dagger and wrapped the nearest gong with its pummel. A robed man with hawkish features and glossy black hair faded into view in midair. His face was twisted in pain, his robe smoldered, and his shoulder and breast were burned bare. Glaring, he hissed a word that unleashed the power of the wand in his hand. Forked lightning crackled down the hall, striking both Florin and Morngrim. The Lord of Shadowdale staggered and fell heavily, blade clattering. Cheryl cried out and ran to him. Florin was driven to his knees by the bolt, but struggled up into a slow, weak charge, face black with pain. Shandril stood, furious and heartsick, and lashed out with spellfire. Wherever I go, always be set, always friends and companions hurt. You seek spellfire? Well then, have it! Spellfire roared out of her in a tumbling inferno that lasted for but a breath, but raged down the hall. It swept over the flying mage like a wave over rocks. The lightning had shaken Narm into dazed wakefulness. Gasping in pain, he struggled to his knees to work art and protect his lady from this new menace. His hands froze as he saw the blackened, crippled thing that the spellfire left on the scorched rugs of the hall. The man moved weakly and twisted cooked lips in words of art. Shandril raised a hand again, but did not unleash her flames. His head sank down between smoking shoulders that shook with pain, and the mage vanished, gone as if he had never been. Wherever we go, Shandril said wearily, turning to Rathen, your healing services are needed. I hope you'll not grow tired of it all before this comes to an end. Lady, Rathen replied as he hastened to where Morngrim lay, this never ends, I fear. Worry not about my patience. Tis what I walk these realms for. He knelt by the Lord of Shadowdale and looked back at her over one shoulder. Ye do impressive work, I must say. Ysail arrived, robes held high as she sprinted along in the forefront of a large group of guards. Shandril, Florin, Morngrim. Merith was at her side, blade out. We need healing. Rathen called. The time for blasting and all that is past. Send four guardsmen for Aresia at the temple. I've no more power to heal, and Morngrim needs it. Ysail relayed his orders and then asked, What happened? Another mage, Rathen snapped, flying about and invisible. Shandril touched him with spellfire purely by chance when I asked her to test her powers. He struck Florin and Morngrim with lightning from a wand. Shandril burned, but did not slay him. He teleported away. Ysail looked at Shandril. You slew him not? Shandril nodded. I could not. T'was horrible. I... Can't fault you, Ysail said slowly. 
Yet when you fight, art to art, seek to slay and finish the job, a foe who escapes will return for revenge. I, said Cheryl, eyes hot, a man who struck down my lord lives. I blame you not, Shandrel. It must be terrible to hold such death within you, always knowing you can slay. Yet if that man were within my grasp right now, I'd not hesitate to strike and slay. One who'd harm my Morngrim does not deserve to live. Sounds of running feet came. A guardsman reached the head of the stairs, shouting, Lord Morngrim, Lady Cheryl! Cheryl turned. Say on. My lady, the prisoner is gone. We had him in the cell, and his hands were bound. Yet he vanished before our eyes. The man, Kulthar? Cheryl asked. How could this happen? She turned to Ysail. The lady mage nodded calmly, and Cheryl sighed and turned back to the guard. I hold you and all the guard blameless. Bid a search be mounted for Kulthar, and return to your post with our thanks. The guard nodded, bowed, and hurried off. Ysail shrugged. A teleport ring, perhaps, a rogue stone, or another way of art I don't know. All would require outside aid. The Zentarum, perhaps, or the priests of Bane. Kolthar was someone's eyes here in the tower. She spread her hands in futility with a ghost of a smile. The ravens are gathering. Cheryl sighed. Aye, and I'm growing tired of it. Rathen looked up. Ye grow tired of it. What of we who heal? Ah, but you enjoy divine aid, said Morngrim weakly from beneath the priest's hands. Mind you, see to Florin, too. I need him healthy and alert. The man who'd once declined the lordship of Shadowdale and led the knights from their early days was leaning against a wall in pain-racked silence. Florin, Ysail asked hesitantly, are you badly hurt? As usual. Florin's voice was rueful, and he lowered it so only she could hear. I'm growing too old for constant battle, yes. Tis not the thrill it used to be. Oh, no, you don't, Ysail said briskly, putting a slim arm about his great shoulders. Not now. We need you. She drew him down until he sat against the wall. You'll feel much better once you've been healed. Merith joined them. Florin nodded gratefully to them both and quietly fainted. Ysail let his head rest on her shoulder and said to her husband, My lord, please run to our strongbox for a potion. He's hurt worse than I thought. Shandrel turned her face to the wall and leaned her forehead on her arm. I... I... We must leave you. Again and again you're hurt for our sake, one attack after another. You're my friends. I must not do this to you day after day. She burst into tears. Must we have all this weeping? Rathen complained. Tis as bad as the fighting. Nay, worse, ye can stop the fighting by slaying thy foe. Norm rose to defend his lady, but Rathen pushed him down again with but two stout fingers. Don't start. Ye are not fully healed. I'm not having ye rush around getting hurt and crying all about the place. Do ye hear? Just lie down and wait. We'll see if there's time to listen to such foolishness. Merith went to Chandrel and tickled her gently under the ribs until she turned from the wall. He swept her into his arms and kissed away her tears. Nay, nay, little one, you needn't be ashamed or upset on our account. 
Tis a hard road you walk, an adventurer's road. Would you not walk it with us? Tis not so lonely or hard with friends. Oh, Merith, Shandrel said and sobbed into his shoulder. Merith carried her to Florin and Ysail and sat her down on his own lap. Cry not so, Ysail bade. Does the hawk weep because it has wings? Does the wolf howl because it has teeth? We do what we can with our art or skill at arms. Is your spellfire so different? Use it and hold yourself not to blame for the attacks others make on you or this place. We do not blame you. She patted Shendrel's knee. Let's all go to the Great Hall as soon as Aresia has done her healing and see if there's aught to eat or drink. Violence always makes me hungry. In a turret on the inner walls of Zental Keep, in a small, circular chamber, Ilthond sprawled on a familiar floor. He lay on the painted circle he'd practiced teleporting to, and he groaned in pain. None were there to see or hear. He was alone behind three locked and hidden doors. Pain crashed over him in waves of red agony, as if he struggled seaward through the breakers on a beach. Ilthond crawled forward between waves, seeking the cabinet where he kept his potions. He wondered dully if he'd reach it. That's quite enough foolishness, Elminster said peevishly. I leave ye, and within half a dozen breaths ye are scorching another mage. Well then, I'll not leave ye. Ye'll stay in my tower, ye two, with my scribe, Leo, and myself. To draw off all who are hunting spellfire, a listel and torm will impersonate ye, in a tent with Rathen upon Harper's Hill. Merith, ye and Lancerol will keep watch on them. Now pass that wine ye are curled so lovingly about, Rathen, and let's have no argument. The matter's settled. I'm glad of that, Florin said dryly. Have you no task for Ysail or me? Eh? Gods look down, man. Someone has to watch over the dale and shatter the armies of Zental Keep if they come calling. Ye too ought to be able to manage that. There were dry chuckles and then a yawn. Shandrel's eyes were nearly closed. Love, Norm said gently, shaking her. Are you sleepy? Of course. She replied faintly, We were going to bed when this uproar started, remember? To bed, then, Elminster said gruffly. We'll all prance yonder to my tower together, and then mind the lot of ye return here, except our two innocents. I don't want to be falling over a lot of snoring nights in the morning. At this rate, Lancerol replied, you're safe on that score. You'll be falling over snoring nights at high sun instead. Amid chuckles, they went out into the night. Keeping you awake, Rold. One of his fellows grunted jovially at dawn fry that morning. The guard room was strewn with gloves, helms, and scabbarded blades as their owners lingered over the last fried bread tomatoes, and bacon. The old veteran yawned again. Glad I am, indeed, that the young lord and lady are out of the tower. No offense to them. It's just that I'll be more likely to sleep when I'm off duty. Fewer sinister mages and night slayers skulking in every hall and peeking through every window. Agreed another sharp-voiced guard, buckling on his sword. Aye, Kellen, 
Less art we can't fight, and less treachery within. A little silence fell at Rold's words. Kellen said softly, Who do you think got to Kulthar? What did they offer him to chance such a reckless grab at one who could cook him to the bones? Who can know another man's price? Rold replied. Several guards nodded. I doubt he needed much persuading. Belike he was already loyal to someone outside the Dale, someone who told him to do this thing. What someone? Rold shrugged. That I know not, or I'd be at Lord Morngrim to let me go after him. Don't laugh. Tis easier on one's temper to be moving and attacking instead of growing cold and weary at a guard post, never knowing when attack will come. Where did they go? asked a young guard, a late riser, still heavy about the eyes, Dawn Fry on a plate in his hand. Rold chuckled. Mind you aren't late for your own funeral some morn, Wraith. The young lord and lady'll be camping out by Harper's Hill with Rath and Thentraver, practicing hurling this spellfire where Lord Morngrim's fine rugs won't be scorched. Most of the knights will be off about the dales at Elminster's bidding. Ah, things'll get a mite quieter for a few days, Wraith said with satisfaction. The older guards chuckled. Think you so? Kellen asked. "'Tis a long run through the forest, in full armor, to Harper's Hill." Rold was still chuckling as the bell rang, and they hastened to their posts. Wraith, his mouth full of bacon, wasn't. "'This is a fool's plan,' Rathen grunted. "'One only Elminster could have come up with.' The mighty of Timora surveyed the tents sourly. Lady, aid me. I'm surely going to need thy help. Cheerful, aren't you? Torm answered. I'm enjoying this. Ye have weird enthusiasms, Rathen grunted. Ye can't even enjoy thy lady when she must wear the shape of Chandral every instant. Torm grinned. Oh, that's going to hamper me? How so? He raised dark eyebrows. Besides, I look like Narm for the present. Shameless philanderer, Rathen growled. He looked at the trees around. I wonder when the first attack will come. While you're standing there, Torm replied, if you keep yapping about Elminster's wisdom and the danger you've so foolishly plunged headlong into, go in and pray to the lady for healing art. No doubt we'll need it soon enough. Aye, there ye speak truth, Rathen replied darkly. Is there no wine about? He peered into the tents. A listel smiled back at him out of one, looking like Chandral. She moved with smooth innocence, abandoning her own defiant strut. No, Torm answered brightly. We've left it behind at the tower. A tragedy, I agree. Indeed. Well, one of the guards will just have to go back for it, Rathen concluded, squinting at the sun. My thirst grows. Here, then. Torm passed him a flask. Rathen unstopped it and sniffed suspiciously. What is it? I smell not. Water of the gods, Torm replied. Pale ale, Timora's tipple. Eh? The priest frowned. Ye blaspheme? No, I offer you a drink, sot. Your thirst, remember? Aye. Rathen agreed, mollified, and took a swig. Ah, he said, spitting most of it out. It is water. Aye, as I told you, 
Torm replied smoothly, leaping nimbly out of the way as the priest reached for him. The mighty of Timora pursued his sly tormentor across the rocky hilltop, while Alistal watched from the tent, shaking her head. Playing already, I see, she remarked, just loudly enough for Torm to hear. He turned and waved at her, grinning, and promptly fell over a stone with Rathen on top of him. A listal burst into laughter before she realized she couldn't recall what Chandral's laugh sounded like. The leaning stone tower rose out of a grassy meadow beside a small pond. It was built of old, massive stones without gate or fence or outbuildings. Flagstones led up to a plain wooden door. It looked small and drab in comparison with the twisted tower rising against the sky across the meadow, but it seemed somehow a place of power, too, and more welcoming. Inside, it was very dark. Dust lay thick on books and papers stacked untidily everywhere. The smell of aging parchment filled the air. Out of the colonnade of paper pillars rose a rickety, curving stair, ascending to unseen heights. A bag of onions hung over the doorway. Beyond an arch, faint footfalls sounded. Leo, Elminster called. Guests! An expressionless face appeared in the doorway. There's no need for thy simpering act, the old mage added. The face smiled and nodded, a pleasant green-eyed face with pale brown hair and delicate features. Its owner was about as tall as Merith, very slim, and wore an old patched leather apron over plain tunic and hose. Welcome, Leo greeted them in a soft, clear voice. If you're hungry, there's stew warm over the fire. High sun feast will be herbed hair cooked in red wine. That Sembian red Morngrim gave us. I deem it good for little else. I fear I've no dawn fry ready. Elminster chuckled. Ye'd have been wasted on a throne, Leo. I've eaten no better fare since Mithranor fell than what ye cook. But I forget my manners, such as they are. Leo, these be Norm Tamaraith, a mage who flourishes these passing days under the tutelage of Ysail and Elistal, and his betrothed, Chandral Chasser. Who can wield spellfire? Leo's eyes opened wide. After all these years, you were right to bring them here. Many will rise against her. Many already have, the white-bearded wizard replied dryly. Narm, Shandral, I make known to thee, Leo, my scribe and cartographer. Outside these walls, he's counted a lisping man-lover from Baldur's Gate. He's not, but that's his tale. Come up now, and I'll show ye thy bed. I hope ye don't mind, there's only one, and some old clothes to keep ye warm. We don't feel the cold, but I know others find it chill." Keep him to one speech, Leo added as they started up the stairs, which creaked alarmingly. And I'll have tea ready when you come down again. They went up through a thick stone floor into a circular room. Chandral cast an eye over the maps and scrolls cluttering a large table, but looked away quickly as runes crawled on the parchment. Over the table... A globe hung in midair, a pale sphere of radiance like a small moon. 
Its light showed a narrower stair curving up into the darkness. Books and scrolls littered the chests and lay piled atop a tall black wardrobe. The old wooden bed, with a curved rail at head and foot, looked solid and cozy. Shandrel felt tired after the battles and conferences. She swayed on her feet. Norm and Elminster both put out a hand to her. Shandrel waved them away. Thank you both. I've been a burden to many since I left Deepingdale. Second thoughts? The old mage asked quietly, no censure in his tone. No, no, not when I can think clearly. I just couldn't have lived through it alone. She turned to the wizard. There's only one bed. Where will you sleep? In the kitchen. Leo and I are rarely asleep at the same time. Someone has to watch the stew. Norm laughed. The greatest archmage in all Faerun, and you spend nights watching a pot of stew? Is there a higher calling? Elminster replied. Oh, speaking of pots, the chamber pots by the foot of the bed, yon. I, I know it looks odd. Tis an upturned wyvern skull sealed with paste. I stole it from the bedchamber of a Tharconis in Thay, in my wilder days. He made a quick gesture. Various pipes and tobacco pouches rose and darted away down the stairs like hurrying wasps. Come and have thy tea, and then ye can sleep. Ye'll be safe here, if anywhere in the realms. Do as ye always do together, so long as it does not involve a lot of screaming. A little noise will not bother us. If ye pry about, be warned, the art here can kill in an instant. Elminster, Norm said as the wizard started downstairs, Our thanks. You've gone to much trouble. And if I did not... What sort of greatest archmage in all Faerun would I be? Came the gruff reply over the old mage's shoulder. I'm stepping out for a pipe. Mind ye, come in haste. Gond alone knows what Leo'll put in thy tea if you're not there. He thinks every cup should be a new experience. Below, the door banged. By the gods, I'm tired, Norm said. Aye, too tired, Shandrel agreed. I hope we can sleep. Her hands, as she reached to him, were shaking. They wearily went down to tea. When Elminster finished his pipe, he knocked its ashes out on the doorstep and came back in. All well? Leo came to the door, Norm leaning limply on his shoulder. The scribe held him up with casual strength. All well. They'll sleep until morn. I mixed the dose carefully, and they drank it all down. Good. I'll take his feet. A sound sleep will do them good. When he's rested and not worried sick about his lady love, I'll get a look at the lad's castings. How about her? No training needed. She's already learned much precision. When we fought Manshun, she was still a child hurling a snowball. Now she can do more with it. Mind this bit. The lad's heavy than most mages ever do with fire magics. They laid Norm on the bed and went back for Shandrel. Leo frowned as they carefully ascended the stair. We've much that will fit the lad, but what of this little lady? Elminster looked wise. I've already thought on that, he replied. 
Some of the gowns Shuri Talaith wore when Mithranor was bright. They're in the chest near the stairs. She, too, could wield spellfire. She won't mind. Walks she yet? Leo asked, as they laid Shandral gently beside Narm and drew off her boots. Elminster looked thoughtful. I doubt she does, but perhaps some who joined the long sleep years ago stir now. That'd explain why the devils in Mithranor have not troubled us more. Something to look into. His face grew a wry grin. In my copious free time. I know this is wisest and safest, Shandril said, but I grow so bored, Leo. Is there nothing I can do? I can't pry into spell books. I'd only get hurt or changed into some beast. I can't tidy for the same reason. Do you cook? Leo asked expressionlessly. Of course. Why, at the rising moon... She stopped, eyes alight. May I cook with you? Leo bowed and smiled. Please. Tis seldom I can converse with another who spends time in a kitchen. Who wants to talk to someone who speaks thus? He asked with a mincing lisp. Why do you pretend to be Elminster's companion? Leo looked at her soberly. My lady, I'm in hiding. I'll tell you who I am only if you never tell anyone beyond Narm. I promise by whatever oaths you wish. Leo shook his head. Your word is enough. Come into the kitchen. Warmed by a small hearth fire, Leo's lair smelled deliciously of herbs, simmering stew, and onion soup. Are you a lost prince? Shandril prompted jokingly. He waved her to a stool and went to inspect the huge stew pot. I suppose you could say that, Leo said, stirring with a long-handled ladle. I'm the last of the royal house of Tethir. Shandril's mouth fell open. Leo smiled and waved his ladle. In happier times, I was so far from the throne that I never thought of myself as a prince. But there have been so many deaths that I am, so far as Elminster and I can tell, the last alive of royal blood. Why do you hide? Leo shrugged. All who seize power expect others to do as they would. Anyone of royal blood must want to wear the crown, they think. I live because they don't know I live. That's all there is to tell. Not so impressive, is it? But tis a secret that must be kept, for my life hangs upon it. I'll not tell it, Shandril said firmly. What can I help with here? Leo looked at her. Cook what you like and teach me as you go, please? They smiled at each other across a bag of onions. And my thanks. For keeping your secret? Aye, each secret has a weight all its own. They add up secrets to a burden you carry all your days. Shandril looked up from selecting onions. You carry many? Aye, but my load is nothing to Elminster's. Shandril looked down. Whose gown is it that I wear? That's a secret. I'd tell, but tis his to unfold, not mine. Well enough. 
Have you an old apron I can wear? I, hanging behind you. Tell me of the rising moon. She did. They serve others most who ask the right question, and then listen. The day passed, and they marked not the time. The day passed, and Norm grew weary. He was used to the clear and careful teaching of Yassail and Alistal. Elminster's methods were a rude shock. The old mage badgered and derided and made testy comments. The simplest query on a small detail of casting brought a scholarly flood of information, a voluminous barrage that never included a direct answer. Elminster had worked over Narm's newest spell, the Sphere of Flame, until Narm could have screamed. Weary hours of study to impress the difficult runes on Narm's mind, and then a sharp lecture on precisely how to cast the spell in view of his obvious shortcomings became grinding irritants. Then came a moment of casting, a ball of scorching flame, and a thrill the first few times. Now, though, Norm saw each as a failure even before Elminster spoke in scathing critique. Clumsy, slow, lazy, inattentive, imprecise, off-target. Have ye not seen your lady hurl spellfire? Elminster demanded in acid tones. She can shape the flame, a broad fan or a thin, dexterous tongue, bend it around comers or pulse short spurts to avoid setting her surroundings ablaze. I suppose ye couldn't tell me the hue of her eyes either. Hey, they are. Norm angrily replied. But Chandril's face wouldn't come to mind. Confused and badgered, he hurled fire angrily, tossing the ball of flames twenty feet before it landed and rolled. Temper, boy, Elminster admonished, watching it. Too easily it can be thy death. Mages cannot afford it. Not if it affects the precision of their casting. Here ye are, furious with me, and we've spent merely a morning together. Not good. Oh, I'll grant ye that's good enough for lesser talents who swagger about throwing fireballs and bullying honest farm folk. I'd hoped ye'd look for something more in the service of Mistra. Their gazes met, the one sorrowful, the other glowering. Ye can be a great mage, Norm, if ye develop just two things: precision in spell effects and imagination in art. The latter ye'll need later when ye reach past most mages. The precision ye must master now, else thy every spell will have some waste about it. Thy art will lack that edge of shrewd phrasing and maximum effect that may mean the difference between defeat and victory. Norm opened his mouth to speak, but Elminster continued. As ye advance, ye'll become a target for those who gain spells by preying on other mages. If ye lack precision in a jewel of art, ye'll be utterly destroyed. Then, twill be too late for my lessons. Such a waste of my time that would be. But I can't hope to win a duel now. How will spending all day throwing balls of flame about make any difference to that? If I win a duel, surely it will be because I have stronger spells and more of them. Perhaps, 
Yet, know ye, a mage can do more with a few simple spells he knows back to front and can use shrewdly than with an arsenal hastily memorized and poorly understood. Do ye follow? Norm nodded. Good, the old mage said briskly. I'll leave ye to thyself. If ye promise to study and cast your flaming sphere at least four times more here in this field before ye rest for the day, move the sphere just where ye want it and form it precisely in the place ye choose. Think on how ye can use such a weapon against, say, a group of goblins who scatter in all directions when they see it coming. But try to get it past it toward ye. He started to trudge away. Only foolish, arrogant mages stand still after they've cast. Move! or a simple arrow will make ye a dead wizard, no matter how impressive ye were in life. Oh, and worry not about the stubble. Ye are doing the farmer a favor by burning it off. Try not to take the fencing with it. Tis harder to term that friendly help. Have I thy promise? Yes, and my thanks. Thanks? Tis impatient ye are again, Narm. The task's not done. Save thy thanks till ye master this spell. Then thank thyself first. I can talk all day and only waste breath if ye fail to heed, work, and master the art. Norm grinned. You do? Elminster's grin lit his face only an instant, but the twinkle in his eye remained as he became a falcon and flew away. Norm stood in the field and watched him go, sighed, and reached for his spellbook. The sun was bright on the old skull. He bent his head to the book. Much later, when he stood to cast his first flaming sphere, Norm drew a deep breath of satisfaction. At least he was alone and could work art without watching eyes and sharp comments. He turned to look at the stubble, choosing what he could burn. A small boy had appeared from somewhere and hung on the fence rails, watching. Go away! Norm said crossly. This your field? The boy asked laconically. You could get hurt. I'm casting spells. Aye, I've been watching. But I won't be hurt unless you cast spells at me. You won't. There are no evil wizards in Shadowdale. Ma says Elminster won't allow it. I see. Norm snapped, his jaw set. He turned and hurled fire. The boy watched fire roll away and stayed glued to the fence. All day long he stayed as Norm hurled fire, sat down to study, got up and threw fire, and went back to his books. Norm was weary and thirsty when he went to the gate at evening. The boy climbed down from the fence and fell into step beside him. I wish I could be a great mage like you. Narm laughed. I wish I could be a great mage. I know so little. I feel so useless. You? The boy shook his head. I saw you cast balls of fire. You point them where to go and they move at your bidding. You must be mighty. Being a mage is a lot more than hurling fireballs. The boy nodded thoughtfully, waved a sudden farewell, ducked through a gap in the hedge, and was gone. Norm shrugged and walked on. 
Ahead, he could see a patrol of guards on horseback, trotting with lances raised. It must be nice to call a place like this home. When Norm came up the path, Elminster sat smoking on a boulder near his front step. Well, can ye put a sphere where ye want to? Norm nodded. So, are ye a mage? Norm shrugged. I've a long road to go before I'm strong in art, but I can stand in most company now and know my art will serve me. He added proudly, There'll always be others more powerful, but I've truly mastered what I do know. Oh? Elminster asked. Think ye so? His features blurred and shifted beneath the battered hat, flowing and changing. Norm suddenly faced the young boy who had watched his spell practice from the fence. The little face grinned, its mouth opened, and in a perfect imitation of Norm's own voice, said solemnly, Being a mage is a lot more than hurling fireballs. Norm stared in anger, then resignation, and then sheepish amusement. Elminster won't allow it indeed. I'll have to rise early in the day to get ahead of you. I've several hundred years start on ye. Come, even feasts ready. Ye've chosen wisely. Thy lady's a cook of rare skill. See that ye serve her as well, boy. He knocked his pipe out on the doorstep and went in. Norm looked once at the stars beginning to sparkle in the darkening sky and followed him inside. Chapter 16 To Walk Unseen Bards soon forget a warrior falling without a great feat of arms. Would you be forgotten? Face each battle, each foe, as though it is your last. One day it will be. Dathlance of Selgont, an old warrior's way, year of the blade. Morning sun laid bright fingers across the table in the audience chamber of the twisted tower. Chandral watched stray dust motes sparkle above the table as she and Norm waited for Elminster. Norm's hand found hers. They sat together in contented silence, alone with the fading tapestries of Shadowdale's past and the empty throne. Before we two met, I was brought here by Elistal, Norm said quietly, and spoke with Morngrim. It seems an age ago. Chandral nodded. I'd swear I left Deepingdale very long ago, yet tis ten days, not months. She looked at the great painted map of the Dragon Reach. I wonder where we'll be in a year. The doors opened, and Elminster came in. The wizard was alone. He walked slowly, and truly looked old. He sat in a chair beside them, and fixed them with a bright gaze. So quiet. Have ye both stopped thinking, then? No, Narm replied boldly. Why say you so? The old mage shrugged. The young are said to be always talking, or laughing, or fighting. Ye two surprised me. He took out his pipe, looked at it, and then put it away again. I asked ye here to tell thee I've watched and seen and judge ye two as well trained with art and spellfire as we can make thee. Tis up to thee now if ye'd grow more powerful. More? 
Tis time for ye to decide what to do with thy lives. Do? Norm asked. Elminster nodded. Tis not good to drift along under the influence of the knights and myself. Ye'd be swept into our councils and struggles, and grow embittered as ye lost the will to walk thine own roads and think for thyselves. But we've found friends here, and happy times, Chandril protested, and— And danger, Elminster interrupted smoothly. I want to keep ye with me. One can't have too many friends, and I grow weary of losing them one after another with the years. But if I let ye stay, I draw doom to ye, just as will settling down together in the dale. What, living together will bring danger? Norm asked. Nay, Staying in one place will, with thy talent, Elminster said, pointing a long finger at Chandril, one mage after another will seek to slay thee. Mullmaster, Fay, and the Zenterum all would destroy anything that threatens magecraft. So walk ye out into the wide realms, and disappear. I can alter thy outward selves, though to each other ye'll look the same. Pass from sight, and thy menace will be forgotten in the struggles these tyrants of art have with one another. Just disappear, Chandril said. Doing what, exactly? My advice is to wander and hide. Ye'll need friends to raise sword or art to aid thee, so walk with Storm Silverhand and her fellow harpers to find thine own ways and adventures. Mistake me not, I'd not be rid of ye. The wizard put his pipe in his mouth. If ye stay, ye'll soon be slain, or stunted in art and spirit. Come back and visit, though. A flame sprouted from Elminster's forefinger, and he puffed his pipe furiously into life, his eyes misty. Chandril and Norm looked at each other. I... We both think you're right, Chandril replied. Yet we'd speak with the knights before deciding. Elminster looked at Norm, who nodded silently. We don't want to leave this place, our friends, Chandril added. If we must, we'd know where in the realms tis best to go. Well said. Elminster agreed gravely. If ye like, I'll tell Morngrim. Chandril nodded. Please. She did not burst into tears until after he'd gone. He's right, Norm said gently, his arms about her. Oh, I know, Chandril sniffled. It's leaving friends. First Gorstag and Lorene at the inn, then Delg, Berlain, Rymel, and now the knights. I'll even miss Elminster, the crusty old bastard. Well, that's as polite and honest a calling as I've had in a long time. The wizard's unmistakable voice said dryly from just behind them, Norm and Chandril whirled around. You must have been waiting outside the door, Chandril said hotly to Morngrim. The Lord of Shadowdale raised calming hands. Everyone must stand somewhere. I lost five gold pieces at dice with the guards, if tis any consolation. 
The others will be here in a breath or two. He strode to a tall cabinet. In the meantime, a flagon of wine apple? I strained it myself. Tis not fermented. You can't get drunk. Well, seeing as you've yon cabinet open, Rathen growled from the door. Morngrim sighed. Is Torm with you? I thought as much. Leave something drinkable that I can give to visiting gentles, will you? He sat on his throne, flagon in hand. Well met, yes. Elistal, where's Merith? Along in a minute, Ysail told him. He was in the bath when Cheryl called. Ah, that's why she isn't back yet. Torm said innocently, addressing the glass he raised to his lips. An instant later, Morngrim's empty flagon bounced off his head. My lord, if I may borrow your boot, said a voice from the door, sweet and low. Of course, lady, replied Merith beside her, drawing it off and proffering it politely. Cheryl threw hard and accurately. Torm groaned and dropped Morngrim's flagon with a clatter, amid general mirth. "'All here?' the Lord of Shadowdale asked. At the door, Lancerell nodded as he settled an ornate lock-bar into place. "'Good! Norm and Shandrel have something to ask you!' Silence fell. Shandrel gazed around, suddenly shy, and nudged Norm. He looked at her uncomfortably, cleared his throat, and lapsed into silence. Ye need no speech, lad, Elminster said. Just say thy peace straight out before someone else attacks the tower to seize thee. Amid chuckles, Norm swallowed and got to his feet. Well, then, Shan and I think we should leave to live our own lives. We don't want to insult or upset anyone. You've been good friends and protectors. My lady and I will be ever grateful. Yet, as long as we stay, Shadowdale will be an armed camp. We must go. But where, we know not. He looked at Chandral, read something in her eyes, and added, we would talk it over with you and then decide, the two of us, afterward. We alone must live with our decision and with each other. He sat down suddenly, feeling foolish. Good speech, Alistal said. Well then, what would you know? Shandrel spoke. What are the Harpers? Not who, but what? Florin answered, My wife is one, yet even to me they remain mysterious. They're secretive about their ranks and precise aims as a defense against foes, but do work for good. When you see a silver moon and harp, you face a harper. Storm Silverhand is openly a harper, as is the High Lady of Silvery Moon, Many bards, rangers, and half-elves are harpers. They oppose the Zentarum and those who plunder wilder lands. Thoughtless mining and felling of timber, the merchants of Am, for instance, in Shadowdale we respect and aid harpers. Well enough, Norm said, nodding. Where should we wander, harpers or no? Somewhere you can get filthy rich, Torm said with a grin, and hide among masses of people, finding any living you fancy. Water deep, for instance. Morngrim, whose family was of noble Water Davian stock, shook his head ruefully. Have you no honor? Ysail inquired wearily of Torm. Aye, indeed. I keep it at the bottom of my pack and take it out to polish and admire on windy nights in the wilderness. It shines grandly, 
but tis poor company, and keeps one not warm. Ignore him, Rathen said. His rat-like city breeding leads his lips astray. Water deep is a good place to hide, I, but more dangerous by far than Shadowdale. Tis full of prying eyes, and not a few folk who will take all they can and leave what remains in a gutter. Lancerol nodded. Better to travel the wilds of the Sword Coast North, High Forest, and Fair Silvery Moon. The unicorn runs, breathtaking in its beauty, great trees gowned in moss that have stood since the world was young. Worth the trip, I tell you. Ay, go where few tread, and see what few see, and ye'll always remember, Rathen agreed. I envy thee thy journey. Bring what perils it may. Elminster rolled his eyes. Is every lord and lady here going to philosophize pompously the whole ten day through? Why not? Tis our turn, after years of listening to your fulminations. Torm returned wickedly. A hush fell as the curious waited to see if he would forthwith become a frog. Elminster merely chuckled. True enough. My turn to listen and be entertained. Visibly disappointed that Torm had escaped frogdom, Florin and Lancerol refilled their flagons and strolled about the chamber. Shandrel frowned. Is this converse not the way to do things? Well, Lancerol told a decanter, few have sense enough to talk beforehand. Most are in too much hurry to rush into battle or trust secrets only with themselves. Never think jaw waggings bad or necessary, Rathen agreed. "'Tis one of the most important things priests do.' "'Well said,' Torm put in. "'Such talks as needed as the sword in an ordered life, "'and the deeds of kings. "'Twas the sage Maroon who defined the famous circle of diplomacy. "'Why talk but to end the fighting? "'Why fight but to end the talking? "'Tis as true today as a thousand years ago.' Well, old mage, did I remember, or did I not? Ye did. Perhaps the first thing I've told thee ye have managed to recall rightly, Elminster said severely. But enough banter. It helps not these good people to decide, and grants them but weariness and lost time. Aye, Florin agreed. We should unfold the realms to you so you can choose your best route. Danger ye'll find, Elminster put out in dryly. Lies on every hand. We'll tongue tore now, but also make thee a map on soft hide. Were I ye, I'd seek silvery moon, or never winter, or the moon chaise. Ye must, I think, leave these lands about the sea of fallen stars, at least for a time. The south is no hiding place for thee. Go west and find fortune. Yasail nodded. Whatever you choose, do so quickly and quietly. Those who'd slay you are looking for you. Lord Marsh... The voice was cold. Its red-haired owner turned from a many-paned window inset with rubies. Fzul, Chembril, high dark priest of Bane and master of the Black Altar, laid even colder eyes on his visitor, extending a hand that bore a black, burning Bane stone. Lord Marsh Bellwintle knelt, kissed it, and rose, keeping his face impassive. The slave trade was too profitable to jeopardize it with a quarrel. Marsh did not love this priest. 
One day there would come a reckoning between them, and if Timora smiled, Fazul would serve Bane more eternally than he did now. I've called you here to discuss the matter of Spellfire in light of the continued absence of Lord Manshoon, Fazul said, striding away. The others are here already. Too often matters of state devour time, Marsh replied, following Fazul across a drafty bridge, a railless span of stone where one misstep meant a killing fall to a stone floor twenty fathoms below. They went to a high chamber Marsh had not seen before, wherein assembled Senior Zenterum. They nodded coldly to him as he entered. He half bowed to them and took the sole empty seat. The chairs of Sashin, Kador, and Ilthond had been removed. So had Fazul's own, for he now sat in Manshun's high-curved seat. Marsh wondered what had happened to the others, but decided it would be safer not to inquire. He little liked the black altar with its priests and traps and guardian creatures, and liked this chamber less, with its air of a prepared trap. The last seat indeed. I'll waste no time on pleasantries. Fazul began. Mansoon is yet absent. Our strongest magic can't find him, nor has he been seen. He can, of course, block or lead astray most spells, but we've no reason to believe he does now. I fear, fellow lords, that Mansoon is dead. He received no answer but silence. This conclusion was no surprise. This may not be so, Fazul continued, but we've waited for his reappearance too long. We must act on one matter, at least, without further delay. If Manshun likes not our actions upon his return, I shall bear responsibility. The pressing matter is Spellfire, legendary, very rare, and one who can wield it has emerged. I wish to know your minds about Spellfire. For a moment, no one spoke. Then the wizard, Sememen, leaned forward. The last wielder of Spellfire before this Chandral was the incantantrix Damasse, who spent her youth in Thunderstone. Is it mere coincidence that two bearers of Spellfire have arisen in the southern Dragon Reach near the Thunder Peaks? Or are they related by blood? Fazul leaned forward. A most intriguing question. Has anyone knowledge on this matter? Sarthor shrugged. They could be mother and daughter. The years allow of it. But, with respect, what does it matter? Damase is long dead, as is her husband. This offers us no hilt with which to wield Chandral. Aye, Castledar agreed. Her lover, Narm, is the means to move Chandral to our bidding. What I want to know is the strength of his art. How easy a hilt to grasp is he? Sememen shrugged. He's been in Shadowdale long enough for Elminster to teach him much. If that's befallen, I can't say. Yet I doubt his art can be overly terrifying. Merimar, the mage most magnificent, was his tutor until recently. The mages chuckled dryly. The priest, Zahay, frowned. 
is mastery of art needed to wield spellfire? There were shrugs. I doubt it, Fazul said. This maid had no known skill at art before using spellfire against the Drekalich Roglathgor. Interestingly, the keep she destroyed was the Tower Tranquil, once home of the Archmage Garthond, husband of the Incantantrix Damase. Does that mean, the mage Yarkel asked, excited, Spellfire may be contained in an item or process left in the tower by Damase, which in turn argues that other wielders of Spellfire could be created? There have been several wielders of Spellfire active at the same time before. It's not an ability the gods give to only one being at a time. An item or ritual is possible. Against that, one must place the strong likelihood that Damase never visited the Tower Tranquil. Fazul replied. Castledar said carefully, That still leaves open the question of what actions, if any, we should now take. We must control the maid or destroy her. Her spellfire threatens us all. A shemi burst out. The curly bearded mage's earring chimed as he snapped his head around to glare at Fazul. We can't afford to sit idle. What if Mallmaster or Malthir of Hillsfar gains spellfire? Even if Shadowdale uses it only to aid their friends in Daggerdale, it will set our plans back. If someone sets out to destroy us with it, we could fare far worse. I well said, Castledar agreed. We must move, but how? Our armies? I prefer not to whelm our hosts in Manshoon's absence, Fazul said. Shadowdale need merely spread the rumor that we've mastered Spellfire, and Cormir, Sembia, Hillsfar, and all will strike together against us. No, we must move more quietly, my lords. Yet, as Castledar says, we must move. What say you? Our assassins? Yarkel suggested. Zase sighed. The replacements are poorly trained yet, the priest murmured. Even strengthened by our lesser brothers of Bane and the Magelings, I fear they'd anger Shadowdale more than harm it. Aye, Sarthor agreed disgustedly in his deep voice. I recall the disasters of our going that way before. Yes, Samemon put in. We've all seen what happens when we send the magelings. Everyone wants to be the hero, to make his name among us. Reckless and foolish, they overreach themselves and fall. Elminster is no foe to be mastered by a mageling. Are you suggesting we go in force ourselves? Ashemi asked. Leaving aside our personal peril, does that not leave Zentel Keep undefended? Surely the High Imperceptor has heard of Manchun's absence. Will he not strike against you, Fazul, and all of us? His words fell into a deepening silence. No doubt, Fazul agreed coldly. He will try. But the Black Altar and Zentel Keep about it are not undefended. He waved a hand. From behind a curtain far down the chamber floated Mansam. The beholder was old and vast and terrible. Lichen grew on its nether plates, and its eye stalks were scarred and wrinkled with age. Its central eye turned to survey them all as it drifted closer. 
In the depths of that dark-pupiled, bloodshot orb, each man saw his own death, and worse. A deep, burbling hiss came from its toothy maw. Its ten smaller eye stalks moved restlessly as Mansum, the merciless, came to the table. The eye tyrant hovered above its center, rolling over in slow, awful majesty, until its ten small eyes hung just above them. At least one looked at each man there. I feel we can all be persuaded, Fazul said without a trace of a smile, to reach consensus now. The beholder did not blink. Nervously, Sememen cleared his throat. What do you propose? Fazul said steadily, The most powerful mages here should go forthwith to Shadowdale and do whatever's necessary to capture or destroy Shandral, Elminster or no Elminster. As we're not sending weak or incompetent magelings, as you've so correctly advised against, I've every confidence you shall return with Spellfire, if you return at all. Sememen, Ashemi, and Yarkul went white and silent. Only Sarthor looked unsurprised. He merely nodded. Sememen glanced up to find that Mansum had silently rolled over again so that its central eye, the one that foiled magic, gazed at them all. The reason for seating the mages together around one end of the table was now all too apparent. Mansum and Fazul were too far away for both to be caught in a time-stop spell, and no other magic would allow Sememen to ready a wand. Certainly he couldn't smite both, nor was there a great chance of besting Fazul here, in his temple. Against Mansum, the mage stood almost no chance. Sememen doubted he could even escape if he tried to flee. Perhaps if he, Ashemi, Yarkul, and Sarthor worked together with spells planned beforehand, they might have a chance. If Castledar and Zahe and any number of priests hiding behind the tapestries were ready to aid Fazul, that slim chance was none. It certainly seems the right thing to do, Brother Fazul, Sememen said slowly. However, I feel uneasy in undertaking such a mission without even a single priest of Bane to pray for our success and aid us with the God's will. What say you, Lord Marsh, as one who neither serves Bane nor works art? Weaken them by one priest, Sememon thought, and cut that one down as a warning to Fazul. And if we win Spellfire, we'll come back and try it on one of the beholders. Had Fazul done something to Manshun? Or perhaps Manshun was behind this, to rid himself of all his most powerful rivals. If not, and he did return, would Fazul tell him all the mages had denounced him and gone off to act as they pleased? Lord Marsh rubbed his jaw and frowned at the tabletop, avoiding both the calm scrutiny of the beholder and the icy stares of Fazul, Castledar, and Zase. It was a long time before he looked up. I must concur with you, Brother Sememen. We've always won our greatest gains by careful use of all three of our strengths, the favor of Great Bane, the versatile art of mages, and the might of Zentalar swords. It might go ill were we to neglect more than one of those strengths. He spread his hands as if apologizing for pointing out the obvious. 
Without magical aid, our warriors can't reach Shadowdale in time to capture the Spellfire Maid. Certainly not in numbers enough without alarming our foes. We must, therefore, forego force of arms. It would be foolish to abandon all the strength of Bane in this matter. Moreover, the warriors under me, and probably many under-priests and magelings, would think the same, and seriously question our collective wisdom. Marsh sat back, looked directly at Fazul, and toyed with a bubble at his throat, which most at the table knew to be an enchanted, explosive globe. Sememen almost smiled, the hard-faced warrior lord, it seemed, bore no love for the master of the black altar. The eye tyrant hung over them, silent and terrible. Ignoring it, Sarthor rubbed his hands. Well, I'm for such a strike, and the sooner the better. Spellfire must be ours. Sememen nodded in calm agreement, even as he raged inwardly. Was the fool actually that simple and enthusiastic? Or was he working with Fazul? Nay, listen to the way his words were spoken, the little soft twists at the end of each, flashing like daggers turning over. Sarthor was telling Fazul, openly and cuttingly, that he knew Fazul's game and thought little of it. I'm so glad we were able to come to an understanding so quickly, Fazul said, his voice like an assassin's dagger being wiped clean on velvet. The deep voice of the beholder rolled out from overhead. Consider well the nature of your understanding. As Sememen looked up to meet Mangsum's many gazes, he took sudden satisfaction in the fact that Fazul had to be more upset at the Eye Tyrant's comment than any of the rest of them. Its disapproval was aimed directly at him. Sememen nodded again and saw all of the other mages nodding too. He left that chamber feeling almost satisfied despite the danger ahead. The moon scudded through tattered gray clouds. Amid the spires of the city, the air was cold and still. Fazul stood on a high balcony of the black altar and smiled up at Selyun. Strong magic protected him from attack by art, and none but servants of Bane could enter the courtyard below. The mages would have no choice. No doubt they'd slaughter Castledar, but he was too ambitious anyway, and his death was a small price to pay for the destruction of Manchun's spell hurlers. The Zentrum would serve Fazul at last. Even if Manchun did return, he'd find himself isolated, with only upstart magelings, all too eager to betray him for their own advancement, to stand with him against the loyal of Bane, who served Fazul. The beholders cared not which humans they dealt with, so long as their wants were met. Zentil Keep would be his. Until someone took it from him. Fazul never noticed the wizard eye floating above and behind him, keeping carefully out of sight among the spires. No eye could have seen its invisible owner regarding him from the dark window of a tower nearby. A commotion rose in the courtyard below as warrior priests of the High Imperceptor crept over the wall and were met by alert and waiting under-priests. Fazul leaned forward and cast a spell that unleashed a whirlstorm of deadly black blades down into the growing fray below, caring nothing for the fate of his own acolytes. Let them see Bane the sooner. 
Sememen heard the screams and clash and clatter of many razor-sharp blades below. One of the attackers, boiling over the temple wall, cast magical light on the scene. Bloody slaughter filled the yard. Sememen leaned out swiftly before Fazul could leave the balcony and struck with the most brutish of his magical rings— snarling as he forced more art out of it than ever before. He did not aim directly at the master of the black altar. Fazul would be well protected, but struck instead at the balcony. It shivered, cracked as if struck by a battering ram, crumbled, and fell into the shrieking and death below, seeming to descend with awful slowness. Sememen intently watched Fazul's plunge. The priest had no time to employ snatch-to-safety magic, unless he managed to do so after the first blade had sliced crimson across his red mane of hair. A falling chunk of stone blocked Sememen's view moments before the shattered balcony reached the crowded courtyard. Sememen turned in satisfaction, resolving that the attack on Shadowdale would begin and end with the destruction of Castledar, at least until the Spellfire Maid was out from under the eye of Elminster. He never noticed another wizard eye floating just above the dark window. That eye was gone, however, some six breaths later, when a great, Round shadow drifted out of the black altar's depths, its many eye stalks coiling and writhing like a nest of serpents. Then the slaughter really began. Two priests rushed at each other along a narrow alley. Green flames flickered around the wrists of one, brightening with fearful speed. The other cursed softly and shot out a hand that became a black tentacle. The stabbing tendril was countered inches from the other priest's throat by a tendril of his own. Is that you, brother? The priest with green fire hissed. Yes, Sintray, the other murmured, withdrawing his tentacles. A hunting spellfire, as you are. We need it, Architrave. Our spells couldn't slay those two bloodkin we met. We need something more. Yes, a sword to slice Dalgrave. I've no desire to end my days in torment on my knees before the Shadow Master High. Sintre gasped. Brother, take care. He rules the shadows not because he's loved. His doom stars can slay any of us. Architrave laughed, and a tentacle held forth something dead and dull under her nose. It seemed a gem with no sparkle. Dull and dark, it drank the light. Recognize this. No, Sintray told him honestly. Architrave whisked it back into hiding and laughed again. A cold cruel sound that reminded Sintre of the great Dalgrave. Malug the founder made the Doomstars, and he came from Faerun. I found one of his lairs. No, Sintre gasped, excitement leaping cold inside her. Yes, her brother exulted, and this gem was once a Doomstar, no doubt left behind by the founder because it's drained. What if Spellfire could set it aflame once more? A Doomstar Dalgrave doesn't know about, used against him. And there'll be a new Lord of the Shadows. He was still laughing as he turned and raced away down the alley, leaving Sintre to stare after him and shiver in foreboding. The night was cold. Overhead, Selyun sliced the clouds. Chandral shut the windows against the chill and sat on the bed, facing Narm, her eyes dark and beautiful. Well, my lord? 
Norm shrugged and spread his hands. What do you want, my lady? To be happy. With you. Free of fear. Free to walk as we will. Neither cold nor hungry. To have friends. I care little about all the rest. Simple enough. Norm agreed wryly, and they both laughed. Right, then, we go west, as they all say. But advice be damned, let us go by way of the rising moon and thunder gap, so you may see Gorstag once more. What say? Yes, but what of the Harpers? Well... Outside, in the night, Torm strained to hear but slipped. He breathed a curse upon fickle Timora as his splayed, iron-strong fingers slid slowly down the wet slates. He soon ran out of roof and fell over the edge. Desperately, with his last instant of grip, he swung himself inward, and then he was falling, mind racing coolly. Now! His fingers closed on a window ledge. With a jerk that nearly wrenched his arms from their sockets, he brought himself to a halt, to hang grimly. It was then that he noticed his left hand had come down hard on a nesting dove and crushed its frail body. Ah, he said, suppressing an urge to snatch his hand away. I'd put it even more strongly than that, said the crumpled bird, opening one eye to glare at him. At that, Torm did fall. The bird sighed, became Elminster, and murmured a word. Strands of sticky web raced from his fingertips, stabbing like lances at the grounds below and enveloping Torm on the way. The thief came to a slow, rubbery halt, mere feet from the ground, and hung helplessly. He began to struggle. Serves ye right, Elminster muttered darkly, and became a bird again. Above the two eavesdroppers, Shandrel and Narm had decided to join the Harpers. After all, as Narm put it, if we don't like it, we can back out. Shall we tell them now? No, sleep on it, Elminster said. Outside, Elminster smiled quietly, though one couldn't see it for the beak. And so to bed again, you and I, Norm said. And this time, I'll neither hear nor proffer any life story. Shandrel's answering laugh was low and delighted. Outside, on the window ledge, the bird that was Elminster rolled its eyes and looked at the stars glimmering above Selune. The silent sword had ascended above the trees. The night was half done. The dove's beak dwindled and became a human mouth, which softly sang a snatch of a ballad that had been old when Mithranor fell. And in the wind and the water, the storm king's fire-eyed daughter came a-rolling home across the sea, leaving none on the wreck alive but me. Chapter 17 Harps and Bright Hope Tis the greatest happiness of all to find a worthy, steadfast partner to share life with. The gods grant a rare few, a consort, loyal, skilled, and loving, who becomes our closest friend. But thus the gods entertain themselves by granting rather less, someone suitable during the good times, but whom we could cheerfully murder on some mornings. Jereneth Golyun of Neverwinter, Tavern Dancing My Way to Wizardly Might, Year of the Bridal.
The morning sun rose hot over Shadowdale, glinting on helms and spear points atop the old skull. Mist rolled down the Ashaba in a swift, silent storm. Narm and Shandrel rose early and set out for a brisk morning walk, accompanied by six watchful guards. The constant flash and gleam of bright armor reminded the two lovers of danger lurking near, and of the spellfire that lured it. Despite a good dawn fry of fried bread and goose eggs at the tower, they still felt hungry, and stopped at the Old Skull Inn for bowls of hot stew. Jale Silvermane bid them fair morning as she served them, waved away their coins, and asked when the wedding would be. Shandrel blushed, but Norm said proudly, As soon as can be arranged, or sooner. The guards chuckled and developed sudden thirsts for ale, which made Shandrel shudder at the early hour. All soon set forth up the road toward Storm Silverhand's farm. The dale was quiet, despite the morning vigor of workers in the fields. All Faerun seemed at peace, under a cloudless sky. Striding happily, his arm linked through Shandrel's, Norm realized they had only a vague idea where Storm Silverhand's farm was. He turned to the nearest guard, a scarred, mustachioed veteran who bore a spear lightly in his hairy hand. Good sir, Narm asked, could you guide us to the dwelling of Storm Silverhand? It lies before you, Lord, from this cedar stump here up to the line of Bluewood yonder. Narm nodded and said his thanks. Shandrel had already hurried ahead. The others trotted to catch up to her. The farm lay hidden behind a high, crown-hedged bank. Over the hedge appeared the upper leaves of growing things. All was lush and green. Bees danced among the blossoms of a creeper that coiled along the hedge. The guards walked watchfully, weapons ready, but Shandrel couldn't believe any swift danger could lurk in such a place, on such a morning. They turned off the road where a broad track cut through the hedge, following it along twisted oaks to a large, rambling fieldstone house. Its thatched roof was thick with velvety moss and alive with birds. Vines on tripods and pole frames stretched away in rows, like hallways amid the green, rustling walls of a great castle. Far down one, they saw Storm Silverhand at work, her long silver hair tied back with a ragged scrap of cloth. The bard wore torn leather breeches and a halter, both shiny with age. Swinging a hoe with strength and care, Storm was covered with a glistening sheen of sweat. Stray leaves stuck to her here and there. She waved. Laying down the hoe, she hastened toward them, wiping her hands on her thighs. Well met. I'm going to hate leaving here, Shandrel said in a small, husky voice. Norm squeezed her hand. I am too, but we can come back when we are stronger. We will come back. Surprised at the iron in his tone, Shandrel smiled in agreement. Storm reached them, the pleasant smell of the bard's sweat, like warm bread sprinkled with spices, hung around her. Norm and Shandrel both stared. Storm smiled. Am I purple, perhaps? Grotesque? Norm said hastily, Pray pardon, lady. We did not mean to stare. None needed, Norm, and no lady, please. We're friends. Come in and share sweet water. Then let us talk. Few enough come to see me. Leading them toward the house, she asked, So 
What's so strange about me? Shandrel giggled. Such brawn. She pointed at the bard's flat, tanned midriff. Corded muscles rippled on Storm's flanks and arms as she walked. The bard shook her head. It's just me. She led them through a stout wooden door that swung open by itself into cool dimness. Sit here by the east window and tell me what brings you here on such a fine morn. Most seek storm in fouler weather. Ugh, Narm winced. Jests as bad as Elminster. Storm grinned and handed him a long, curving drinking horn of blown glass, shaped like a bird. He held it in awe. It's really glass. Aye. The bard replied, filling another, "From Thaymarsh in the south, where such things are common, it breaks easily." Shandrel held hers apprehensively too. A guard backed away when offered one. "Uh, no, lady, just a cup, if you have one. I'd feel dark the rest of my days if I broke such as that." Shandrel murmured agreement. The bard smiled. Hands on hips, and spoke softly to the guardsmen. We must be alone, these two and I, to talk. Bide here, if you will. The beer is in that cask. Tis not good to drink more sweet water so soon. Bread, garlic butter, and sausage is in the cold pantry. Eat hearty, but come with speed if you hear my horn. She took down a silver horn from a beam near her head and turned to Norm and Shandrel. Drink up. There's much to talk about. She went to the back of her kitchen and swung open a little arched door, letting in the sunlight. Follow this path into the trees, and you'll find me, she said, and vanished down it. The visitors looked around the low-ceilinged kitchen. Herbs hung from its dark wooden beams, and all was cozy and friendly. But not the wild showplace of art and lore one might expect of a bard's home. A small harp stood half hidden in the shadows near the pantry door. Narm almost dropped his glass when suddenly, and all alone, it began to play. They all stared as the strings plucked themselves. One guard rose, clapping hand to blade. But a veteran turned on him. Peace, Barast. Tis art, ay, but no art to harm us. The harp played an unfamiliar tune that rose and fell gently ere it climbed and died away on a high, chiming cluster of notes. Sounds elven, Norm said quietly. Let's ask, Shandrel said. Standing her empty glass carefully on the table, I'm done. Norm drained his with a last tilting swallow and set it beside hers. They nodded to the guards and went out the little door. The path twisted down a little ravine beneath overhanging trees. They followed it through dappled sunlight and deepening shade. To emerge by a small pool where a stream widened. Storm stood beside it in a robe, her hair a wet silver cascade. She sat on a rock at the pool's edge and beckoned them to adjacent rocks. Near her head, the silver horn hung from a branch. Come and bathe, or sit and dabble your toes. Tis soothing. Storm's eyes were dark and serious. And tell me what hangs on your hearts. The harp that played by itself, Norm asked, was that an elven tune? Aye, an air of the elven court that Merith taught me. Is that all that troubles you? She teased, shaking water from her hair. Lady, Shandrel said hesitantly. We think we'd like to join the harpers. We've heard only good of those who harp, yet we've heard only little. Before we set foot on a new road, we may follow most of our lives.
and that may lead us to life's end sooner than not, we would know more from you of what it is to be a harper, if your offer still stands. Lady, does... Storm held up her hand. Hold! No more queries until we've seen these clear between us. I'll try to be brief. She drew her bare feet up beneath her, glanced at the woods, and nodded, as if reaching a decision. A harper is one of a vast, scattered company who share similar interests, a fellowship of men, elves, and half-elves, more women than men. Most bards and many rangers in the north are harpers. We've no ranks, only varying degrees of personal influence. Our badge is a silver moon and a silver harp, upon a black or royal blue field. Many lady mages and most druids are our allies, and we are generally accounted good. A harper tolerates many faiths and deeds, but works against warfare, slavery, and wanton destruction of the plants and creatures of the land. We oppose those who'd build empires by the sword or spilled blood, or work art heedless of consequences. Silver hair stirred around Storm's shoulders as she spoke, flowing and coiling with a life of its own. We see the arts and lore of Mithranor as a high point in the history of all races. We work to preserve history, crafts, and knowledge, and seek to regain what made Mithranor great, the happy sharing of life's good things among all races. We work against and often fight the Zentarim, the cult of the dragon, the slavers of Thay, those who plunder or destroy tombs and libraries, and all who'd overturn peace and unleash war to raise their own thrones. She raised one empty hand, cupped as if she held something precious. We guard folk against such perils. We also guard books and lore, precious instruments and music, and art and its good works— all these things serve hands and hearts yet unborn, who will come after us. Storm's hair was quite dry now. It still curled and wavered about her shoulders. We seek to keep kingdoms small and busy with trade and the problems of their people. Any ruler who grows too strong and seeks to wrest knowledge and power from others is a threat. More precious knowledge is risked when his empire falls... As fall it must. She smiled a little sadly. Only in tavern tales are humans wholly evil or shiningly good. We do what we can for everyone and stand in the way of all who threaten knowledge. Who are we to decide who shall know or not know lore? The gods have given us the freedom and the power to strive among ourselves. They've not laid down a strict order that compels us to do thus and so. Who knows better than the gods what knowledge is good or bad, and who shall have it? Norm regarded her thoughtfully. Does that mean, good lady, intending no disrespect, that there should be no secrets and wild-willed six-year-olds should be tutored in destroying spells because knowledge should be denied to none? Chandral looked at him fearfully. Would Norm's tongue lose any chance of aid or welcome from the Harpers? Storm laughed merrily. You've chosen well, Chandral, unafraid and yet polite, inquiring, not hostile, and opinionated. Well said, Archmage to be. She got up drew on her soft, battered old boots, and rose to pace thoughtfully. My answer is no. All in the realms hold and guard knowledge as they see fit. That, too, we've no right to change. Much should be secret, revealed only to those who've the right or ability to handle it. Harpers seek not to reveal the truth to all, but to preserve writings— art, and music for later years and beings. 
We work against things that threaten the survival of such culture or erode its quality by tainting it with unchallenged falsehood. A soft radiance grew about Storm as her voice rose. Harper bards always sing true tales of kings, so far as truth is known. They do not sing falsely of the grand deeds of a usurper, or falsely portray as bad the nature and deeds of his predecessor. Even if such would make good tales and songs, a harper cleaves to the truth. The truth. Though slightly different for every one, must be the rock the castle of knowledge is built on. Her smile flashed brightly. Strong words, eh? I feel strongly. If you come to do so too, you'll truly be Harper's. If one falls out of such belief, he or she should leave our ranks before doing all of us and our cause ill. I hope only that whether you walk with us or no, or join and then leave, you walk together and take joy in each other's company. Tis through such love and longing that much learning and celebration comes, adding to the lore we nurture and save. More than that, whether you be Harper's or not, I would be your friend. Shandrel and Norm looked at each other, and then at the bard. We would be harpers, Shandrel added awkwardly. If you'll have us, Storm gathered them both into her arms. If you will have us, we'll be proud and pleased to have you. You, Shandrel and Norm, not your spellfire or your art. Walk far and see much, and grow in your own counsel and powers. If you work against evil, you'll be harpers whether you bear our badge or no. Fight not always with blade or spell; the slower ways are the surer. Aid freely given and friendships and trust built. These evils cannot abide; it shrinks from what it cannot destroy. In the warm strength of the bard's embrace, evil seemed a long way off. Norm leaned into the comfort of Storm's arms and asked, "Where then should we go?" Storm's reply was soft and low, her words almost lost in the gentle chuckle of the water. "Go by way of Thunder Gap. Watch for Dragon Cult agents. They're thick in Sembia, and there's one in High Moon. His name is Corvin." Shandrel stiffened. Go to Silvery Moon, seek out a lustrial high lady of that city, and say you come from her sister Storm and would be Harpers. With a lustrial is a good place to be if you intend to have a child. The bard looked meaningfully at Shandrel, who blushed. Well, you're not quite the first couple to make that mistake. She looked at Norm. If your lady feels too sick to eat, feed her lots of stew. In the evenings, she'll feel more like dining. Norm looked at her, dazed. Pray, lady, let me get used to discovering I'm going to be a father first. Storm chuckled. Think well on the names your offspring must carry through life. I was born in a storm and won the name because of it. An ear-catching name, I'm told. But when I was small, I fought many larger lads and lasses because of it. Freeing herself from the shared embrace, she undid her robe. After a startled look, Norm politely turned his back. Unconcerned, the bard drew on her clothes. Shandrel saw that her arms, back, and flanks were covered with faint white sword scars. The bard winked. I've walked many roads. Some leave little maps behind. She traced one long scar with a finger and tied her halter. You can turn around now, Norm. I grow tired of talking to your shoulders. Norm obediently turned. Now a few things about the journey ahead of you. First, trail marks. You'll see a few runes scratched or burned on rocks, trees, or in the dirt. She picked up a stick and then shrugged. Nay, 
I'll draw them in the house. Tis Elminster's way to expect one to remember half a hundred things in a morning. I'll not do that. I will tell you the names of Harper agents along your way. Look to them for aid if you need it. These, too, I'll write on a bandage. I'll need you to prick your finger and bleed on it. It must look stained and disgusting if you don't want it to be looked at too closely, if someone searches or robs you. But I'll tell you the roster in case you get separated or lose the list. If you lose your list of runes, stay clear of all that you see. The bard of Shadowdale held up her fingers to count, as a small child does. Now first, in Cormir... After a long time, Storm Rose belted her horn at her waist and led them back up the path to her back door. What if someone, by art, I mean, heard all this? Narm asked, looking at the trees. Storm shook her head. I've art of my own to cloak this little hidden place. Manchun himself could not hear us unless he sat with us. She went in and set the guards to cutting cheese and apples for all, while she prepared the bandage. Soon she took Chandral's hand, and they vanished up a stair half-hidden in the shadows of the old stone kitchen. When they reappeared, there was no sign of the bandage, but Chandral's eyes told Narm it was hidden on her somewhere. The guards looked at Storm with interest, the bard now wore black fighting leathers and a sword. To the temple, Storm said briskly, for we've much to talk about with Rathen and Ressia. Weddings can all too easily become overblown things. The young lord and lady to be wed? God's good wishes to him. I tell you, Berth, I saw flames come from her very hand. Spellfire, they're calling it. But twas no spell like I ever saw cast. No dancing about or chanting. She just frowned a little, like Delmeth does when hefting a full barrel, and there twas. Aye, you wouldn't want to be merry in that, now would you? Malark, in the shape of an owl on a branch overhead, grinned sourly at the guard's coarse laughter and thought again how to slay Shandral. All this skulking infuriated him. At every moment, the girl and her mageling were together, and flanked by at least one mage or a knight armed with powerful wands or rings, with reinforcements close at hand. The desolation of Roglithgor's lair was not easily forgotten. A mistake in this matter could be his last. Malark turned tired eyes toward the twisted tower. She was guarded even now, especially now. The wedding ceremony would be one chance to get at Chandral, but not a good one. Shadowdale's most powerful protectors would be gathered. Perhaps later, these two had to leave the Dale sometime. Malark had the uncomfortable feeling others were watching and waiting for just that to happen, and when Lady Spellfire finally set her dainty feet out into the wider world, he might find himself in the heart of a furious battle. He might even have to fight Omrath. Malark inwardly growled and took flight, heading restlessly south. Soon, Chandral of High Moon, he thought. You'll feel my art soon. The day dawned cool and misty. Chandral and Narm had slept apart, as custom demanded, Chandral in the Temple of Timora with the priestess Eresia, and Narm in the Twisted Tower with the priest Rathen. Both were up before dawn, bathed in holy water, and blessed. By then, folk had begun to gather by the banks of the Ashaba. Word spread swiftly in Shadowdale. Rathen filled a glass from a crystal decanter and held it high. To the lady, he said, and emptied it into the bath. He looked at Norm. 
That's all the wine I'll touch this day. Norm rose, dripping. You'll miss all the festive tippling? Rathen shrugged. How else can I mark this a special occasion? Aracia and I will go off together somewhere when tis done and share a glass of holy water. He stared in reverie for a moment and then blinked and said gruffly, Come on, then, out and dry thyself. If ye are so heedless as to get the chills, Shandrel will be wedding a walking corpse. Cheery, aren't you? Norm observed. Rathen unwrapped linens from around fire-heated rocks, grunted, licked his fingers, and held them out to the young mage. If tis a clown ye want, I'll send for Torm, Rathen replied. But don't blame me if he gets ye so drunk and distracted ye forget to come to thy wedding, or locks ye in a chest so he can marry Shandrel himself. Torm? Aye, and if he's busy misbehaving elsewhere, I may take his place myself. Eresia kissed Shandrel's forehead formally, and then hugged her fondly. We must make haste now. Your lord-to-be awaits you. Shadowdale awaits you, too. So, in the words of Elminster, let us scoot. Shandrel rolled her eyes. Eresia laughed, and together they hurried down the stairs. From the fire-scorched stones where Saluni's hut had been, a lone horn blew, the sound echoing down the dale. It was answered immediately from the battlements of the Tower of Ashaba. The bride-to-be and the preceptress, Eresia, set forth on the long walk south. Behind them, as guard of honor, paced Storm Silverhand, blade drawn, bareheaded, but in full and shining battle armor. Any hostile eyes could not help noticing the bright glows of art that hung about her. Storm's eyes flicked this way and that. She was armed with power and expecting trouble. The Dale folk muttered at the display. Well ahead of the three women strode Morngrim, lord of Shadowdale, also bareheaded but fully armored. The arms of the dale shone bright on his breast, and a great sword hung at his side. The guards standing to attention along the way bowed to him, but did not sound their horns until Shandrel reached them. One by one their calls rang out as the bride drew nearer. Two men waited where Saluni's hut had stood. When he reached them, Morngrim saluted Norm and stepped aside. When Saluni lived and was Lady of the Dale, no temples had stood in Shadowdale. All desiring to be wed had come here to plight troth before her. Now the bare stones would see one more marriage. Rathen stood square upon those stones, watching Shandrel. On his breast, the disk of Timora began to glow. He unclipped it from its chain and cupped it in his hands. Nearer they came, Shandrel and Eresia, and the last trumpeter blew two high notes. A fanfare of all the horns joined him, loud and long and glorious. When its last thrilling echoes died away, Shandrel stood before Rathen. The priest smiled and cast the disc of Timora into the air. It hung a man's height above their heads, spinning gently, and its glow grew brighter. We're gathered beneath the bright face of Timora to join Norm Tamaraith, this man, and Shandrel Chasser, this woman, as companions in life. 
Let their ways run together, say I, a friend. What saith Timora? Eresia stepped forward and spoke. I speak for Timora, and I say, let their ways run together. Rathen bowed his head. We stand in Shadowdale. What saith a good woman of the dale? Storm Silverhand took a step forward. I say, let their ways run together. We stand in Shadowdale and hear you. What saith a good man of the dale? The mountainous smith, Braun Selgard, stood forth from the gathered dale folk, his great, grim face solemn, his mighty limbs clad in old, carefully patched finery. His deep voice rolled over them all. I say, let their ways run together. We stand in Shadowdale and hear you, Rathen responded. What saith the Lord of the Dale? Morngrim stood forth. I say, let their ways run together. We stand in Shadowdale and hear you. Rathen's voice suddenly rose, loud and deep, in a cry of challenge. What says the people of the dale? Shall the ways of these two, Narm and Shandril, run together? Aye, came the cry from a hundred throats. Aye, we hear ye. We have heard all, save Narm and Shandril. What say ye two? Will ye bleed for each other? Aye, said Shandril, speaking first, as was the custom. Aye, Narm said, as quietly. Then let ye be so joined, Rathen said solemnly, and took their left hands in each of his. Morngrim stepped forward with his dagger drawn. In the throng nearby, Ysail and Elminster tensed. Their protective spells on Morngrim might be tested by someone seeking magically to compel him to strike the young couple. Rathen's watching face, too, was tense. Gravely, the Lord of Shadowdale reached out his dagger and pricked the upturned backs of the two hands, Shandril's first. He wiped the blade on the turf before them, kissed it, put it away, and stepped back in silence. Ysail breathed out, long and silently. Elminster did not. Rathen murmured to the couple, Now, as we told thee, and stepped back. Norm and Shandril brought their bloodied hands to each other's mouths, and then stepped into each other's arms and kissed, embracing fiercely. A cheer arose from those watching. Of one blood joined are Narm and Shandril, Rathen pronounced grandly. Let no being tear asunder this holy union, or face the dark face of Timora forevermore. Above their heads, the spinning disk flashed with intense light. There were cries of surprise and wonder. See the sign of the goddess? Rathen shouted, delighted. Her blessing is upon this union. The disk rose, shining brightly. Norm and Shandril stepped back, hands clasped, to watch. From it sprang two shafts of white radiance, with a noise like high, jangling harping. The beams reached down, one to touch Norm, and the other, Shandril. Norm stood motionless, smiling, eyes wide in astonishment. Power rushed through him, cleansing and strengthening him. 
At the touch of the light, Shandral burst into flames, and she embraced Narm in wild joy. Her spellfire rose above them both in a great teardrop of fire. Their clothes blazed away, but their hair and bodies were unharmed. Elminster clucked disapprovingly and wove a spell. For a moment, it seemed another lady, a smiling woman with silver hair and a robe of the same hue, stood with Rathen and the bridal couple on the fire-scarred flagstones. The wraith-like figure raised a hand in benediction and then faded silently away. Siluni, Yasail whispered, tears rising. As the flames died, robes spun by Elminster's illusion spell-clothed Narm and Shandral. Rathen bellowed, "'Tis done! Go forth in joy! A feast awaits at the Tower of Ashaba! Dance all!' Harpers in dark leathers stepped from trees, startling the guards. They held harps in their hands and played The Ride of the Lion. As the ballad rose, the bright light of Timora leaped to each instrument. The harps shone and glittered. Amid the happy tumult that followed, Elminster and Yasail came forward to join Storm, Morngrim, and the clerics standing guard about the happy couple. So tis done, Yasail said softly, and kissed both Narm and Shandral. Tis time to give you what was given Merith and me on our wedding day. Foes gather in the woods, and there will be battle. Mind you, fly high, and take no part. Elminster gravely cast a spell of flight upon Shandral, and Yasail did the same to Narm. When they were done, Elminster said gruffly, Remain aloft no more than ye must. This magic lasts not forever. Go now. He guided them into another embrace and patted Shandral's bare back. Rise before the fighting reaches us. Think up, Storm and Yasail murmured in unplanned unison, and so you'll go. Thanking everyone a little dazedly, Norm and Shandral ascended slowly in a tight embrace. Awe kept them silent as they rose through a clearing sky. The bright disk of Timora rose with them and followed. I do hope Timora sends back her holy symbol, Rathen muttered, watching its radiance moving east over the forest. And I hope, Storm said as gently, our two innocents have the sense to steer clear of Mithranor. I'll see to that, sister came a soft voice from above. A black falcon swooped out of the mists and climbed away, heading east. Elminster growled, The symbol! Now I suppose I'll have to keep eyes alight for whatever she might do to see Spellfire. In a flashing instant, an eagle sprang from where he'd stood, soaring arrow-swift into the sky. Those who still stood where Saluni's hut had been looked at each other, and then at the Dale folk hastening back toward the tower. The skirl and clang of battle broke out in the forest. Swords flashed and sang amid the trees. Harpers and guards of the Dale clashed with warriors in a motley of leather and rusting mismatched armor. Mercenaries, a lot of them, breathless as if they'd hurried a long way. Yasail sighed. Well, back to the battle. Aye, Storm agreed with a mirthless smile, as always. The four standing on the stones drew blades, a wand, and two maces, and charged into the fray, as always. Chapter 18 
talk turneth not danger aside. Open the door, little fools, we wait outside. The Green Dragon, Narglor, Sayings of a Worm, Year of the Spitting Cat. We should go down, Shandrel whispered into the wind. Narm's arms tightened about her, and they flew for a time in silence, the green expanse of the elven woods unfolding below. I, I'll not soon forget this. Nor I, as I should hope not. Norm chuckled at her mild indignation. Bending his will, he turned them northwest over the seemingly endless trees, back toward Shadowdale. I can't help feeling we're being watched. I'm sure we are, and have been since first we rode with the knights, his lady replied. How else could they protect us? Well, yes, but I mean, now. I'm sure they've seen such things before, she said serenely. Elminster's hundreds of winters old, remember? Yes, Narm sighed, peering all around again. Would that none of this were necessary, and we could walk unafraid. Shandrel fixed him with very serious eyes. I feel so, too, but without spellfire, we'd both be bones by now. They passed over the bare top of Harper's Hill and swiftly left it behind. Besides, this fire in me is a gift of the gods. Rage as we might, tis their will I have it. Narm nodded. Ay, and it can be handy enough, but does using it harm you? Shandrel shrugged. I know not. I don't feel amiss or in pain most times, but I can't stop it or give it up, even if I wanted to. Tis part of me now. She turned in his grasp to look back, and something circular and silver drifted out of the empty sky into her hands. It was smooth, cold, and solid, and it tingled in her fingertips. Rathin's holy symbol, Narm gasped. How comes it here? By the will of Timora, to answer your doubts. Narm nodded almost sternly, and the fine hairs on his arms stood stiff with fear. Yet he held her as gently and firmly as before. Whither now? he asked, as they passed over the old skull inn. The Twisted Tower? No, Shandrel replied, pointing at chainmail flashing on the backs of men below. In all the alarm, the archers might shoot us down before they knew us. Or even, Narm muttered, because they knew us. Shandrel slapped him lightly. Think no such darkness. Have any truly of the Dale shown us aught but kindness and aid? We must be suspicious, yes, or perish, but ungrateful? Yet truly, I've little wish to greet the folk of the tower clad as we are. Narm chuckled. Ah, the real reason, he said, halting their flight over Elminster's tower. My apologies for such black thoughts. Still, tis better to look often over one shoulder than to die swift and surprised. Aye, but let not the looking make you sour. You would come down here? Have we any place else? Narm asked. I doubt the art protecting Storm's home would be kind to us if we came calling when she wasn't there. True, Shandrel agreed and took one last look around, glancing north over the old skull's stony bulk to the rolling wilder lands beyond. The wind slid gently past their bare shoulders. Learn this spell as soon as you can, she urged, clinging to her husband. Tis so beautiful. Aye, 
Norm replied huskily. "'Tis the least of the beauty I have known this day." Shandrel's arms tightened about him, and she and Norm sank gently to the earth in front of Elminster's tower. Overhead, a falcon waggled its wings to an eagle and veered away to the south. The eagle bobbed in slow salute and wheeled about, sighed audibly, and dived to earth. Must ye stand about naked, kissing and cuddling and inflaming an old man's passions? Elminster demanded, inches behind Norm. The wedded couple jumped, but barely had time to unclasp and turn before the wizard pushed them toward his front door. In, in and try your hands at peeling potatoes. Leo can't feed two extra guts on naught but air, you know. Shandrel's fending hands encountered a deep and silky beard. Elminster came to a dead halt and glared at her. Pull my beard, will ye? Ridicule a man old enough to be thy great, 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 and probably great again, grandsire? Are ye mad? Are ye passion-mazed? Or are ye just tired of life? Shandrel shrank back. The old mage seemed to loom larger and larger over her as he thrust his bristling beard forward and followed it step by menacing step. How'd ye like to enjoy the rest of thy life in the mud? as a toad, or a slug, or mute, creeping dung moss. I, I, I! He pushed them back, step by step, to the door. Norm had begun to chuckle uncertainly, but Shandrel was still white and open-mouthed as her bare shoulders brushed old, silver-weathered wood, and the door swung open. Without pausing for breath, Elminster added, in calm tones, Two guests, Leo. They'll be needing clothes. Indeed, came the dry reply. Tis cold in the corners. How are they at peeling potatoes? Elminster's chuckle ushered the dumbfounded couple in, and he closed the door with a brief, I'll follow anon. Some tasks remain. Norm and Shandrel found themselves in the flickering, dusty dimness with Leo, who was already moving to a certain closet. We've gone through more clothes since you've come to the Dale, he murmured. You were a head shorter than I, were you not, Shandrel? Yes, Shandrel agreed and began to laugh uncontrollably. After a moment, Norm joined her. Leo shook his head as he handed clothes backward. Truly, they serve most who know when to laugh and when to listen. Stew warm inside her and heart full, Chantrel happily leaned her stool against the wall and smiled at Norm. He was resplendent in the silken robes of some grand, long-dead mage of Mithranor. The hearth glowed as Leo moved softly back and forth before it, stirring, tasting, and adding pinches of spice. Pheasant hung from the rafters above, and a plump gorsecraw lay waiting to be plucked and dressed. Norm sipped herb-simmer tea and regarded Leo's deft movements over his stew-pots. Is there aught we can do to help? Leo looked up with a quick smile. Aye, but tis not cooking. Talk, if you would. I've heard little enough speech that's not Elminster's. Tell me how tis with you. Wonderful, Norm told him. I'm as happy now as I've ever been in my life. We're wed this day, and henceforth. Chantrel nodded, eyes shining. Leo smiled. Both of you, 
Remember how you feel now when times are darker. Turn not on each other, but stand together to face the world's teeth. But enough. I'll not lecture you. You hear enough of that from other lips hereabouts. They all laughed. Chandral asked, Leo, the battle at our wedding, who was trying to reach us? I was not there. Forgive me. I abide here to guard certain things. But Lord Florin has told me of the men who struck with swords from the woods. Yes? Norm asked quickly. The scribe looked up, and the two men held each other's eyes. There were over forty, we believe. Thirty-seven, perhaps more now, lie dead. One talked ere his life fled. They were mercenaries, hired for ten pieces of gold each and meals to snatch you both, Chandral alone, if they could take but one of you. Chandral swallowed. Take me where? The scribe spread his hands helplessly. They were hired in Selgunt only a few days back and flown here in a ship that sails the skies. Oh yes, such things exist, though they be rare triumphs of art. They were hired in a tavern by a large, balding fat man with a wispy beard who gave his name as Carsag. Their orders were to take you to a hill north of here to be picked up by the sky ship. Leo idly tasted a ladle of stew as if they'd been discussing the weather. They would then be paid in full. Each had received only two coins. Many died still carrying them. Who this Carsag is and why he wants you, we know not. Have you any favorite thoughts as to who he might be? Norm and Chandral shook their heads. Half the world is looking for us with swords and spells, Chandral said bitterly. Have they nothing better to do? Evidently not, Leo replied. Tis not all bad, this seeking. Look who did find you, Chandral, this mageling called Norm, and the knights who brought you here. I, she replied, her voice shaking, and tis here we must leave, friends and all, because of this accursed spellfire. She stared down at her hands, and angry spellfire leaped and spat in tiny crackling threads from one palm to another. Not within these walls, good lady, Leo murmured. Some things sleep herein that should not be awakened. Chandral sighed, shamefaced, and let the fires subside. Sorry, Leo, I've no wish to burn down your house. I know, said Leo gently, turning to his cutting board. Nor do I fear it's coming to pass. You must not hate your gift, lady, for the gods gave it to you in no such fury. And did not Timora bless your union? The scribe indicated the consecrated silver disc that Chandral had carefully set on a high table. It seemed to glow for a moment as they looked at it. I, Norm said, getting up, so we're helpless in the hands of the gods. He began to pace. Leo looked up, a knife flashing in his hand. No. For where, then, would be your luck, the very essence of holy Timora? What luck can there be if the gods control your every breath? And how dull for them, too. Would you take any interest in a world if all the creatures in it had no freedom to do anything you'd not determined beforehand? The gods don't fate men to act thus and so, despite the many tales, even those told by the great bards. So we walk freely and do as we will, and live or die by that? Chandral agreed. So where should we walk? You know maps, Leo. 
Where in Faerun should we go? Leo shrugged. Where your hearts lead is the easy answer, and the best. But you really ask me where you should run to, just now, with half Faerun at your heels. He paced alongside Narm for a few strides, and added, I'd go south, quick and quiet, then through the Thunder Gap into Cormier. There, keep two smaller places and try to join a caravan or pilgrims of Tempest seeking the great battlefields of the Sword Coast. Go where there are elves, for they know what tis to be hounded and may well defend you with fierce anger. Norm and Chandral traded glances. We've heard such directions before, yes, Norm said, almost word for word. If the best way's so obvious is all that, will those who hunt us be waiting? Aye, most probably, Leo agreed with the ghost of a smile. So you must take care not to get caught. Chandral surprised herself by laughing. Well enough, she said, saluting him with a flourish. We'll try to follow your advice, good Leo. Know you ways of avoiding Chandral hunters? Leo lifted his eyebrows. You both work with art and walk with those mighty in art, and you ask me? If you'd learn the ways of stealth and disguise without art, ask Torm. I've escaped my hunters thus far, true, but I was truly cloaked in the lady's luck. He turned to Norm. If you must pace like a great cat in a cage, could you slice potatoes while doing it? Elsewhere, things were not so peaceful. In Zental Keep, two men faced each other across a table. Lord Marsh, asked the mage, Sememon, carefully, does it seem to you that the priests of the Black Altar have fallen into confusion and disarray too great for us to leave the city? All reports agree that the beholder, Mansum, holds sway in the temple, where the sprawled corpses of many hundred clergy have begun to stink. I've heard those same reports, Lord Marsh Bellwintle agreed smoothly, and am forced to the same conclusions. This matter of one girl who can create fire will simply have to wait. If she shows up at our gates, I'm confident the power and skill of the gathered mages would defeat her so long as they've not all been destroyed or weakened in the fulfillment of missions commanded by one who had transparent reasons for wishing them out of the city. Exactly. I'd thought to discuss with you the advisability of setting just one of our mages of power, Sarthor, perhaps, to observing this maiden's doings, so her seizure by any foes could be noted or countered. Prudence seems to indicate some such vigilance. An excellent thought, Lord Marsh agreed, reaching for his glass of blood wine. An eye must serve where a claw might be cut off, if we're not to be taken unawares. Yet you will send some magelings forth to impress their fellows and my warriors with our alacrity and attention to this matter? Of course, Sememon replied, not quite allowing a smile to reach his lips. The ambition of our younger spell weavers remains legendary. I was planning to send four rivals forth. Excellent, Marsh rose. My own younger blades seem so busy just now, disposing of priests regrettably driven mad by this latest outrage of the eye tyrants. Untrustworthy allies, as I've said before, order must be maintained. 
duty presses. So for now, allure to you. Allure to you. Sememin walked away. An eye that neither of them saw under the table watched Sememin go, and then winked out. The wearers of the purple are met for the glory of the dead dragons. Nergoth, blade lord, intoned. The leader of the cult of the dragon was, as always, coldly calm. For their dominion, came the ritual reply in unison. Nergoth surveyed the large, plain underground chamber. Every one of the ruling council of the cult was present, save the mage Malark. To work then, all the sooner to feast in some fine fest hall in Ordolin, far above. Brothers. We're gathered to hear of a matter that's set all mages into eager uproar. Spell fire, brother Zilvreen. What say you, brothers? The master thief Zilvreen said with his soft, sinister grace. I've learned little of the fates of the Dracolich Roglithgor and the mage Moral. It seems likely, though, that Roglithgor, its treasure, the She Mage, and even the sacred night dragon Agistam have all been destroyed. There was a rumble of surprise and dismay, but Zilvreen's next words cut it off like a sword stroke. Destroyed by the accursed Archmage of Shadowdale, Elminster. His pet brigands, the Knights of Mithranor, and by this Shandral Shasair with her spellfire. All, rumbled Dargath of the Perler Merchant Fleet. I can scarce believe they all have been destroyed. Such slaughter would require an army large enough that we'd all see its whelming over many days. No such swords have been raised," added Komarth, the bearded general of the Sembian border forces. Men sent back by Malak described the site of Roglithgor's lair as a pit of fresh-strewn rubble. Zilvreen replied, "Draw your own conclusions." Dargath shook his head in disbelief. So just what is this spell fire that it can destroy mighty mages and great worms alike? Nergoth shrugged. A fire that can be hurled as a mage casts lightning, he said, to burn spells and enchanted things as readily as wood and flesh. More than that, we know not. Wherefore we sent Malak. What of him? Komarth asked. Has he spoken to any follower? Nergoth shook his head. Nothing from him. He's in Shadowdale, as far as we know, seeking his chance to get at the girl. Shasair, another of the council mused. Wasn't that the name of the mage our brothers of art slew at the bridge of fallen men years back, in the battle that brought them their deaths? It was, Nergoth replied, but no connections yet apparent. Look, you, we've at least three eyes in Sword Coast cities who share the last name of Sold, and none are related. Nergoth nodded. The price of getting this spellfire seems far too high. Others, the Zentarum and other priests of Bane, avidly seek it. Yet 'tis we who've already paid a price, and I'm loath to turn away empty-handed. We can't afford not to take spellfire for our own. No one can. I expect much bloodshed yet. He looked around the table. How we go about getting it, I leave to you, brothers. Let the mages win it for us," said Zilvreen smoothly. Waste no more swords, and especially no more sacred bone dragons on this. Well enough, Dargath agreed. 
But Spellfire or no, we cannot let this girl or the knights go unpunished for what they've done. We've lost much treasure, two dracoliches and the shadow sill over this. The girl must pay. Even if we win her as an ally, she must die after we have gained her secrets and her power. This must ride over all. Well said, brother, Nergoth responded. There was a murmur of agreement around the table. We're agreed, then. For now, we let our brother mage handle this affair. Aye, tis his field, came one reply. Aye, twill be folly to do otherwise, said another. Aye, and if he comes not back, we can always raise other mages to the purple. Aye, to that too. Aye, the others put in, in their turn. So it was agreed, and they rose and left that place. The hour was late. All through the twisted tower, candles burned low. In an inner room of Lord Morngrim's chambers, there was much discussion over the remains of dinner. In low tones, as Lady Cheryl slept in her chair at one end of the table, and Rathen Thentraver dozed over one arm of his seat. "'Have you a place in mind?' Ysail asked, as she leaned drowsily upon Merith's shoulder, their eyes gleaming together in the candlelight. Narm shrugged. "'We hunt our fortune, where'er, as the saying goes.' The Harpers said to seek High Lady Illustrial in Silvery Moon. Would you have some of us ride with you? Lancerl asked. There are greater evils in this world than those you fought. With all respect, Lord, Shandrel said softly. No. Too long have you watched over us and spilled much blood on our account. We must make our own way in the world and fight our own battles, or, in the end, we'll have done nothing. Nothing, she says. Torm sighed to a listle, rolling his eyes. Two dracoliches, a mountaintop, and a good piece of manchun of Zentil Keep, and nothing, she calls it. Scary. What if she tries something? Hush, you... Alistal said, stopping his mouth with a kiss. You're a worse windbag than the old mage himself. Why, thank ye, came a wry and familiar voice from the room's far darkness. Narm saw the battered old hat first, perched atop the staff that Elminster wore. As the wizard's bearded face came into the light to regard them all, the smallest of smiles played about his lips. He looked last at Narm and Shandrel. Ye might go to the rising moon for a night, at least. T'would be a kindness to Gorstag. He's been worried over ye. Shandrel met Elminster's gaze and silent tears rolled down her cheeks. Narm took her in his arms, but her tears still fell. Don't cry, beloved, you're among. Hush her not, Merith said gently. Tis no shame to weep. Only one who cares not cries not. I've seen what befalls those, Florin and Torm at this table, who cry inside, to hide it from others. It sears the soul. Ysail nodded. Merith's right. Tears don't upset us, only the reasons for them. Cry here, Lord, murmured Cheryl in her sleep, patting her own shoulder. Tis soft and listens to you. Morngrim looked faintly embarrassed. Torm grinned. You see... He said to Alistal, You could do that for me. You've the shoulders for it. She slapped him, fondly. Cheryl stirred and frowned. Oh, tis that game this night? Well, my lord, you'll have to catch me first, I assure you. 
Chuckles rose around the room. Morngrim leaned over and lifted his lady gently from the chair. Still lost in slumber, she clung to his neck and drew her legs up across his chest, settling herself with murmurs of contentment. Morngrim turned to them, Cheryl cradled in his arms. Good even all, Cheryl should be in bed, and so should we all. Now, where were we? Elminster asked moments later, settling himself into a chair that looked as old, shabby, and worn as he. Oh, aye, thy plans for the future. The slow, disbelieving shake of Narm's head was eloquent. Chandral fixed the wizard with tired eyes. I suppose you'll tell us to steer clear of battles, or we'll be dead in a day. Nay. Very clear blue eyes looked deep into hers. Ye two will be given no such choice. Ye must fight, or die. But think, one mistake is enough when disputing with those who wield art. Remember that. His gaze shifted to Narm. Ye too, lion of Mistra, if ye find thyself facing a mage, stand not to trade spells with him. Throw rocks and run right at him, unless he's too far away to reach. Then run away and find a place to hide, where ye can grab more rocks. Simple, eh? Before ye laugh, recall how thy lady first struck down Samagro Moro. Hundreds of winters, eh? was all Narm said. Chandral awakened in a cold sweat from being pursued through a ruined city by a black-winged devil. It had cornered her at last and reached for her, leering with Samagral Morrill's cruel, smiling face. She sat bolt upright, gasping. Florin sat nearby with Elminster, talking in low tones through the blue haze of the wizard's pipe. He leaned over, concern on his ruggedly handsome face, and laid a soothing hand on her arm. She smiled gratefully and held to his arm as she sank back down beside Narm, who slept on, peacefully. Florin gently wiped the sweat from her forehead and jaw. Chandral drifted off to sleep while still smiling her thanks. The next thing she knew, morning had come. Yasail was laughing with Merith over hot minted tea. Sunlight shone down warmly. The knights, variously clad, lounged on couches or walked quietly about. The clear tones of a horn floated up from somewhere below, where an unseen guard blew his delight at a fine morning. Chandral looked around at the old stone walls of the chamber and said both fiercely and mournfully, I'm going to miss this. Yes, Narm agreed, hugging her. You seemed ready to sleep forever. Chandral hugged him back. You're mine now. Uh, I, Narm managed within her arms. Not for much longer, if you break him like a clay cup, Torm said dryly. They're more useful, you know, when they're whole. Back and arms able to carry and all. Chandral burst out laughing. You're utterly ridiculous. Tis how I get through each day, Torm told her earnestly. It was much later when she realized he'd spoken the sober truth. Well, said Florin, here we part. He nodded at the weathered stone pillar just ahead. Yonder's the standing stone. The stone rose watchful and defiant out of the brush, overlooking the fields to Mistledale and south toward Battledale. Florin pointed. 
Down that road lies Assembra. Take rooms at the green door. It once had a talking door, but we took a fancy to it, so now it swings at the tower. He grinned. In all the excitement, we forgot to show it to you. The white horse under Shandrel snorted and tossed its head. Easy shield, Florin soothed. You've barely begun. His words made a sudden lump rise in Shandrel's throat. She turned in her saddle to look back. Past the pack mules on their reins, past the watchful guards who rode with crossbows ready, back to where the knights rode with an ever-grumbling Elminster. She'd miss them all. She felt Narm's hand clasp hers hard and fought down tears. None of that, Rathen ordered her gruffly. All this sobbing robs an occasion of its due grandeur. Aye, Lancerell agreed. Soon you'll be too busy staying out of trouble to cry, so acquire the habit now. Remember, Morngrim serves his best wine at green grass. We'll be looking for you some year. Norm nodded. Shandrel was too busy sniffing. Go now, Torm said gruffly over his shoulder, or we'll be all day a-weeping and a-saying farewells. Rathen urged his large bay forward and took the hands of Norm and Shandrel. Tymora ride with ye and watch over ye. Think of us when downcast or cold, for happy memories can warm and hearten. Torm stared at his friend. Such bardic, soft, and high glory. You've not been drinking, have you? Get on with ye, snake tongue, to the nearest mud and fall into it, Rathen told him kindly, and mind thy mouth drinks deep. Peace, both of you, Ysail chided. Narm and Shandrel should be well away before high sun if they're to make Assembra even two nights hence. She turned to the young couple. Stay on the road. The elven court's not the safest place in Faerun. Let not fear or pity stay your hand either, Florin said gravely. If you're menaced on the road, let fly with spellfire before hands are upon you. Too close a swinging sword can't be stopped by spell or spell fire. Oh, aye, one last thing, Elminster said. This illusion will make ye look older and a trifle different save to each other's eyes. Twill wear off in a day or so, or ye can end it any time, each of ye affecting only thyself. By uttering the word Gultho. Nay, repeat it not now, lumpheads, or ye'll ruin the magic. Let me see. He drew back his sleeves, sat back on his placid donkey, and worked magic upon Narm and Shandrel. The knights drew their horses around in a respectful circle. When it was done, they edged closer for careful, critical looks. Narm and Shandrel failed to see the slightest difference in each other's appearance, but it was clear they looked different to the eyes of others. Go now, Elminster said gently, or ye'll be seen. We shall ride north toward hills far with illusions of ye for a time to confuse any who seek ye. But those who pursue ye are not weak-minded. Go now, swiftly. Our love and regard go with ye. His clear blue eyes met theirs fondly as they turned their horses and with a wave spurred away. Looking back as they thundered south along the road, tears stinging their eyes, Narm and Shandrel saw the knights sitting their saddles, watching. Florin raised to his lips something that flashed silver in the sun. They rode over the first rise and lost sight of the knights. 
but the clear notes of his war horn rang out in farewell. He was playing the Salute to Victorious Warriors. At the inn, Chandrel had heard bards perform it to crown their performances and leave everyone awed, but never had she dreamed it might be played for her. Will we ever see them again? Narm asked softly as they slowed. Yes, Chandrel answered with eyes and voice of steel. We shall, whatever stands in the way. She brushed hair out of her eyes. Now, we must look after ourselves. If I must slay with spellfire every jack and lass so eager to take it, so be it. If all Faerun expects Lady Spellfire, I shall be Lady Spellfire. Narm nodded, face somber. Chandrel spread her hands. I'm afraid I can't laugh at devils and draculiches and mages and men with swords the way Torm does. They just make me angry and afraid. So I'll strike back. I hope you won't be hurt, but I fear much battle lies ahead. I hope you won't be hurt, my lady, Narm answered as they rode on. You're the one they'll be after. I know, Shandrel said softly, but tis I who will have spellfire ready when they find me. The road was lightly traveled that day. Norm and Chandrel saw no one else heading south, and only a few merchants bound north, who rode ready-armed, but nodded and passed without incident or ill looks. Great old trees of the elven court rose on both sides of the road. Between them and the road itself, a forest of stumps rose from the ditch like the gray fingers of buried giants the remnants of saplings cut by travelers as staves and litter poles and firewood. Narm watched these narrowly as they rode, half expecting brigands to rise from them. No such attack came. The hours and rolling hills passed. They rode, mostly in silence, until the sun glimmered low, and the trees laid dark shadows across the road. We should find a place to sleep, love, Narm said at last. Chandrel nodded. Yes, and soon. We're almost at the Vale, a cursed place. Let's stop here, at that height ahead, and hope none find us. When they reined to a halt and Narm swung down, the aches in his thighs made him groan and stagger. Timora, watch over us! His horse swung its head around to see what was the matter. He patted it reassuringly as he looked around and listened. Water, down there, he said after a moment, pointing. Chandrel swung down into his arms. Good, then, she said lightly kissing his nose as he set her down. You fetch some while I tie the horses, O oh mighty mage. Narm growled in the manner of Rathen and unhooked the nose bags from their saddles. Somewhere nearby, a wolf howled. Overhead, as daylight faded and moonlight began, a black falcon came silently to a branch above Chandrel and perched there. Watching. They awoke in each other's arms on the hard bed of their canvas tent laid on mossy ground. Birds called in the brightening morning, but it was still damp and misty among the trees. A beautiful place, but somehow unwelcoming. Sitting up, Norm thought he glimpsed through the tent flap elven eyes far off in the tree gloom, regarding him steadily. When he blinked, they were gone. Hmm, 
The elven kingdom might have gone from these woods, but the hand of man hadn't tamed what was left behind. Yet. Norm felt more comfortable once his hand was on the hilt of his drawn dagger, beneath the cloak that covered their shoulders and throats. He turned to Shandrel, who smiled through tussled hair, sleepy and vulnerable. Good morn, my lady, he greeted softly, rolling over to draw her close. And to you, my love, tis nice to be alone for once, without strangers attacking and guards watching over us always, and Elminster fussing about. I love you, Norm. I love you, too, Norm said quietly. How lucky I've been to see you in the inn, and then be parted, only to find you deep in ruined Mithranor. I would have come back to the rising moon some day, when I was free of Merimar, only to find you long gone. I, Shandrel whispered against his chest, long gone and probably dead. Oh, Norm. They lay in each other's arms for a long time, warm and safe, unwilling to rise and end this feeling of peace. From the road, a dull thudding of hooves came up through the trees, followed by the creak of harness leather. Shandrel sighed and rolled free of Narm. I suppose we must get up. Long hair tangled about her shoulders as she rose to her knees, pulling the cloak about her against the chill. If we stop in Assembra only to buy feed for us and the horses and hasten on, eating as we ride, we could camp on the southern edge of the forest this night. I want to be away west of the Thunder Peaks before the cult of the dragon and Zentil Keep and anyone else know we've left the night's. Come now, you can kiss me more later. Narm nodded a bit mournfully and glanced out the tent flap. Mist drifted through the trees and the horses patiently chewed leaves. Norm scrambled up to dress. Every step made him wince. His thighs were raw from yesterday's ride. Tugging on his belt, he emerged and then stopped abruptly to listen. He could have sworn he'd heard a chuckle, but there was no one to be seen. All was quiet from the road, too. He shrugged and went to the horses, glancing back often at his lady. He never saw the black falcon winging low among the trees, heading east for the long flight home. In falcon shape, the symbol chuckled and shook her head. They were good folk, children still, but not for much longer. She had other concerns, too long neglected to see to now. Perhaps they'd be killed, but then again, it was entirely possible they'd do the killing, no matter who of Faerun quarreled with them. Farewell, you two. Fare you very well. The lonely queen of Aglarond flicked raven-black wings and rose into a brightening sky. They made good time across the Vale of Lost Voices, a strangely still valley of huge, dark, soaring trees. It was sacred to the elves. Men whispered that something unseen and terrible guarded it, something that destroyed axe-wielders and great mages alike, and left no trace. The elves of Cormanthir had buried their fallen among these trees, and folk who dared to dig for treasure, interred with them, vanished in the mists and were not seen again. Norm and Chandral and travelers who passed them said not a word while crossing the vale, it was choked with the largest trees they had ever seen, some as big around as Elminster's tower. 
in the gloom under their lofty leaves, where boughs met high above the road, the light was eerily blue. In the forest distances, mists coiled slowly, and faint, glowing lights drifted and danced. No one strayed from the road while traversing the vale. They left it at last, Chandral shivering in relief as they crested the steep rise of its southern edge. The Lost Dale, they call it in Cormir, Norm said in a low voice, forever lost to men. Chandral looked at him. They say in the Dales that every elf of the elven court would have to be dead before one tree of the Vale could be safely cut. But I heard from more than one trader that all the elves are gone now. Chandral shook her head. No, I saw one in the woods as we came down to Storm Silverhand's pool. She waved to Storm and slipped away. She peered back into the dark veil, and then into the smaller, sun-dappled trees around them now. That's far from here, Narm protested. Think you so? asked Chandral, very softly. Look there, then. Narm followed her gaze. Ahead, on the mighty branch of a shadow top that towered above the road, a motionless figure in mottled green-gray stood. It was an elf, leaning easily on a bough that must have been a head taller than Narm. He watched them, expressionlessly. His eyes were blue and gold-flecked flames, proud and serene. Chandral bowed her head to him, smiled, and spread empty hands. A little uncertainly, Narm did the same. A slow nod was their only answer. The horses carried them past. Neither Narm or Chandral looked back. It was some time before she murmured, A moon elf, like Merith. A possible enemy, unlike Merith, Norm said grimly. We must watch our every step, he peered ahead. The tree's thin. We must be nearing Assembra. I can see fields. Out of those fields, a caravan rumbled toward them. A dozen wagons pulled by oxen and surrounded by hard-eyed outriders with crossbows at their saddles. The wagons bore no merchant banner, and passed without incident. Well behind the caravan rode a family on heavily laden draft horses, leading strings of pack mules. They were led by a single excited youth whose halberd dipped and swung alarmingly as he rode to challenge them. Way there! Way! If you be not foes, declare yourselves! Norm stared at him in silence. The halberd lowered menacingly. Declare yourselves or defend yourselves. Ride on in peace, Norm replied, or I'll turn your halberd into a viper to bite the hand that holds it. The boy recoiled, his horse dancing uncertainly as its rider tried to draw his blade wrong-handed. If you be a mage, he said shrilly, backing away as Narm and Chandral rode steadily on. Give your name or face swift death. Beyond, Narm saw hand crossbows raised ready and calm, wary eyes above them. He dared not hesitate. Narm drew himself up in his saddle. I am Merimar the Magnificent, mage most mighty. I and my apprentice here would pass you in peace, but offer us death, and it shall be yours. Beside him, Chandral burst into muffled giggles. With an effort, Norm kept his composure as the boy cast him a frightened look and hastened by. Norm nodded pleasantly and stared straight ahead as he passed the family and their mule train, 
almost managing to hide a smile that kept creeping onto one side of his face. Sarthor, Sememen peered into the crystal ball. Its magic was always difficult to focus at first. In its depths, he saw an expressionless, elegantly bearded face. Sarthor looked back fearlessly and effortlessly forced the link between them into clarity. Sememen tried to hide his irritation at the other mage's easy mastery of art. Well met, Sarthor purred. I've searched the dale. Elminster and the knights have just returned, riding south from Vunlar. The girl with Spellfire and her consort Mageling are no longer in Shadowdale, so far as I can determine. Not in Shadowdale? Not. They may be here in hiding, but I doubt it. No knight nor any harper has gone anywhere out of the ordinary. The folk of the tower know only that Lady Spellfire left two nights ago. Two nights? Sememen almost screamed. They could be almost anywhere. Precisely why I'm returning to you as soon as possible, Sarthor thought flatly, letting the crystal carry his mental message. Who's that with you? With me? Sememen frowned. I'm alone. You are indeed. Now. A moment ago, an eye floated above your left shoulder, the ocular construction of a wizard eye spell. A spy. Guard yourself, Sememen. Sememen turned angrily from the crystal to stare wildly about the chamber. Show yourself, he thundered, casting a quick spell. Dreamers, the auras of familiar objects imbued with art, glowed all around. The faint traceries of spells, too, shone in his field of revealed magic. But all were spells he knew about. There was no sign of any intruder. Sememen turned back to the crystal ball, but it was dark. No one waited at the matching globe any longer. Sememen cursed the shadows, but they did not answer. The sun sank low in the west as Shandrel and Narm passed a skin of hot-spiced tea between them. They rode contentedly, bellies full of warm roast fledge, the plump ground partridge of the woods, smoky-tasting, and delightful in a thick pea gravy. No one had seemed suspicious of them at the inn Florin had recommended. How do you feel, Shen? Narm asked, not meeting her eyes. About this bellfire, I mean, does it change one? A little startled, Shandra looked at him with something like pity. Yes, but not in the larger sense. I'm still the Shandrel you rescued from Roglithgor. She hesitated. I'm still the Shandrel you love. There was a little silence as they regarded each other. Then the attack came. Shandrel sensed something was wrong an instant before the boulder struck Narm's shoulder and his head flew back. The jarring made her bite her lip. Narm whirled about, his arm striking her head solidly as he spun, toppled, and fell. Stunned, Shandrel stared at the huge, mossy boulder as it sank slowly past her to hang in the air above Narm's head. He lay crumpled, unmoving. The boulder was large and dark, and over it, behind the grassy bank, stood a man in robes. He grinned at her without humor, his eyes glittering black and deadly. Wild fear rose and choked her. Chapter 19 The Crushing of the Soul 
I have known the crushing of the soul that defeat brings, and the burning, sickening pain of deep wounds, and would not have it otherwise. Such dark things make the bright spots burn the brighter. Corin of Neverwinter, tales told by the warm fireside, year of the blazing brand. Make no sound, the man in robes warned. Speak not, cast no spells, use no spell fire, Chandral Chasser, or I'll let the rock fall on your husband's head. His eyes bored into hers. Think not to trick me or take me unawares, for I'm no such a fool, and yon stone can hardly miss its mark. Chandral sat in her saddle, cold fear trickling down her spine. She stared at this enemy mage, wondering who he was, how to win free. Her mind screamed, how to win free. I am Malark, the man said with cold pride, of the cult of the dragon. I come for revenge, and I will have it. His eyes flickered. Get down off your horse, slowly, and stay just where you land, or your husband will die. Chantrel did as he commanded, never taking her eyes off his. He watched her with the cold patience of a snake. Lie down, slowly, to your knees, and then upon your belly, arms stretched to the sides. Touch no weapon. Chandral did so, heart sinking as she pressed her face into the dirt road. Good. Spread your arms and legs. Slowly. Do not try to rise. His voice was nearer. Chandral obeyed, wondering how much she'd have to endure, and silently gathered spellfire. Malark walked around her, staying at a safe distance. Angry warmth filled Chandral's chest and throat. She glared at a tuft of grass, and it began to smolder. She hooded her fire hastily and held herself ready. Timora, aid me. You've cost us much, Chandral Chasser. The Shadow Sill, the sacred worm Roglathgor, his lair, the fortified tower above it, all his treasure, the sacred worm Agastam, many devout followers, the worth of all these you owe us. The price you will pay is your spellfire and your life in service, yours and your husband's. You will serve or die. Lie still. The cold voice above Chandral began a spell. God's aid me, Chandral thought. What will become of us? There are no knights here to rescue us now. Malark's cold chant ended in a sudden squeal and gurgle. Chandral, waiting to absorb his spell, rolled over in breathless haste. If that rock fell on Narm... But Narm was safely to one side, in the grip of a grinning... Rathen Thentraver. The wizard, Malark, stood staring at her, his eyes very dark and very large. Torm grinned over his shoulder. In the thief's hands were the ends of the waxed cord that had choked off Malark's spell in mid-word. The wizard hung from the cord now, his face terrible, fingers clawing at his throat. As she watched in dawning horror, those fingers grew feeble. Malark's eyes rolled up into his skull, and he sagged. Torm held the cord tight as he lowered Malark to the ground. Well, Matt, the thief said cheerfully. He drew his dagger in one fluid motion and beckoned Rathen with a jerk of his head. His purse, quickly, before he's fully dead. These damned mages all have spells to trigger mischief at their deaths. Rathen bent to work. 
Oh, Shandrel, thy lad's all right. Shandrel stared at the boulder, sunk deep into the grass, and shuddered. Nothing but a rag and a few coppers, Rathen reported. His boots, Torm directed, still holding the cord tight. Malark's face was so twisted, dark, and terrible, Shandrel looked away. Is he dead? she asked weakly. Nearly. I'll cut his throat in a moment. Then, lady, twould be best to burn the body completely, or some cult bastard will raise him to tail you. Torm turned professional eyes on the boots. Try that heel. Ha! Rathen said in satisfaction, holding up six platinum pieces. Hollow indeed. Hmm, Torm said, wrinkling his nose. No magic. Scarce worth all this trouble. Have off his robe, Rathen, and we'll cut his throat and be done with it. His robe? Ay, his robe, where he conceals the components for his spells, a few extra coins, and the gods know what else. Come on, my arms grow weary. They do. Pretend they're around a wench, and ye'll have no trouble, Rathen told him gruffly, tugging off the mage's robe. He stepped back, surveying the wizard's body, as Torm laid it down with both ends of the cord in one fist and a long, wicked dagger in the other. Torm grinned at Chandril. Not unimportant, are ye? Malark, one of the rulers of the Cult of the Dragon, and an archmage. Watch out now. There's lots of other rats like this one in Sembia, and one in Deepingdale, too. Yes, Shandrel replied, her voice a whisper as sharp as a sword. Corvin. Rathen nodded. Aye, that's the name. Ye have been warned, then? Good. Well... Ye are doing fine thus far. Fine, Shandrel said bitterly, watching Torm free the cord and slash with cruel speed. Her gaze fell on Narm, who still lay silent in the grass. Oh, yes, fine indeed. Rathen sighed and went to her. Look, little one, Faerun can be a cruel place. Men like this have to be slain, or they'll kill thee. Nor is there any shame in defeat at his hands. This one could have slain any of us knights in an open fight. He enfolded her in a bare hug. Ye wouldn't be thirsty, perhaps? Shandrel's shoulders shook helplessly her tears overwhelmed by laughter. She laughed a long time and a little wildly, but Rathen held her tight. When, at last, she was done, she raised bright eyes. Are you finished, Torm? I think I'd like to wield a little spellfire. Torm nodded and stepped back. Shandrel raised a hand and lashed the body with flames, pouring out her anger. Oily smoke arose almost immediately, and the horses snorted and hurried off in all directions. Torm and Rathen let out despairing cries and ran after them. Narm rolled over, groaned, and asked faintly, Shan, what? Why'd you do that? Am I not to kiss you? They could be dead by now, Charantir said angrily. I ride patrol for a few days and return to find you've put your toes to the behinds of the nicest young people I've met. One struggles with half-trained art, and the other bears spellfire every mage in the realms would slay her to gain or destroy, and both are mad enough to seek adventure, only days married, too. Where's your kindness, Knights of Mithranor? Where is your sense? Easy, Shar, Florin said gently. 
They joined the Harpers and wanted to walk their own road. Would you want to be caged? Caged? Does a mother turn out her infant because it's reached twenty nights? Alone, you sent them? The furious ranger turned on Elminster. What say you, old one? Can they best even a handful of brigands? Brigands attacking by surprise in the night? Speak truth. I've never done aught else when it mattered. As to the fight ye speak of, I think ye'd be surprised. Elminster drew out his pipe. Besides, they're not alone. Not by now. Torm and Rathen rode after them. Charantier snorted. Sent the sharpest lances, didn't you? She paced, hair swirling, and drew a deep breath. Well enough, they're not unprotected. She folded her arms and leaned back beside the hearth. God's spit on my luck. I wanted to say farewell, not just ride away and never see them again. They'll be all right, Char, Storm said gently, and they'll be back. Charantier raises a good point, Lancerel said from his chair. The wisdom of sending them alone, with only a rescue force hurrying along behind, can be questioned. He raised thoughtful eyes to Morngrim and Elminster. I take it you considered their slipping away while we rode a distraction to Hillsfar a good risk? Elminster nodded. It had to be. Think on that, Charantier, and be not so angry, lass. They passed the veil without loss or upset, Merith put in. I heard from one of the people watching the road. Charantier nodded. And since then? Elistal spoke up. I scried Torm and Rethin yester eve. They were cutting across country southeast of Mistledale and had met with no one then. I'll try them again tonight. Soon? I. You can watch if you like. You too, yes, if you have no greater game afoot. She looked meaningfully at Merith, who grinned. We might need your spells if there's danger or alarm. Yasael chuckled. Tis a good thing none but the gods look over your shoulders to see all we, and Nam and Shandral gods smile on them, get up to. T'would make a long, confusing ballad. Elminster scowled. Life's seldom as clear-cut, smooth, and easily ended as a ballad. He put his pipe in his mouth with an air of finality. The fire crackled and flared in the hearth. The old mage stared into the flames and muttered, She's so young to wield spellfire. He lies within. The acolyte said, hastening back from the door. Sememen thanked him curtly. Open it. The acolyte stood in silence, and then glided reluctantly forward and swung wide the heavy oak and bronze door. Sememen motioned him through. The acolyte nodded and entered, face impassive. The wizard followed through thick stone walls into a vast chamber that glowed an eerie blue. This was the center of the black altar, the inner chamber of solitude, where one was said to be closest to the god. The high imperceptor's forces had not penetrated this far, though Sememen felt much satisfaction at the extensive damage. Bane's priests would be a while recovering their cocky strength. Perhaps never, Sumemon thought, if certain misfortunes befall them now, while weak and disorganized. He came fully into the chamber, and such thoughts ceased. Vast and dark above him hung a beholder, 
its great central eye gazing down in wise, dark malice. The acolyte darted back behind Sememon, the door clanged, and a heavy bar crashed into place. Sememon was imprisoned, and this eye tyrant was not mansome. Sememon cursed inwardly as he approached, his cloak concealing nervous fingers on the hilt of a useless dagger. The floor of the chamber was polished black marble. In the center of that vast, cold expanse rose a black throne, a throne the high imperceptor hadn't sat at the foot of for many a long year. It was gigantic, a seat for a giant, the seat of a god. It was occupied. Red silk splashed across the black stone. Fazul Chembrel lay asleep on a bed across the seat of the god's throne, recovering after the frantic healing efforts of under-priests. A rope ladder allowed them to ascend to the spot. Sememen approached, uncomfortably aware that the beholder was moving with him, floating directly overhead, its great unblinking eye staring down. At long last, the beholders were making their own bid for mastery over the Zenterum. A deep, rumbling voice from overhead said, You've come to discover death, Sememin the Proud, and you've found not Fazul's death, but your own. Sememin broke into a run. The dark body above him sank lower. In a breath, the eye tyrant would be close enough to turn him to stone, charm him into obedience, or perhaps simply pursue him about the chamber like a trapped rat, wounding him repeatedly. In the end, it would use the eye that destroyed, and there'd not even be dust left of Sememen. He ran as he had never run before, diving frantically around the edge of the throne, where its great central eye that foiled all magic could not see. He began casting an incendiary cloud. He hadn't the right spells for a fight this grave. Buy time and cover, he thought. Use a dimension door to teleport above it, and then paralyzation. Or, no, magic missiles now. Or, ah, gods spit upon it all. Raging, Sememin finished his spell weaving. He sprinted along the back of the throne, nearly tripping over the ring of a trap door he'd have needed the brawn of five acolytes to lift. Reaching the corner, Sememin gasped and steadied himself. To hurl magic missiles, he must see his target, and if he could see the beholder, its eyes could see him. He tensed himself to take a rapid peek and... There was a flash and a roar, and the floor heaved, throwing Sememin to his knees. Up! Get up! Reddish spots danced before his eyes. He couldn't tell up from down. Well met, Sememin, said a dry, coldly familiar voice. Sememin looked up into the calm gazes of Sarthor and Manshoon. The High Lord of Zental Keep was robed in his usual black and dark blue, and he looked amused. You can get up now. It's gone. He flexed his fingers, from which tiny wisps of smoke curled. Swallowing, Sememin found his voice. You've returned. Lord, we've missed you, indeed. I... No doubt. I've watched you and seen the, uh, troubles with Fazul. Slay him not. He's needed. They strode briskly together across the marble floor to the doorway Sememen had entered by. The door lay in blasted, twisted shards of metal. Sarthor, 
Manchun explained briefly. The three mages went out through strangely deserted halls and sought the starlit night. Wordlessly, they walked out of the black altar, past dim piles that had already begun to stink, the bodies of those fallen in the strife between Vizul and the High Imperceptor, and proceeded straight to Samemon's abode. The two dark-robed mages left Samemon there. Cheer up, Manchun told him. You'll have your chance to fight the others for all this. He shrugged and looked around at the dark spires all about. Some day. I can't live forever. With that, he turned on his heel and was gone down the cobbled street into the night, Sarthor at his heels. Samemin stared after them in the faint light, fear like cold iron in his mouth. When would Manshun feel a certain Samemin had lived long enough? Bereft of cheer, he muttered the passphrase, made a certain gesture, and passed within. Unnoticed, the little eyeball that Manshun had sent to spy floated in with him, too. We just happened to be riding this way, Rathen said gruffly. Tis an open road, is it not? No, Shandril said with a crooked smile. You came after us to protect us. Did you not trust Timora to look after us? The burly priest grinned. Of course Timora watches over ye. Am I not an instrument of Timora's will? Is that why you moved a sleeping man and left all the fighting and dirty work to me? Torm said. Not a copper's worth in his robe, too. Dirty work, is it? Who took off his boots? I thank you both, Narm said, despite your feeble attempts at humor. Again, my lady and I owe you our lives, and our horses too, it seems. Your spell even took away my headache. Rathen grinned. If ye want it back, I can lend thee Torm. Torm gave him a sour look. Shandril giggled. I don't think that'll be quite necessary, Rathen. I have a man to drive me beyond endurance. Norm looked hurt until Shandril winked. Torm was delighted. Leave Norm with Rathen to learn to ride and fight and worship, and I'll ride with you. I'm witty, agile, clean, quick, and experienced. I know lots of jokes, and I'm an excellent cook. So long as you're partial to meat, tomatoes, cheese, and noodles all cooked together, I'm fully conversant with the laws of six kingdoms and many independent cities, and I'm an excellent gambler. He batted his eyelashes at her. What do you say, hmm? Shandril gave him a look that could have melted glass. She asked Rathen, Is there nothing you can do about him? Oh, I, Rathen agreed, ye can give him first watch, so we can all get some sleep. Narm and I'll sleep on either side, close against ye, so ye won't have to worry about him getting cold and wanting to, um, snuggle up. Ah, uh ha, -huh. Shandril agreed dubiously, rolling her eyes, but flopped down onto her bed without hesitation. Rathen grunted and lowered himself slowly to a lying position, rolling his cloak up as a pillow. He lay on the grass fully clad, without bedding or blanket, grasping his mace. He nodded as if satisfied, and soon was snoring. His boots twitched now and then. Torm winked at Narm and reached out to pinch the priest. His fingers were still inches away when Rathen opened one eye. He can forget pinching, stroking, and tickling honest folk, or even we who sleep in the arms of the gods. Just see that the fire stays high. Norm fell asleep, chuckling. 
Morning sunlight broke over the rolling hills and fields of Battledale and northern Sembia, and found Rathen Thentraver warming water for tea over the dying fire. He looked around at his sleeping companions, got to his feet with a grunt of effort, and clambered up the bank to look about. The land was bare of all but grass, rolling and empty. Nodding, Rathen tucked his mace under his arm and sat down. He cleared his thoughts of all but Timora, as he tried to do every morning. Opening his heart, he prayed that the two young folk, I, Torm too, be bother him, would see only Timora's bright face until they had reached Silvery Moon and befriended Illustrial. Everyone needs at least one safe journey, and these two more than most, because of Spellfire. Looking across the twisted blankets to Shandril's sleeping face, Rathen thought about her weeping Spellfire and lashing out with it and tearing open her tunic to pour it faster on a foe. He'd not want to carry such power, not for all the gold in the realms. He sighed. If they'd ridden a bit slower, that snake of a mage might have had her yestereve. So close, a matter of breaths. How to nurse made a lass who could blast apart mountaintops? They'd be running into trouble soon enough, these two, and they'd need someone. Rathen sighed again. Ah, well... Some things he must leave to Timora. He got up and began to make tea. Soon they'd be wanting morning feast, too. He looked at the sleepers, and a smile touched his lips. Why wake them? The younglings needed a good, long sleep when they were guarded and could relax. Let them sleep. He peered south toward the river Ashaba, but it was too far away to see. We'll ride with them until they're up at dawn tomorrow, and then turn back, Rathen thought. If Elminster is half the archmage he pretends to be, surely he can hold Shadowdale together that long. Scratching under his armor, Rathen opened the pack that held the food. Another day, another dragon slain. Will ye never be done scratching and scribbling? Elminster demanded. Ye are not writing an epic, ye know. Leo turned calm eyes on him. Stir the stew, Lord Mighty Mage. Elminster snorted, shifted his unlit pipe from hand to mouth, and began to stir. You miss them, don't you? The scribe asked softly. The old mage stared angrily at Leo's back. Aye. He set the ladle down and sat on the squat section of tree that served as a seat nigh the kitchen table. Tisn't every day one sees spellfire destroy one's spells as if they were smoke, or see the high and mighty manchun put to flight by a young girl. A thief, she said she was, or at least she joined the company of the Bright Spear as a thief. Elminster snorted again. Thief? She's as much a thief as ye are. If we had a few more thieves like her, the realms'd be so safe we'd not need locks. Which reminds me, locks and locked away books, that is, candle keep. Alondo, what did old Alondo say about Spellfire? We must be getting close to that prophecy, so tis no doubt Shandril he's talking about. Leo smiled. As it happens, I looked up Alondo the last night Narm and Shandril spent here. Under the jam jar on the uppermost scrap, I've copied the relevant saying— if a certain war among wizards has already begun in Faerun, 
tis next to be fulfilled. Elminster fixed Leo with a hard glance, but the scribe went serenely on with his writing. What are ye doing? Elminster demanded. There ye sit, scribbling, while the stew thickens and burns. What is it? Stir the stew, will you? Leo asked innocently. Before the old mage's fury could erupt, he replied, I'm noting down the limits of Chandral's power, as observed by you and the knights. The information may prove useful. He added, very quietly, if she must ever be stopped. Elminster slowly nodded, looking very old. Aye, aye, ye've the right of it, as usual. But not that little girl, not Chandral. Why, she's but a little wisp, all laughter and kindness and bright eyes. Aye, as Lanshara once was, Leo told the piece of parchment before him. Elminster sat like a statue, and there was silence for a long time. Leo finished his work, blew on the page, and got up. Elminster still sat unmoving, his eyes on the fire. Wordlessly, Leo reached over the wizard, slid a scrap of parchment out from under the jam jar, laid it before him, and turned to see to food. Perhaps four breaths later, he heard the old mage's voice behind him, and smiled to himself. Spellfire will rise, and a sword of power to cleave shadow and evil and master art. Elminster read it as though it was a curious bard's rhyme, or a bad attempt at a joke. Master art? What did Alondo mean by that? She's to become a mage? She's not the slightest aptitude for it, and I'm not completely new to teaching art, you know. I've found Alondo's sayings make perfect sense after they've happened, Leo said, but help precious little beforehand. Ah, stir the stew, Elminster grunted. I'm going out for a pipe. The door banged behind him. Leo grinned. The stairs creaked as storm came down them barefoot, silver hair shining in the firelight. Leave the stew, she said softly to Leo. It's probably been thrashed into soup by now, between the both of you. Leo smiled and put strong arms around her. Let's go back upstairs before he returns for a flame to light his pipe. Haste now. The bed creaked as they sat on it, a scant instant before the door below banged open. Outside again, Elminster puffed, peered at the twisted tower through aromatic smoke, chuckled, and hummed his favorite of the tunes Storm had composed. One didn't survive so many winters, without noticing a thing or two. They rode south that day, on a road busy with wagons rumbling north out of Sembia. Hawk-eyed outriders and shrewd merchants looked them over, and the scrutiny made Narm and Chandral uncomfortable. Torm had acquired a mustache from somewhere about his person, and brown powder of the sort used as cosmetics in the inner sea lands. He rubbed it skillfully about his eyes, jaw, and cheekbones, until his face seemed subtly different. Riding in silence for the most part, a mercy on his companions, he affected a soft, growling voice when he did speak, and kept to the rear. Looking back, Norm could see the glistening whites of Torm's eyes darting in the shadowy gloom of a cap that hid his face. The mage gathered that Torm was too well known hereabouts to ride openly. 
Rathen paid such cautions no mind. He rode easily before Chandral, speaking of the kindnesses and spectacular cruelties of the great Lady Timora, and occasionally pointing out a far-off landmark or the approaching colors of a merchant house or company of the inner sea lands. He addressed her as Lady Nelchave, and occasionally compared things to your hold Roaring Crest. Chandral answered in vague murmurs, trying to sound bored. In fact, she was enjoying riding in the comfortable security of Rathen and Torm with a guided tour of the countryside. Torm and Rathen preferred to lunch in the saddle without halting. Chandral found it fascinating to watch them fill nose bags with skins of water and lean forward to hang them carefully about the necks of their mounts and mules after first letting each animal taste and smell the contents. They deftly passed bread, cheese, and small chased metal flasks of wine about. Torm even produced four large iced sugar rolls, probably pilfered from a passing cart. Chandral wondered if he had endless pockets, like Longfingers the magician in the bard's tales. A light rain squall came out of the west in the afternoon and lashed them briefly as it passed overhead. Torm nearly lost his mustache, but regained his high, sly spirits. He danced about on his dripping horse, firing jests, rolling his eyes, and mimicking the absent knights. The day passed, and the road fell steadily away. In high eventide, they came to Blackfeather Bridge, where the road between the Standing Stone and Sembia crossed the river Ashaba. There, Sembia maintained a small guard post of bored, hardened men, armed with crossbows and pikes, and bearing the raven and silver banner of Sembia. The guards looked long and coldly at the four travelers. A cleric of Tempest and a silent man in maroon robes stood off to one side and watched steadily. Narm's throat went dry, but he tried to keep his face impassive. Dragon Cult and Zenterum agents could be anywhere and everywhere. Norm was certain Rathen was recognized, but nothing was said, and no one barred their way. Two hills later, as the sun sank, Norm could see no pursuit. Still, his uneasiness persisted, and he wasn't surprised when at sunset Rathen led them wordlessly westward off the road, continuing until it grew too dim to ride safely. This seems as good a place as any, Rathen said gruffly, waiting for Torm's nod. Ready watch tonight. If you must go off to relieve thyself, Shan, go not alone. Torm began stringing a webwork of black silk cords in an arc around the campsite. The knights seemed to share Narm's foreboding. Narm and Torm had barely drifted off, long after an exhausted chandrel, when there came the thud of someone tripping amid the silk cords. Rathen whirled, hefting his mace from his knees, and let out a warning bellow that must have echoed clear across the dragon reach. The attacker rose with a stream of soft curses, sword drawn, and others came behind him. Narm rolled upright with frightened speed. Torm was up and away into the night like a vengeful shadow. Defend thy lady, lad! Rathen roared over one shoulder as his mace struck aside attacking steel. Two foes faced him, with a third rushing up. The first of them fell. In a stumbling rush, Narm reached and stood over Chandral, who was rolling over drowsily. More men with blades came out of the night. Another attacker fell, and Narm saw the glint of steel as Torm leaped onward to deal death again. 
Someone rushed right at Norm, steel gleaming in the moonlight. The man wore dark leathers and waved a hooked saber, an unlovely smile growing on his face. Coolly, Norm cast magic missiles at the man's eyes and then drew his dagger and braced himself. Glowing pulses of magic swooped and struck. The man gasped, stared at nothing, staggered, and went to his knees. Norm set his teeth and leaned over to finish the job. Blood wet his fingers, and he felt sick as he looked around for new dangers. A second man sprinted out of the night, teeth clenched and blade high. Norm ducked aside as he'd seen Torm do and stabbed at his assailant. The blade gashed a wrist. The man cursed, stumbled, and fell on his side. And Norm pounced. Into the throat. Gods, it was so hideously easy. Norm swept that thought away and peered around for other perils. There were none. Torm dispatched another foe from behind. The man stiffened and groaned. Rathen was chatting jovially to those he slew. Do ye not realize what moral pain, nay, spiritual agony, striking thee down causes me? Hast no consideration for my feelings? The heavy mace fell with a crash. More than this, I, ye, ah, uh, ah, uh, Wound me, instead of challenging me in, ah, uh, the bright light of day, before men of worth to bear witness, with a stated, ha, grievance, ye seek to do dishonor on my poor holy bones in the dark of the night, at a time when all good and, ah, uh, lucky men are abed, with better, ah, uh, Things to do than cracking skulls. Don't ye agree? Ah, now? Rathen's last opponent fell, twitching, jaw shattered. Torm looked up. The horses like this little. We'd best move them, and us, in case others lurk. Norm, is your lady awake? Shandrel answered. Yes. She shuddered involuntarily at the sight of his bloody dagger. Must you enjoy it so much? Torm looked at her. I don't enjoy it at all, he said quietly. But I prefer it to getting a knife in the ribs. He bent and wiped his blade on something that Chandril mercifully couldn't see, but he did not sheathe it. Shall we ride? Walk, pigeon brain! Rathen rumbled, and lead the horses. Who knows what we'd stumble into if we rode? See to these, will ye? I want none alive to tell our names and route, and this mace is not so sure as a blade. At once, exalted one, Torm said with sarcastic sweetness, Mind you, don't forget any of our baggage. I'll just see if our late friends were carrying anything of value. Rathen nodded. Mind more don't come upon ye while ye are slavering and giggling over gold. In quiet haste, they gathered their gear and led their mounts and mules into the night. Narm and Shandril followed Rathen west, pace by careful pace, over rolling ground. Torm caught up. I saw no one else following, but listen sharp, everyone. It seems I'll be doing that the rest of my life, Chandril whispered bitterly. Torm put his head close to hers. The faint light of Selyun caught his teeth as he grinned. You might even get used to it. Who knows? Who indeed, she replied crisply. Not much farther now, Rathen said soothingly from ahead. Loose stones clacked underfoot, and then he added in quiet satisfaction, Here, this'll do. 
Chandral fell into sleep as if it were a great black pit, and she never stopped falling. Lady Spellfire awoke with the smell of frying boar in her nostrils. Narm had just kissed her. Chandral murmured her contentment and embraced him sleepily. He smelled good. Nearby, a merry voice said, Works like a charm. Can I try it? Chandral, will you go back to sleep for a moment? Chandral sighed. Torm, do you never stop? Not until I'm dead, good lady. Irritating I may be, but I'm never dull. Aye, Rathen rumbled. Thou art many things, dullard, but never dull. Fair morning to you both, Chandral laughed. Well met, lady, the priest answered. Thy dawn fry awaits. Simple fare, but enough to ride on. We were not bothered again in the night, but ye'd best watch sharp today. Twill not be long before those bodies are found. Norm looked at the grassy hills. Where exactly are we? In the hills west of Featherdale, Rathen supplied. Turn about. See ye that gray shadow like smoke on the horizon? Archwood. Between here and there lies an old, broad valley with no river any more. Tasseldale. I'd not go down into it, though tis a pleasant place with many fine shops and friendly folk. Tis also full of folk to avoid. Keep to the heights along its northern edge. There ye'll meet with no more than a shepherd or two, and perhaps a Mareshar patrol. Tell them, they police the dale, and always ride twelve strong, that ye are from High Moon, Shandral, going home with this mage ye met in Hillsfar. Call thyself Gothel, or something, Narm. Stick to the truth about Gorstag and the inn, and ye'll fare better. Give no information to any others until ye meet with the elves of Deepingdale. Elves? Chandral asked, astonished. Aye, elves. Know ye nothing of Deepingdale, where ye grew up? Rathen's voice was incredulous. No, Chandral told him. Only the inn. I saw half-elves when I left with the company, but no elves. I see. Know ye that the present lord of High Moon is the half-elf hero Thermon Ulath. So don't say the wrong thing. The burly priest rose and pulled on his helm. Now eat. The day grows old. They ate. And all too soon, all was done. Rathen sighed and said heavily, Well, the time has come. We must leave. He turned on his heel to look southwest. One day's ride should take ye to the western end of Tasseldale, in the Dun Hills. That's one camp. Keep watch, sleeping together's for indoors. Peace, Torm, no jests now. Another day's careful ride west. Just keep Archwood to the left of ye. Whatever else ye come upon will bring ye to Deepingdale. Ye can press on after dark once ye've found the road and make the rising moon before morn. All right? They nodded, their hearts full. Good, then. Rathen went on in gruff haste, and no weeping now. He held out a wineskin to Narm. For thy saddle. He fumbled at the large pouch at his hip, brought out a disc of shining silver on a fine chain, and hung it about Chandral's neck, kissing her on the forehead. Timora's good luck go with ye. Torm stepped forward. Take this and bear it most carefully. Tis dangerous. He held out a cheap, 
Gaudy medallion of brass set askew with glued cut glass stones on a brass chain of mottled hue that did not match the medallion. He put it around Norm's neck. What is it? Norm asked, wonder and wariness in his voice. Look at it, Torm replied, but take care how you touch it. Norm looked. About his neck was no cheap medallion, but a fine, twist-link gold chain. Upon it hung two small golden globes with a larger one between. This is magical, Torm warned. Keep it clear of spellfire or any fiery art, or it may slay you. You, and only you, can twist off a globe and hurl it. When it strikes, it bursts like a mage's fireball. Mind you're not too close. The larger globe is of greater power than the others. They work without need of spell or commands. Keep these safe. You'll need them, probably sooner than you think. He patted Norm's elbow awkwardly. Fare you both well. The knights mounted, saluted with bared blades, tossed two small flasks of water to Norm and Chandrel, wheeled their mounts, and galloped away. Hooves thundered briefly on earth and faded. They were gone. Norm and Chandrel looked at each other, eyes bright. We really are alone now, love, Norm said softly. We've only each other. Yes, and that will do. She kissed him, spun away, and leaped into her saddle. Come on, the sun waits not, and we must ride. Norm grinned at her and ran to his own saddle. Spitfire. Chandrel raised her eyebrows and obediently spat fire in a long, rolling plume that winked out just in front of him. The horses snorted in alarm. Ah, yes, Spitfire indeed, but also thy lady. She tossed her hair from her eyes, lifted her chin, and commanded, Now, let us away. Away west they sped, leaving trampled grass and happy memories. Stars shone clear and cold outside the upper room of Elminster's tower, but he saw them not. He gazed into a twinkling sphere of crystal on the table before him, and therein saw a red-carpeted chamber hung with tapestries of red and silver and gold, lit by a fine, roaring fire. A lady in a tattered black gown sat at a table and looked back at him. "'Well met, withered, and welcome,' she said with the faintest of smiles. "'Well met, Lady Queen and Mage. Thank ye for allowing this intrusion.' "'Few enough call on me, old mage, and fewer still without intent to harm or hamper.' I thank you. Elminster inclined his head politely. I've further thanks for thee this night, lady. Thank ye for protecting Narm and Chandrel these past few days. I'm most grateful. The symbol gave him a rare smile. My pleasure again. There followed a silence ere Elminster asked carefully, why did ye aid them when the maids such a threat to thy magic, and therefore the survival of Aglarond, and ye? I know the prophecy of Alando, and what it may mean, and care not. I like Shandril. The symbol looked momentarily away, and then back at the old mage. I've a question for you, Elminster. Answer not, if you'd rather not. Is Shandril the child of Garth and Shether and the incantatrix Demathe? I'm not certain, lady, but tis very likely. An eyebrow lifted. 
Not certain? Did you not hide the girl and shelter her as she grew? Elminster shook his head very slowly. Nay, not I. Who then? "'Twas the warrior Gorstag of High Moon.' "'The symbol nodded. "'So much I've also come to suspect. "'Thank you for trusting to answer me openly. "'I promise you, old mage, I'll not betray your trust. "'Shandral's safe from my power, "'unless the passing years change her as they did Lanshara.' and she becomes too great a danger to leave unopposed. That's my present burden, Elminster said heavily. Such a fall must not happen again. What, if I may ask without giving offense, will you do differently this time? The symbol watching closely, eyes very dark. Leave her be, Elminster replied grimly. She'll choose her own path in the end, and that choice may be clearer and happier, if not easier, if I sit not upon her every act and bestow advice on her every thought. Elminster met the symbol's gaze. The Harpers can protect her nearly as well as this old wizard, unless I lock her in my tower. And I couldn't do that, even had I so cruel a heart. The symbol nodded. That's the right road to ride. Tis good I needn't force you to take that route. Elminster smiled sadly. Good indeed, for such an attempt would likely destroy ye. The symbol regarded him soberly. I know. Impulsively, she leaned forward and whispered, I've never doubted or belittled your power, Elminster. You take a sly and self-effacing way, playing the befuddled old fool, even as I take beast shape to prowl and hide. But I've seen what your art has wrought. If ever I stand against it, I expect to fall. I did not disturb ye this night to threaten ye. I know, the symbol murmured, rising. Will you allow me to teleport to you now? Of course, lady, Elminster replied. But why? The symbol let fall her tattered gown. Beneath it was a webwork of thin, black silk strands reaching from her throat to cuffs at her wrists and a broad cummerbund. It was a garment that covered little. Many small, twinkling gems winked out only to shine more brilliantly when the symbol reappeared beside Elminster. Unsmiling, she stood amid the dark clutter of his books and papers and spread her hands almost timidly, offering herself. Elminster gaped for some very long moments before he deliberately composed himself and smiled. But, lady, I've seen countless winters, Elminster said gently. Am I not too old for this? She stopped his lips with slim, white fingers. Those years will give us something to talk about, wizard and witch queen, she said. She was slim and very light in his lap, and she leaned forward in a smooth, soft embrace. I would tell you something, she whispered, as Elminster's arms went gently around her. My name, my true name, is... Hush, lady, Elminster said, eyes moist. Keep it safe. We'll trade them soon, I, but not now. Tears came. Ah, old mage, 
the symbol said into his chest. I've been so lonely. Leo, who'd come silently up the dark stairs with tea, the pot wrapped in a thick scarf to keep it warm, stopped outside the door and heard them. Without tarrying to overhear another word, he set the tray down carefully on a table nearby and went softly downstairs again for a second cup. As he went, he wondered, What's the weight of secrets? How many can a man carry? How many more can a woman or an elf? It was dark outside, but in the little cottage near the woods, candles flickered and a hearth fire blazed. A woman at the cauldron straightened as they entered. She was no longer young, and her clothes were simple and much patched. My lords, she gasped, alarm falling from her face. Welcome, but I've nothing to feed you. My man won't be back from the hunt until morn. Nay, Lara, Rathen rumbled kindly, embracing her. We cannot stay, but must hasten back to Shadowdale. We've an urgent errand for thy daughter, and I'd renew Timora's bright blessing on this house. Lyra looked at them in wonderment. With Imre? But she's scarce six. Torm nodded. Old enough that her feet reach the ground. He was promptly interrupted by the precipitous arrival of a small, dark-haired whirlwind who fetched up against his legs, laughing. As he reached down to embrace her, she danced back out of reach. Well met, Torm and Rathen, knights of Mithranor. I'm pleased to see you. Both knights bowed, and Rathen answered, we're also pleased to see thee, lady. We come to discharge our duty to ye. Are ye in good health and of high spirits? Aye, of course, but look how beautiful mother is since you healed her. She grows taller, I think. Torm and Rathen regarded the astonished and smiling Lara. Aye, I think you're right. She does grow taller, Torm said solemnly. Send word when she grows too tall for the roof, and we'll help you rebuild. Imre nodded. I'll do that, she eyed Torm. You are making me wait, Sir Knight. Is my patience not well held? Am I not solemn enough? She fairly danced. Did you bring it? Tis not an it. "'Tis a he, as you are a she,' said Torm severely, opening his cloak to pour something soft and furry into her arms. Silver and black fur surrounded great, glistening eyes. It let out an inquiring meow. Imre held it in wonder as it stretched its nose out to her. "'Has it he a name?' Rathen regarded her gravely. Aye, it has a true name, which it keeps hidden, and a kitten name. But ye must give it a proper name, the name ye can call it. Choose wisely. The kitten will have to live with thy choice. Aye, Imre agreed. Tell me, please, its kitten name that I may call it so while I think on so important a choice. Lara smiled broadly. Its name, said Torm with dignity, is Snuggleguts. He dropped a shower of gold into her hand. What's this? Imre stared in wonder at the nine large coins. It's life. Rathen replied, Thy kitten will need milk and meat and fish and much care, and to be kept warm. Ye, or thy parents, must buy those things. Ye must take the mice and rats it kills. 
thank thy pet without disgust or sharp words, and bury them. Tis thy duty. Know ye, Imre, that the gods gather back to themselves cats and dogs and horses even as they do you and me. There's no telling when Snuggleguts may die. So treat him well and enjoy his company. But let thy kitten roam free and do as he will. And remember, each time ye see thy pet may be the last. I will. Oh, I thank you both. You are kind, you two knights. We but do the right thing, Torm replied softly. Aye, that you do, Lara said to them. And there's few enough these days who take the trouble to. Chapter 20 Revelations at the Rising Moon by night dark dreams bring me much pain, but always comes after bright morning again. Mintiper Moonsilver, Bard, Nine Stars Around a Silver Moon, Year of the High Mantle. They rode steadily west. Narm peered about constantly, expecting attack, but Chandral found this forest friendlier than the elven court. She could see through thick tangles of trunks and gnarled limbs into deep, hidden places. Vines hung in soft-furred arcs from one branch to the next. Ferns grew thick on the ground. Chandral shook her head in wonder at man-shaped clumps of moss and trees as large about as cottages. Norm saw only danger, possible ambush, and concealing shadows. But as the day grew older and no attack came, he too began to enjoy the road to Deepingdale. This is beautiful, he said as they crested a ridge. Sunlight streamed down through the trees, lighting a small clearing as if it was a fire. Yes. Chandral said. I've never really seen these woods before, though I lived just a day's ride hence. She sighed. I wish I'd never known Spellfire and could just go home with you now, instead of fleeing half a hundred power-mad mages. Why not stay in High Moon? You have the power to slay half a hundred power-mad mages. Maybe... But I'd lose the Dale, and my friends, and even you. Powerful mages always destroy things around them. They work worse devastation than forest fires and brigands. Sometimes I think life would be much simpler without art. Narm smiled. I said that to Elminster, and he said not so. If I could see the strange worlds he walked, he told me, I'd understand. No, thank you, Chandral replied. I've troubles enough in this one. The road rose through a leafy tunnel of oaks, out into a clearing. Narm and Chandral rode close and quiet, looking for danger. Tiny, whip-like branches, fallen from trees above, lay amid the dead leaves and tangled grass and ferns. They seemed... Fairy fingers waiting to clutch or snap underfoot. Silence reigned. They rode on, and still no attack came. Nor did they meet travelers on the road. Chandral frowned. This is eerie. Where is everyone? Elsewhere for once, Narm said. Be thankful and ride while we've the chance. I would be free of the Dales, where everyone knows of us. Your spellfire can't triumph forever. Chandral shivered. I've thought about that. Thus far, we've been very lucky. We've also fought many who knew not what they faced. Ere long wizards will strike at us with spells crafted to disable me or foil spellfire, 
and then how shall we fare? Narm sighed. Ah, Shan, you moan a lot. Adventure you wanted, adventure you have. Did you hear Lancerol's definition of adventure? At that first feast in Shadowdale? Chantrel wrinkled her brow. I did overhear it, something about being cursedly uncomfortable and hurt or afraid, and then telling everyone later that it was nothing. Aye, that was it. They rode over another rise with still no sign of travelers. Tis a long way to Silvery Moon, Narm added thoughtfully. Do you remember all the harpers Storm named along the way? Yes, do you? His lady replied impishly. Narm shook his head. I've forgotten half of them. I wasn't born to be a far traveler, nor did Merimars teach me to be one. Chandral laughed. I'll bet. If much of the realms is as beautiful as this, I won't mind the trip ahead. Even with a hundred or so evil priests and mages after us. Chandral wrinkled her nose. Just don't call me mage killer or such like. Remember, they come after me. I've no quarrel with them. I'll remind the next dozen corpses, Narm replied dryly. If you leave enough for me to speak to, that is. Chandral looked away and said very softly, Please don't speak so of the killing. I hate it. Never, never do I want to become so used to it that I grow careless of my power. Who knows when this spellfire might leave me? Then, Narm, I'll have only your art to protect me. Think on that. They rode down into a dell cloaked in lush green moss. Pools of water glistened under dark and rugged old trees. Narm looked around warily. I, I think of it often. It seems this Chandrel's fated to grow old unhindered, by us at any rate. Nergoth said dryly to Salvarad when they were alone at the long table. Is there any other business? I, the matter of your mage, he was destroyed in Shadowdale. How, I know not, but know this. Malark perished at the hands of Chandral Chasser. You're sure? I watch closely, and others watch for me. All told, we miss little. Nergoth looked at him expressionlessly. What have you seen in the way of mages to take Malark's place in the purple? Xanistar, certainly. You could even give him the purple now. We've but the one mage among us. Why Xanistar? He's competent at art, but better than that, he's biddable, something Malark was not. I then, who else? The young one, thizzled, wild, quiet but reckless. He could be dangerous to us, or brilliant. Why not send him, alone and in secret, after spellfire with half a dozen warriors? He'll either bring it back, or get himself killed, or learn caution. We can't do ill by this. Oh, what if he comes back with spellfire and uses it against us? I know his true name, Salvarad replied smugly, and he doesn't know anyone has learned it. Nergoth almost smiled. Send your wolf, then. Perhaps he'll succeed where others have failed. Ours and those of Bane and Zentel keep. The gauntlet this girl runs will bring her down in the end, though we pay richly for it in blood. Salvarad nodded. Yes, she's only one young maid, and not warlike at that. We'll have her by and by, spellfire or no. I mean to have spellfire, too. But if we take her alive, she's mine, Nergoth. Nergoth raised an eyebrow. 
You can have women much easier than that, Salvarad. You mistake me, Blade Lord, Salvarad replied coldly. The power she's handled does things to people. I must learn certain things from her. Nergoth said, Then why not go after her yourself? Salvarad smiled thinly. I am intrigued, Blade Lord. I am not suicidal. Others have said that, you know. I know, Nergoth. Some of them even meant it. Night caught them in the woods. Norm and Chandral drew their cloaks against the cold and rode on. Mist rose among the trees. Norm watched it drift and roll. I don't like this. An ambush would be all too easy. Chandral nodded. All the wishing in the world won't change that. We're not far from the moon. Travelers who left it mid-morning expected to make Tasseldale by night. She looked into the soft silence of the trees. Tangled branches hung still and dark. Nothing stirred, and no attack came. Chandral sighed. Come, she said, spurring her horse into a trot. Let's get there. I want to see Gorstag again. The fire burned low in the hearth, and the taproom of the rising moon grew quiet as the last few guests went up to bed. Loreen quietly swept up fallen scraps, and Gorstag made the rounds of the doors. She heard his measured tread on the boards in the kitchen, drawing nearer, and her heart rose. They'd have time for a kiss, perhaps. She smiled in the glow of the dying fire. Gorstag, who carried no candle when he walked alone by night, came into the room. My love, I would ask something of you this night. Tis yours, Lord, Loreen said affectionately, reaching for the laces of her bodice. You know that. Gorstag coughed. Ah, uh, nay, lass, I be serious. Ah, uh, I mean, oh, gods look down. He drew in a deep breath and approached her in the gloom. Quietly and formally he said, Loreen, I am Gorstag of High Moon a worshipper of Timora and Tempest in my time, and a man of some moderate means. Will you marry me? Lorene stared at him, her mouth open, for a very long time. Then she was suddenly in his arms. My lord, you need not marry me. T'was not my intention to, ah, uh, trap you into such a union. Do you not want to be my wife? Gorstag asked slowly, his voice rough. Please, tell me true. I'd like nothing more in all Faerun than to be your wife, Gorstag. His smile was like a flash of sunlight, and his arms tightened about her. I accept. Lorene added, gasping for breath. Kiss me now. Don't hug the life from me. Their lips met, and Lorene let out a little moan of happiness. Gorstag held her as if she were a fragile and beautiful thing. They stood together among the tables as the front door of the inn creaked gently open. A cool breeze drifted in about their ankles. Gorstag turned, hand going to his belt. Aye, he demanded, before his night-keen eyes showed him who had come. Loreen let out a happy cry. Chandral! Yes, said a small voice. Gorstag, can you forgive me? Forgive you, little one! Gorstag rumbled, striding forward to embrace her. 
What's to forgive? Are you well? Where have you been? How? Outside, there was a snort and a creak of leather. In mid-sentence, Gorstag said, But you've horses to see to. Sit down, sit with Lorene, who has a surprise to tell you. I'll learn all when I'm done. I married Gorstag, Shanfril blurted. He's norms with the horses. Gorstag threw her a surprised look, but never slowed his step. By the light of the fire, Shandrel saw tears on his cheeks. And then he was gone. Loreen threw her arms about Shandrel. Lady Luck be praised, Shan. You're back and safe. Gorstag's been so worried, but now... But now... She burst into tears and held Shandrel tightly. Shandrel felt tears of her own stinging her eyes. Lorene, Lorene, she managed, voice breaking. We can't stay. Half the mages in Faerun are after us, and we're a menace to you even by being here. Fearfully, she stared at the tavern maid. She was touched that Lorene had missed her so. She'd always thought the older girl must find her tiresome. Would Lorene's regard be swept away by fear? Lorene met her gaze and smiled, shaking her head. Ah, little kitten, you've been hurt indeed to fear these doors shut to you. If to see you again we must entertain a few thousand angry mages, entertain them we shall, Gorstag and I, and think it a small price to pay. She laughed and hugged Shandrel again. Ah, Shan, thank you, thank you. You've made Gorstag so happy. He's like a youngling again. Did you not see him stride to the door like a young buck? You've made him happy, and he's not been since you left. But we must leave again on the morrow. How? He'll understand, Shan. He knows you're not ours anymore. I don't doubt he's taking the measure of your man right now. It's just that he didn't know what had befallen you. Could you not have left a note or some word? Shandrel sobbed, pouring out all the fear and regret and homesickness of the days since she'd fled. Lorene held her, rocking her wordlessly, until tears gave way to shuddering breaths. She kissed the crown of Shandrel's bent head. Be not so full of sorrows, little kitten. I'm most grateful to you. The body in her arms made a bleating, questioning sound. Lorene hugged her more tightly. Gorstag was so upset over you one night that he couldn't sleep. I comforted him. He'd never have permitted me to do as I did if he'd not been so in need, and he'd never have asked me to be his wife. Shandrel looked up, hair in disarray across her reddened eyes. He did? Gorstag? Oh, Lorene! Her tears were happy this time, and she hugged the tavern maid with bruising force. Lorene fought for balance and thought, Ye gods, if this is what adventure does for a woman. A woman? Shandrel? But I, she is a woman now. This was not the girl who'd slipped away from the kitchen. This was a lady with a lord of her own, and something else, something beyond the weapons worn so easily at hip and boots. Shandrel had a quiet confidence of power hidden, but none of the arrogance of many adventurers who came to the inn. Shandrel, what's happened to you? she asked quietly. Shandrel gave her an almost haunted look. Oh, you can see it so clearly? Lorene nodded. Aye, but I know not what tis. She raised a hand to Shandrel's lips. No, tell me not, if you would not. I needn't know. But you should know. Tis not something easily believed, though. 
I hope Gorstag will be able to tell me more about why I have it. Lorene grinned. Then it can wait until after you've soaked your feet and eaten. I'll wake Corvin. No! Shandrel said sharply. No, please, wake him not. I can't trust his cooking. No offense to you, for my own good reasons. I'll cook, if you'll have me. Lorene frowned. Did Corvin bother you? Tis not that, Shandrel said. Please trust me and wake him not. I'll tell you, but tis better not to rouse him. Then I'll not leave your side while you're here unless Gorstag or your man's at hand to protect you, Lorene said firmly. You can tell me what you like after you've rested. Come to the fire. Shandrel let herself be led to a warm, high-backed chair. Lorene poked the fire into new flames, set fresh wood on it, and went for a bowl. When she returned, Shandrel's head had fallen under her shoulder, and she was asleep. Narm held the bridles of both horses, his body tense, ready to flee if need be. He peered into the moonlit mists, but could see or hear no creature moving in the silence. Wait, Shan had said. Come after me only when you've stood so long that you grow cold, and if you wait that long, come carefully, ready for war. Narm shifted nervously. Was he cold enough? There was noise within. The door Shandrel had entered by was flung wide. Out strode a burly, craggy-faced man with gray-white hair and eyes wet with tears. He stretched out a strong arm to Narm. Well met, and welcome to my inn. I'm Gorstag. Your Shandrel's Narm? Narm squarely met his gaze and swallowed. Yes, I was here almost two months back with the mage Merima. Shandrel's told me of you, sir. I am at your service. Gorstag chuckled. Well, you can serve by leading one horse round to the stables with me. He set off with a horse and three mules in tow. Norm followed into a warm, strong-smelling barn, where a sleepy boy on night watch unhooded a lantern and fetched water, brushes, and feed. In companionable silence, they set to work. You know the art, Gorstag asked gruffly as they bent to the same bucket. Norm nodded. I was trained in Shadowdale. Shan and I've come straight from there. He drew in a deep breath. Where we were wed under Timora. Gorstag's head snapped up. He turned a looming shape against the night. Narm felt suddenly shy under this old man's stern, clear eyes. He said no more, brushing warrior who nickered appreciatively. Pivoting from the horse's flank back to the bucket, Narm found his gaze caught and held by Gorstag's stare. Stepping back, Narm still said nothing. After what seemed an eternity, Gorstag stalked over to the first of the three mules. Tell me how you met Chandral Chasser. Narm studied the innkeeper's broad shoulders. I saw her first here and liked what I saw, though we never spoke. The next morn I left with my master and we made our way to Mithranor. Gorstag's arms stopped their rhythmic brushing, and then, in silence, resumed. We met with devils, and my master, Merimar, was slain. I was rescued from the same fate by the knights of Mithranor, who patrol there. Later, I returned to that ruined city and saw Shandral from afar. She was the captive of a cruel witch-mage, the Shadow Sill. I tried to free her, calling on the knights for aid. 
we ended up in a Dracolich's lair, a cavern that collapsed during a mighty battle of art. Shandrel and I were trapped together. We thought we'd never get out, so... Norm paused in embarrassment, studying the mule. We came to care for each other. I love her, so I asked her to marry me. Gorstag nodded and chuckled. Aye, twas the same for me. He made a clucking noise, and the stable boy instantly reappeared. Gorstag nodded at the beasts and told him, See to them all, the very best of everything, as if a fine lord and lady rode them. He waved to Narm to follow him out, and then turned back to the boy. Because they do. As they walked through the misty, moonlit night, Gorstag said, My house is yours, but you seem in much haste. How long can you stay? Norm hesitated. We must leave on the morrow, sir. Many have tried to slay us. Shandrel, these past few days, and we'll try again. We dare not tarry. Elminster told us to be sure to call on you, and Shandrel insisted, too. But there's danger to us in stopping, and we want not to bring it upon you. The innkeeper's brow furrowed. Can you say more? I'd rest easier, Norm. And call me Gorstag, mark you. If I knew where and why the little girl I reared is riding, who'd do her ill, and why? I've not the right to answer you, Gorstag, Norm replied. Only my lady should speak on this. I can say that those who pursue us follow different causes, but are powerful in art. Therein lies your peril, and Chandral's secret. They went inside to find Lorene regarding them with a warning finger to her lips. She knelt by a chair before the fire. Norm raced forward. Behind him, Gorstag smiled at that. She sleeps, Lorene said as Norm bent anxiously near. Shandrel moved her head and murmured something. They all came close to listen. Norm, she said. Norm, we're here. We're home. Wait here. Wake Gorstag. Come carefully. Ready for war. Narm kissed her cheek, and in her sleep she raised a hand to pat his head. Then, suddenly, she was upset. She went for you, Shandrel cried faintly. She went for you, and there was not time. I had to burn her. Shan, Shan, Narm said urgently, shaking her. It's all right. We're safe. Yes, safe, Shandrel replied, awake now and looking up at him. Safe at last. She kissed his hand. Her gaze turned to Gorstag, who stood looking gravely down at her. I am sorry. I'd no wish to be a trial to you. I should have told you where I'd gone. I was a fool. Gorstag smiled. We all play at being fools betimes. You're back safe, and naught else matters. Shandrel thanked him with her eyes. We can't stay, I fear. We're fleeing far too many to vanquish or avoid if we stand here. We must ride on in the morning. So Narm said... And said twas for you to tell us why. Wilt do so, lass? Shandrel said, Have you ever heard of Spellfire? Gorstag nodded sadly. Your mother had it. I rode with her. Oh, lass, oh, Shandrel, beware the cult. Norm said ruefully, if you mean the cult of the dragon, we've fought them too many times already. Gorstag's eyebrows shot up. 
I... I do... He'd been about to say more, but froze when he saw Chandril gaping at him, flame flickering in her eyes. Fighting for calm, she asked in a voice that was almost steady, Please, Gorstag, who were my parents? Elminster told you not? Gorstag asked, gaping. Your mother was my dearest companion at arms. We adventured together long ago. Dama say the Incantantrix. If she'd a surname, I never knew it. She was born in the Sword Coast lands, but would never talk of herself. Are you my father? Shandrel asked softly. Gorstag chuckled. No, lass, no, though we were the best of friends, Dama and I, and often held each other by the campfire. Your father was Garthand, Garthand Chasser, a powerful mage by the time he died. I never knew where he was born, but in his youth he was apprenticed to the wizard Javanter of High Moon. A moment, if you will, Lorene said gently. This grows confusing. Pour ale, Gore, and tell your tale a proper. If you ask question upon question, Shan, it grows as tangled as a box of old twine. Shandrel nodded. You've told me the two things I wanted most to know. Unfold the rest as you see best, and I'll try not to break in. She waved her hands in sudden anguish. By the gods, why didn't you tell me all of this before? Years I've wondered and worried and dreamed. Why didn't you tell me? Easy, lass. Gorstag grew solemn. There were good reasons. Folk sought you even then and asked me where you came from. I never wanted to tell you a lie, girl, not since I first brought you here. Oh, you had wise eyes from the first. I couldn't say false to you. I knew these same prying folk asked you and the other girls questions when I wasn't about. If you knew the truth, they'd have tricked it out of you. So I said nothing, and let the rumors of my father and you pass unchallenged, and waited for you to be old enough to tell. He looked down at his hands. Sorry I am that you had to run away to find yourself, and freedom. The fault was mine, not to have seen your need sooner, and made you happier. No, Gorstag, Shandrel said, as the gods bear witness, I've had nothing but good from you, and I blame you not. But tell me of my parents, please, I've waited so long. Aye, here's the backbone of the tale. Javanter and your father Garthand fought the cult of the dragon in Sembia and hereabouts, Several times, on the eastern flanks of the Thunder Peaks, Javanter held an old tower that he called the Tower Tranquil. Garthand dwelt there with Javanter, and then alone, after cult wizards, destroyed his master. Garthand went on with his art, and went on fighting the cult. Gorstag gestured with his tankard and started to pace. At every turn, he'd work against them, destroying any he could catch unprotected. He grew in power, though the cult tried to slay him every ten day or so. One day he rescued the incantantrix Damase from them. They had her drugged, bound, and gagged in a wagon, on the way to their stronghold. Gorstag strode about the taproom, his voice low, but his eyes bright. 
Damase had adventured with me and others before and become known for a talent she had, a power that she wanted to develop by practice and experiment. She could absorb spells and hold their force as raw energy within her. She could use that force to heal and to harm, as blasts of flame that seared flesh, stone, even spells. So it was called spell fire. The cult snatched her to learn the secrets of spell fire, or at least compel her to use hers for their own schemes. No doubt they seek you now for the same reasons. That, Shandrel agreed, or my destruction. But please, Gorstag, say on. To know her life at last. She almost sobbed with eagerness, and Narm put his arms around her. Gorstag took down his axe and lowered himself into a chair facing hers, laying his great weapon on a table beside him. Then he turned his chair to better see the front door. Narm and Lorene glanced at it as if howling cult wizards might burst through in the next instant. But the night was silent. Beyond the windows, moon-dappled mist drifted. Well, the innkeeper continued, Garthand rescued Damase and protected her, and worked magic with her. And they came to love each other. They traveled much and pledged their troth before the altar of Mistra in Baldur's Gate. He peered into the depths of his tankard, found it empty, and set it aside. Here I speak of guesswork, my own, Elminster's, and of some others. We believe a cult mage, one Eremator, None know where his bones lie, cursed Garthand in an earlier battle of art. The curse bound a strange creature called a ball here from another plane of existence. Shandrel gasped, and Narm nodded grimly. In symbiosis with Garthand, Perhaps t'was a cult experiment to learn the powers of the offspring of a spellfire hurling incantantrix and a mage ridden by a ball here. Narm nodded. I fear so, but what happened after they were wed? Why, the usual thing betwixt man and maid, Gorstag said gruffly. In Elutriel they dwelt quietly. In due time, a girl, one Chandral Chasseur, was born. They returned not to the Tower Tranquil and the Dales, where the cult waited in strength and the danger to their babe was great, until she was old enough to travel. Eight months, that wait was. Gorstag shifted in his chair, eyes distant, seeing things long ago. They rode with me, east, over land, and the cult was waiting for us, indeed. Somehow, by art, likely, they knew and saw through our disguises. They attacked us on the road west of Cormir, at the bridge of fallen men. Gorstag shook his head and added quietly, Garthand was thrown down and utterly destroyed. But he won victory for his wife and daughter, and for me. He did not die cheaply. He took nine mages down to darkness with him, and three swordsmen. He stirred and turned his head to look at his one-time kitchen maid. His eyes shone in the gloom. He was something splendid to see that day, Shan. I've not seen a mage work art so well and so long from that day to this. 
nor ever expect to again. He shone before he fell. The old warrior's eyes were wet as he stared at memories. Damase and I were wounded, I the worse, but she could bear hurt less well. She carried less meat to lose, and twice the grief and worry, for she feared most, Shan, for you. When the cultists fled or were slain, we rode swiftly to Highhorn for healing. Damase had some doctoring there, but she needed more, the hands and wisdom of Saluni. We did not reach Shadowdale in time. Gorstag made a little sound in his throat that might have been a sob, but his grim voice was steady and quiet. Your mother's buried west of Shadowdale, on a little knoll on the north side of the road, the one west of Toad Knoll, a spot holy to Mistra. She appeared there to a magister once, long ago. Gorstag looked at the flagstones. I could not save her, he whispered, old anguish raw in his voice. Shandrel leaned toward him, hands reaching out to comfort. But I could save you, the warrior added, setting his jaw. And I did that. He caught up his axe and hefted it, as if he'd hew down the gods themselves if they came through his front door. I took you on my back and went through the woods from Shadowdale south to Deepingdale. T'was in my mind to leave you with elves I knew and try to get into the Tower Tranquil to get something of Garthen's art and writings for you. But elves I met told me the cult had plundered the Tower. They blasted its cellars, making great caverns to be the lair of a Dracolich. Roglithgor the Proud, whose horde had outgrown his own lair. Gorstag sighed. So I counted on being unknown to the cult. Few who had seen me ride with Damase and Garthand lived to tell the tale, and came openly to Deepingdale. I used some gems I'd amassed to buy a rundown inn and retire. He waved a hand at the taproom and growled. I was getting too old for rough nights on cold ground anyway. Few of my companions at arms were still alive and hale, and an old warrior who joins a band of young blades is asking for a dagger in the ribs. He shook his head. I brought you up as a servant, Shan, because I dared not attract attention. Folk talk if an old retired warrior lives alone with a beautiful girl child. I had to hide your lineage, and as long as I could, your last name, for I knew the cult would come if they guessed. He waved his axe as if it weighed nothing. That fight at the bridge... They could have slain us all by art from afar without so high a cost, if all they'd wanted was us dead. No, they wanted you, girl, you or your mother. He clenched his fist and told the roof beams fiercely, and I let them have neither. "'Twas the greatest feat I ever managed "'down all those years of acting and watching my tongue "'and yet trying to see you brought up proper. "'They've kept nosing all these years, the cult and others. "'I suspected your Merimar, Narm, of being one more spying mage. "'Who knows now? "'Some were fairly sure,' 
but had no taste for fighting rivals to death for you unless you truly were the prize. So they only watched to see if you'd show some of your mother's powers. I dreaded the day you would. If t'were too public a show, I might not have time to get you to the elves or the harpers or Elminster. The innkeeper shook his head. I was wary of the old mage, too, for tis great wizards who fear and want spellfire most. Even if I'd time to run, I might not have the time to get Lorene and the others away. The cult might well burn this house to the ground and slay all within if they found us gone. Some days I was like a skulking miser, seeking plundering foes under every stone and behind every tree and in the face of every guest. Chuckling, he said, Now you're wed, and I'm to be wed. You went to find yourself because I would not tell you who you were. You've come back with all my enemies and more on your tail, and you wield spellfire, and I'm too old to defend you. Gorstag, Narm told him firmly, you have defended her. All the time she needed it, you kept her safe. Now all the knights of Mithranor must scramble to defend her. She drove off Manshun of Zental Keep and wounded him, perhaps unto death. My Chandral needs friends, food, the occasional warm bed, and a guard while she sleeps. But if others give her those, tis not she who needs defending. Chandral laughed ruefully. There you hear love talking. I need you more than ever now. Didn't you see how lonely the symbol was, Norm? I'd not be as she is, alone with terrible power, unable to trust anyone enough to relax among friends and let down her defenses. The symbol? Lorene gasped. The Witch Queen of Aglarond? Gorstag, too, looked awed. Yes, Chandral said simply. She gave me her blessing. I wish I could have known her better. She's so lonely that it hurts to see her. She has only pride and great art to carry her on. In a far place, in a small stone tower beneath the old skull, the symbol sat up in the bed where Elminster lay snoring. How true, young Chandril, she said, tears in her eyes. How right you were, but no more. Elminster came awake, and his hand touched her bare back. Lady? Worry not, old mage, she said gently, turning with eyes full. I'm but listening to Chandro speak of me. The lass, you're linked to her? Nay, I'd not pry so. A magic I worked long ago lets me hear when someone speaks my name, and what they say after, for three breaths. Chandro's speaking of me now, and my loneliness, and how she wished to know me better as a friend. A sweet maid, I wish her well. I, too. She's at ease and unhurt, judge ye? I, as much as one can judge. The symbol regarded him impishly. But you, Lord, you are most surely at ease and unhurt. Shall we see to changing your sloth into something more interesting? Ah, Elminster replied eloquently as she tickled him. Have ye no dignity, woman? Nay, only pride and great art, I'm told, the symbol said, her skin gleaming silver in the moonlight. I'll show ye great art, Elminster said gruffly, reaching for her. 
an instant before he fell headfirst out of the bed in a wild tangle of covers. Downstairs, Leo chuckled at the ensuing laughter and began to warm another kettle. Either they'd forgotten him, or thought he'd gone deaf, or his master had ceased to care for the proprieties. About time, too. He began to sing softly. Oh, for the love of a mage. Because he was confident Storm was busy far down the dale and would not hear how badly he sang. These are the sacrifices we make for love, he thought. Upstairs, there was laughter again. It grows early, not late, Gorstag said, as Shandrel's head nodded into her soup. You should to bed, and then you both stay and sleep as long as your bodies need, before you set off on a journey fated to be long indeed, with no safe havens. We've not told you all yet, Gorstag, Narm said quietly. We've joined the Harpers, and we go to Silvery Moon to the High Lady Illustrial for refuge and training. To Silvery Moon? Gorstag gasped. That's a fair jaunt for two so young, without a warband escort. If I were but twenty winters younger, still it'd be a perilous thing. Stay with caravans for protection. Two alone can't survive the wilder lands west of Cormir, no matter how much art they command. We'll have to, Shandrel told him in a grim, determined voice. But we will take your advice and stay with caravans. And if you don't mind, we will sleep tomorrow through. Foes or no foes, I can't stay awake much longer. Come, Lorene said, to bed, lass, in your old place in the attic. Gorstag and I'll sleep there, too, by the head of the stair, the other side of the curtain. I'm not leaving you alone while you're here. I, Shandrel pushed against the table to rise. In the dark passage that led to the kitchen, cold eyes regarded the four folk in the taproom for one last instant ere turning to flee into the dark. So the wench had returned, had she? Certain ears would give much to hear speedily of this. Gorstag? Lorene asked sleepily. Happy love, put that axe down at hand here and come to bed. I, Gorstag replied. There's something I must find first. He ducked into the darkest corner of the attic, at the end beyond the stairs, and dragged aside a chest bigger than he was. Then he reached to the base of a roof beam, and part of it came away in his hands. He took something from a small, heavy coffer protruding from the length of wood, and then replaced everything. Bearing whatever he'd unpacked, the innkeeper came back across the broad boards of the attic floor to the curtain. Narm? Shandrel? I, we're both awake. Come in, Narm replied from where they lay. Gorstag did so, lowering something by its chain to Narm. Does your very touch drain items of art, Shan, or only when you will it so? Only when I call up Spellfire, Shandrel told him, peering at the pendant. What is it? "'Tis an amulet that hampers detection and location of its wearer. "'Keep it, lass, and wear it when you sleep. "'Only try to take it off when you must use spellfire, or you'll drain it. "'Wear it now, and you may win a day of uninterrupted rest tomorrow. "'I only wish I had one for each of you, "'but the necromancer whose neck I cut it from wore only one.' Narm chuckled. You should have looked for his brother. 
Someone else had slain him already, Gorstag replied with a grin. It seems he liked to torment everyone with summoned beasts. Someone finally grew tired of such claws and fangs, went to his tower with a club, threw stones at the windows until he appeared, and then bashed his brains out. The someone was eight years old. A good start on life, Narm agreed with a yawn, and put the amulet about Shandrel's neck. This has no ill effects. Nay, tis not one of those. Good night to you both now. You've found the chamber pot? Aye, tis the one you remember, Shandrel. Peace under the eyes of the gods all. Gorstag ducked back through the curtain. Lorene grinned at him, indicating the empty bed and the great axe on the floor beside it. Now close the bedroom door, love, so the gooblies can't come in and get us. Gorstag looked at the trap door. Oh, I... He closed it, dragging a linen chest over it. There. Now. To sleep at last. Or twill be dawn before I've even lain down. Clothes flew in all directions, and Lorene was rolled into a bear hug and kissed with delicacy. She chuckled and patted his arm. Good night to you, my lord, she said softly and rolled over. She had barely settled herself before she heard him begin to breathe the deep, steady draws of slumber. Once an adventurer, always... She fell asleep before she finished the maxim. When Narm awoke, sun streamed through the small, round windows, and the curtain had been drawn back. Lorene sat on a cushion beside them, mending a pile of torn linens. She looked at Narm and smiled. Fair morn, hungry? Eh, uh, no, no. But I could be. Narm sat up. Shandrel lay peacefully asleep, the amulet gleaming on her breast, and Narm's discarded robe clutched in her hands. Narm smiled and tugged at it. A small frown appeared on Shandrel's face. She held to it and raised one hand in an imperious, hurling gesture. Narm flinched back but no spellfire came. Shen, he said quickly, "'Tis all right, love. Relax. Sleep." Shandrel's hands fell back, and her face smoothed. Still deeply asleep, she murmured quite distinctly, "'Don't tell me to relax. You—' and trailed away into purrings and mutterings. Lorene suppressed a giggle into a sputter, and so did Norm. I will let her sleep, the mistress of the rising moon said kindly. There's a pot of stew on the hook over the taproom hearth, untouched by Corvin's hands, mind. I've bread and wine here. Go on, I'll watch her. Well, I... My thanks, Lorene, I'll... He looked about him. Lorene chuckled and spun around until her back was to him. Sorry, your clothes are over there on the chest, if you can live without that robe Shan's so fond of. Uh, thanks. Norm scrambled out of the bed and dressed. Shandrel slept peacefully on. Lorene gave him a friendly pat as he started downstairs. He was still smiling as he went past the kitchen and came face to face with Corvin. The cook and the wizard came to a sudden stop, perhaps a foot apart, and stared at each other. Corvin had a cleaver in one hand and a joint of meat in the other. Norm was barehanded. Silence stretched. Corvin lifted his lip in a sneer but Norm stared calmly and silently straight into the cook's eyes. 
Corvin raised the cleaver. Narm never moved, and never took his stare away from Corvin's own. Suddenly, Corvin cursed, backed away, and ducked into the kitchen. Narm promptly strode into the taproom, where he greeted Gorstag as though nothing had befallen in the passage. Elminster had been right. This Corvin wasn't worth the effort. A nasty, mean-tempered, blustering man. All bluff. All bravado. Another Merrimar, in fact. Narm chuckled. He was still chuckling as he went back past the kitchen door. There was a crash of crockery from within, followed by a ringing clang, as if something metal had been violently hurled against a wall. Chapter 21 A Sunset for Several Mind you, do your dying right. Most of us get only one chance at it. Mintiper Moonsilver, Bard, Nine Stars Around a Silver Moon, Year of the High Mantle. Thizalt cursed at the sun. Too late by half. They'll be out of the dale and into the wilderness before nightfall. How, by Mistra, Talos, and Samaster, am I to find two children in miles of tangled wilderness? They'll stay on the road, Lord, one of the grim cult warriors told him. So you think, Thizalt snarled. So Salvarad of the Purple thinks, too, but I cannot believe, too, who have destroyed the Shadow Sill, an Archmage of the Purple, not to mention two sacred Draculiches, can be quite so stupid. No, why would they run? Who in Faerun has the power to match them? More likely, they'll creep quietly about the wilderness, slaying whomever they come upon, while the rest of us search futilely until we're all slain. I must reach them before dark, before they leave the road. We cannot, the warrior said simply. The distance is too great. No power in the realms could. No power? Thizalt fairly screamed. No power? Ha! That which I bear is power enough. He reined in sharply and cast his eyes over the mounted warriors in leather. Ride after us, all of you, to Deepingdale and the Thunder Peaks. If you see my sigil, thus, on a rock or tree, know that we've turned off the road and follow likewise. We? asked the warrior. I, Thizalt the Overly Demanding, and you, since you doubt my power. Trust in it now, for it's all that stands between you and Spellfire. Now dismount! No, leave your armor behind. He touched the gaping cult swordsman and spoke a word. Warrior and mage vanished in a silent instant. The other warriors stared. One of the riderless horses reared and neighed in terror, and the other snorted. Quick hands caught bridles. Stupid beast, a swordsman muttered. Why'd it take fright? Because the smell of its rider is gone, an older warrior told him sourly. Gone, not moved away, but suddenly and utterly gone. T'would scare you if you'd any wits, a stupid beast. It goes where you bid and knows not what waits, but you knowingly ride to do battle with two children who've destroyed Draculiches. So tell me now, just who is the stupid one? Clever words, was the bitter reply, made amid many rueful chuckles. Another veteran asked, You think we ride on a hopeless task? The answer was a nod. Not hopeless, but I've seen many young and over-clever mages, like the one who just left us, come to a crashing fall. This latest, grandly rising wizard has no more wisdom or power than the others. What if I tell Nergoth of the Purple your doubting words? What then? 
snarled the warrior he'd rebuked. The old swordsman grinned. Say such, if you will. Tis my guess you'll be adding them to a report of Thizzle's death. I've served the cult a while. I know something of what I say. His tone was mild, but his eyes were very, very cold. The other warrior looked away first. They rode on in grim silence, seeing neither mages nor gouts of spellfire. For that, they were every bit as happy as the horses beneath them. A wild-eyed chandrel buckled and laced at the head of the stairs. We must away, she panted to Narm as Lorene helped her kick on boots. Others come, I dreamed it, the cult and others, hurry and eat. But, but... Deciding not to argue, Norm ate stew like a madman, wincing as he burned his lips on hot chunks of meat. On bare feet, he danced about Chandrel. Lorene took one look at him and fell back onto the beds, hooting in laughter. Forgive me, she gasped. Chandrel fastened her belt and started down the stairs. Narm halted her with a firm arm to the chest. He handed her the bowl of stew. After a moment of straining against him, she rolled her eyes and spooned it into her mouth. With a murmur of pain, she burnt one lip and sat hastily on the steps. You two? Lorene hooted. I doubt I'll ever again see a mage of power so discomfited. Woo! Ah! but you look funny, gobbling like that. You should see me casting spells, Narm said dryly. When did she awake? Scarce had you gone down when Shan sat upright, straight awake, and called for you. Then she scrambled up all in haste, crying that she'd dreamed of foes fast on your trail. Narm said ruefully, She's probably right. Did your art have the desired effect? Charantir asked. Yes, Ysail responded, passing a hand over her eyes. This dream weaving's wearisome. No wonder Elminster was so reluctant to teach me. Yet I think I scared Shandrel enough to get her moving. She sank back in her chair. Ah, me. I'm ready for bed. Charantir rose. I'll get Merith. Ysail shook her head. Nay, nay, tis sleep I need, not cuddling. You've no idea, Cher. Tis like a black pit of oblivion. I'm so tired. With that, the Lady Mage of the Knights drifted into her pit and was gone. Charantier found a pillow for Ysail's head, drew off the mage's boots, and wrapped her friend in a blanket. Then she drew her sword and sat down nearby, laying the bare blade ready across her knees. After all, it had been over long since Manshoon had worked mischief in Shadowdale. In haste, they kissed Lorene farewell, thrust the empty bowl into her hands, and were downstairs and out through the taproom into the sunshine before they drew breath. In the inn yard, Gorstag stood with their mounts and mules harnessed. The packs lashed to the last two mules bulged suspiciously here and there. Bread, sausage, cheese, hand casks of wine, pickled greens, a crate of grapes and figs, a coffer of salt, some torches, Gorstag said briefly. The gods watch over you. He enveloped Chandrel in a crushing hug and swung her up into her saddle. Carry this, he said, and pressed a bottle into her hands. Goat's milk, drink it before high sun tomorrow, or it'll go bad. He turned like a swordsman whirling from a kill in battle, shook Narm's hand in a bruising grip, took him by both elbows, and lifted him into the saddle. 
he thrust a small, bright disc of silver into his hands. A shield of Timora, blessed by priests in water deep long ago. May it bring you safe to Silvery Moon. He stood looking up at them. You're in haste, and I was never one for long gods go with yees. So fare you well in life. I hope to see you again before I die, with you both as happy and hale as now. I wish you well, both of you. He stretched up to kiss them both. You've chosen well in each other. Then he patted the rumps of their horses to start them on their way, and raised his fist in the farewell salute warriors give to honored champions. As they turned out of the rising moon's yard, Chandral burst into tears. Gorstag stood like a statue, his arm raised in salute. He stood so until they were out of sight. When Lorene came down, she found her man muttering prayers to Timora and Mistra and Helm. She put her arms around him from behind and leaned against the might of his many-muscled back. He trembled as he left off praying and began to cry. It was dark in the meeting chamber of the Cult of the Dragon. A single oil lamp flickered on the table between the two men. You really think this boy mage can defeat Chandral, who's destroyed our best and most powerful? Dargath of the Purple snarled. No, Nergoth Blade Lord replied, and so another of our bone dragons pursues her right now. Another Dracolich? We haven't many more sacred ones to lose. True, Nergoth said his gaze growing colder. This one went of its own will. I compelled it not, nor asked it to go, but I did not forbid it either. One does not forbid Shagrilar anything. Dargith looked at him, mouth dropping open. For the love of lost Samaster, Shagrilar the Dark flies? Gods preserve us. They'll hardly start doing that after all this time, Nergoth answered dryly, reaching to extinguish the lamp. Darkness descended. Suddenly, they were in a place of fragrant vapors, pots, and knives. The cult swordsman snorted unnecessarily. A kitchen! At his words, the cook standing with his back to them whirled from his bloody cutting board, cleaver rising. Thistle smiled coldly. So pleased to see us, Corvin? The sour-faced cook struggled to regain his composure. Hatred, envy, fear, and exultation chased rapidly across his mean face. Why, Thistle? Hush, no names. How long ago did the wench leave? And what's our way out of here? Outside, to, to the back of the inn, yon door, Corvin replied with only a slight stammer. Or to the front, that door. Turn right into the tap room, then left across it to the front door. She and the boy mage left but ten breaths back. You'll be able to catch them if... Have horses? Where are the stables? Around the side, that way. There's a good strong black and a stouter but slower bay, and... The cult thanks you, Corvin. You'll receive an appropriate reward in the fullness of time. With a snap of his cloak, Thizalt strode into the passage, the warrior at his heels. The swordsman drew his broadsword. Corvin? Lorene whispered as she came out of the open pantry, eyes dark with anger. Do you know those... those folk? The cook stared at her, white-faced, and then raised his cleaver and went for her. Fury and determination twisted his face. 
Lorene cast a tin of flour at that snarling face and fled into the hall and the tap room beyond. It was empty. She ran across it, dodging between tables, and burst out the front door. Before her, Gorstag stood with his hands locked on the forearms of the swordsman. They stood straining against each other, the warrior's sword shaking as he forced it up to strike. Behind them, the dark-cloaked mage spurred out of the yard on their black gelding. Lorene ran as hard as she could, sobbing for breath. The front door of the rising moon banged open. Corvin emerged. Her death. Lorene ran on, sliding desperately, knowing she had to warn Gorstag before Corvin's cleaver could reach him. The two men were only ten paces away. Six. Three. Gorstag dropped to one knee and pulled hard on the swordsman's wrist. The sword lunged harmlessly over and past him. Gorstag sprang up, his fist driving into the warrior's throat. Throat, neck, and man crumpled without a sound. Gorstag whirled in time to catch Lorene about the shoulders and spin her to a halt. Love? Lorene pointed, frantically. Corvin, he serves the cult. Look out! The cook put on a last burst of speed, hacking at them. Gorstag pushed Lorene away to one side and leaped away to the other. The cleaver found only empty air between them. Corvin looked wildly at both targets. Too late. Fingers of iron took him by the neck from behind. Staggering, the cook lashed out, only to have his cleaver wrist deftly captured and twisted. Corvin let out a little cry and dropped his weapon from burning fingers. Gorstag wrenched him around until they were face to face. So, first you molest my little one, and now you'd slay my bride-to-be? You threaten me with steel here in my own yard? And you serve the cult of the dragon in my own kitchen? His voice was low and soft, but Corvin twisted in his grasp like a hooked fish, face white to the very lips. This has been coming for a long time, Gorstag added slowly, but at least I've learned something about cooking. The hand that held Corvin's wrist darted to the cook's throat, whip fast, and twisted mercilessly. There was a dull crack, and Corvin of the cult was no more. Gorstag let the body fall into the mud and turned to Lorene. Are you hurt, my lady? Is there fire or ruin behind you in the moon? Lorene shook her head, wide-eyed. No, Lord, she whispered, close to tears. I'm fine. Thanks to you. We're safe. I, then, Gorstag said, and he looked down the road. The dust of the mage's furious exit still drifted. But will Narm and Shandril be? Find me the fastest horse while I get my axe. Lorene stared at him in horror. No, you'll be slain. Leave my friends to die because I did nothing? Gorstag's face was like iron. Find me the fastest horse. Lorene rushed toward the stables, tears blurring her sight. No, oh gods, no! But this morning, it seemed that the gods were as hard of hearing as usual. Gorstag bolted back out of the inn, his axe in his hand. Frightened guests followed to gawk. In the yard, he found a grim-faced dwarf on a small, weary, and mud-spattered mule. The dwarf came to a halt before the glowering innkeeper, and rolled down out of his saddle with practiced ease. 
Using his broad dwarven axe as a walking stick, he leaned heavily on it as he limped over to Gorstag and peered up. Well met, your Gorstag? The innkeeper was looking grimly toward the stables, whence an empty-handed Lorene staggered, face stricken. Aye, that I am. Have you seen a companion of mine, the adventurous Shandrel? She waited on tables here once. The dwarf growled. I hear she rides with a young mage, now, and hurls spellfire. I, I have. Gorstag snapped, his axe lifting warningly. Who then are you, and what's your business with Chandral Chasser, my daughter? I'm come in all haste from Shadowdale, the dwarf replied, looking up at him with a glare as harshly steady as his own. From Charantir, Rathen, and Torm of the Knights of Mithranor, I heard where Chandral was headed and followed. I'm sent by Storm Silverhand of the Harpers and Elminster the Mage, and bear a note to tell you to trust me in this. Here, read it. Now tell me where Chandral is, man, for time draws on, and my bones grow no younger. Gorstag grinned and snatched open the parchment. Not so sour, Sir Dwarf. Life's less a trial to the patient. I, the dwarf replied, for most of them lie dead. Tell me where Chandral is. A moment. Gorstag looked from the parchment to Lorene and saw that she was shaking. Dead, she whispered, all of them, every last horse and mule and ox. Lightning still crawls around the stables. Damn all wizards! Gorstag put his arm around her and held the parchment out so she could read what was written too. To Gorstag of High Moon, by these words, well met. The bearer of this note is the dwarf Delg, a swordmate of Chandral in the company of the Bright Spear, after she left your house. He serves no evil master, and bears Chandral no ill will. Trust us in this. He has submitted to all our tests of art in this regard, and it is true. The cult of the dragon destroyed the company, and it was thought only Chandral survived. This Delg, left for dead in Overzember Vale, made his way to the shores of the Sember, where he was found by elves and taken to priests of Tempest. While they were healing his wounds and praying for guidance as to what task they should set him in return, Tempest himself spoke, saying that Delg's task was to defend the girl who wielded spellfire against seeking swords. So he comes to you for aid. Your part in defending Chandral is done, valiant Gorstag. We tend Damase's place of rest and remember. Aid this one as best you can, and you will be honored greatly. You shall have then in your debt Elminster of Shadowdale and Storm Silverhand of Shadowdale. Gorstag read the letter, frowned a little, and looked up at Delg. You've missed them. They rode west from here some short time ago now. A hostile mage follows close behind. Hinges of the Nine Hells, this is no time to be standing about reading, the dwarf growled, hobbling back to mount his mule. Up and go like the wind. She's in trouble again and in need of old Delg. Gorstag glanced dubiously at the exhausted mule. Delg saw that look. I make haste in my own way. Fare thee well, Gorstag. Leave this chase to me, and stay by your lady. Tis the greatest adventure you can have. He grinned and rode away, raising his arm in a warrior's salute. Gorstag returned it 
and stood like a statue watching him go. Loreen stroked his arm thoughtfully and said nothing. After a time, Gorstag looked away from the road. Well, mayhap we'd best go in. His stride was slow and reluctant as he turned his back on the yard with its two sprawled corpses. Most of the staring guests fell away before him. One opened the door and ducked inside. They followed in a general flood, anxious to be away from their host and his blazing eyes. All save one. A priestess of Ogma, who'd said almost nothing since her arrival hours ago, glided forward to block Gorstag's way. The letter, good man. I must say it. The innkeeper's glare had teeth in it. No. Good man Gorstag, the priestess purred, golden fire kindling in her eyes. I must insist. Refusal would not be wise. You serve the binder, and so should respect bindings, the innkeeper growled. This is one such. Leave me be. The priestess stabbed out one arm to snatch at the letter. An arm that shouldn't have reached that far. Gorstag fell back in astonishment. Give me the letter, the Ogmanite snarled. Now! Gorstag's face darkened. Don't command me in my own inn. I'll not... Golden flames leaped into a bright glow in the eyes locked on his. Enough! Doom is upon you, fool human! Both of her hands reached for the parchment. Arms snaked past to curve behind him, darkening swiftly. The face drooped into nightmare. The holy crimson vest melted away into a glistening black bulk and... Loreen screamed her horror. Gorstag tossed the letter to the winds and used both frantic hands to swing his axe up and then down. Hot blue and wine-red gore spattered him. He snarled in fear and swung again, hacking as hard and as furiously as ever in his life. He danced to one side in case those tentacles, a flailing forest of them, sought to strangle him from behind. A droning, whistling cry arose from the nightmare thing. Tentacles severed, rubbery innards cleft. Drenched with its stinging gore, Gorstag kicked and sliced and roared his defiance. He suddenly stood staring across much riven darkness into Lorene's terrified eyes. White, and trembling, she held her tiny belt knife in her hand, at the end of an arm that dripped gore clear up to the shoulder. Gorstag gave her a grin. "'Tis dead, lady,' he lifted his axe in celebration. "'We've done it, one less hunter after Shan.' He looked down and gave one tentacle a hearty kick. The smell of death was sharp, like a cask of wine gone bad. Everywhere, dark fingers of blood spread across the churned and trampled mud. Hmm, I was going to ask you to fetch a stew pot, but somehow... Lorene didn't smile at his crude joke. She shook her head, eyes large and dark. Oh, Shan, what else is chasing you? Gorstag shot his lady a glance and asked, Are you well? Lorene nodded, her face pale, but with a hint of a smile. She put Delg's letter into his hand and put her hands on her hips. Of course, but there's a little matter of corpses lying about and its inevitable effect on our trade. Gorstag growled and went to put away his axe and find a shovel. 
He carried the letter very carefully in his hand and looked at it again as he went. A glowing sphere sank toward an ornate tabletop, darkening as the will that had driven it wavered. The noble lady of Waterdeep, who'd been staring so fixedly into its depths, reeled in her chair, aghast. Had the servants heard her scream? No! Amrun of the blood of Malug gasped. No! Her daughter was dead. Trembling with grief and fury, she sprang from her seat. The chair crashed to the carpets. She strode across the room to snatch aside a rich blue curtain. Sintre gone forever. The tall painting beyond was enspelled to glow, but she tore its knight's courting lady's scene aside to lay bare a plain stone door that it had hid. She almost snarled the words that would unlock the door and let her pass without awakening death. Thin lines of blue fire formed and receded. She snatched open the door. In the tiny, seldom-seen chamber beyond waited a horde of enchanted things, weapons enough to shatter a dozen back-country inns and scores of idiot innkeepers. Why? She might not stop slaying until all the dales were lifeless slaughter fields, with nothing left but vultures and crows. Sintre, gone forever. It had taken years upon years of scheming and lovemaking and poisonings and daring thefts to amass all this magic from fools of Faerun. And now, by the shadows, She'd use it to work many dooms. She... Amrun came to a sudden halt in mid-stride. She wavered precariously for a long, gaping moment. There was a man sitting on her magic. A gaunt man with none too clean robes who had a long white beard, a hawk-sharp nose, and blue-gray eyes that, meeting hers were fierce and sad. Who? She almost sang in astonishment. Ye may call me Elminster, many do, but ye'd do much better to listen before ye shriek anything more. Amrun gazed at him in frozen silence. She'd heard of Elminster. Oh, yes. And... Dalgrave did not issue his most infamous decree for nothing, the wizard told her mildly. He spoke so because I offered him the same choice I'm now giving you. Dwell hidden among humans, doing them no harm, and live. Or slay and meddle overmuch, and die. She swallowed, very much as a high lady of Waterdeep should, and shook her head. This man knew of the great Shadowmaster and his dark decree? I know who ye are, Amrun, Elminster continued, his eyes steady on hers, and have known who ye are for some years. Yet ye've dwelt here no worse behaved than most, save perhaps thy gaining of these pretties. Her enspelled things clattered and chimed as he dug one long-fingered hand through them, held it up, and let them trail back onto the gleaming, glittering heap. No less worthy of living in water deep than the bulk of thy neighbors. Yet the time has come for a certain truth to be made plain between us. If ye lift a single tentacle against any creature of Faerun hereafter, I will come for ye. After telling Dalgrave and all of Shadowhome who ye are and where ye are, 
Then we shall all have good hunting, and our kill shall be Amrun. The tall, trembling lady stared at him, eyes golden and terrible. Then she knelt, sliding slowly forward until her breast and chin scraped the flagstones. She reached out her empty hands, crossing one over the other at her wrists. Her forearms darkened into glistening tentacles, and with deft care she knotted them together in the Malgram gesture of abject submission. Wizard, she hissed, the smell of her fear sharp in the small chamber. She gazed pleadingly at him. Command me. Elminster rose with a small grunt of effort and rubbed one hip, producing a lit pipe out of nowhere. I'll go now and even leave ye all of these toys, despite the butchery ye must have done to gain some of them. Go not to High Moon, and do nothing against any being in the realms, and I'll let ye live to enjoy them a while longer. They gazed at each other, she tearful and trembling, he calm and implacable. She saw sympathy in his eyes. Avenging thy foolish children will but bring ye more pain, he added quietly, puffing on his pipe. Lonely ye may be, Amrun, and wronged and long hunted, but ye live here as a high lady, and that's more than most folk in this world can dream of. Enjoy what ye have, and try to be content, for if ye reach for more, ye'll lose all. This I swear. His figure faded. Magics gleamed through him in the gloomy chamber. I'll watch for ye, Amrun, not just as thy keeper, but if ye'll have me, in time, as thy friend. I'd rather see ye laugh and be happy than have to slay ye. Remember that. He was gone, his last words left behind. Amrun rose in tentacled fury, hissing. She lashed the air in rage and pain and loss. But when she sank down to the floor on her knees and wept, her sobs might have been those of any bereaved mother of water deep. Black tentacles became slender white arms. With them, she cradled one silver-sheathed wand as if it were the most precious thing in the world. In time, she fell silent and rose empty-handed. She closed the door on the gathered glowing death and the faint smell of pipe smoke and went to ring the servants for wine. Much wine. Chagrilar the Dark circled high above Thunder Gap. Cold winds whistled through the spread, bony fingers that were all that remained of its wings. Chagrilar was the mightiest Dracolich in Faerun, perhaps the most powerful there had ever been. Its eyes were two white lamps in the empty sockets of a long, cruel skull. It looked down on the world below with the cold patience of a being who had passed beyond the tomb and yet could fly. It flew lower, watching and waiting. So a human female dared to destroy Dracoliches? Death must find her. Lucky she must have been, and her victims young fools. Still, she must die. Armed with spellfire, she was headed toward Shagrilar's lair. Interesting. Like a silent shadow, 
Shagralar, glided among the clouds, peering at the tiny road called the East Way. It had been a very long time since Shagralar had been interested in anything. Thizalt rode hard, hauling savagely on the reins. To call up his special magic, he had to pass the maid and her mageling and get ahead of them, or find a height above their camp to keep them in view. It would not do to miss them now, or to get too close and warn them. He thought furiously as he rode. He wore no insignia and rode alone. He displayed nothing to tell Faerun he was a mage, nor that he wished anyone ill. Yet he was riding in brutal haste, dangerous as the road climbed into the peaks. His speed would warn anyone that all was not right, especially this couple, wary of foes. Thizalt slowed his mount, cudgeling his brains for a plan. In darkness, they could easily evade him. Yet, one had to sleep. They would halt to camp. Perhaps then would be the best time to attack. But only if he was close on their trail, yet unseen. Yes, that. A man stepped out of the trees right into his path, and Thizalt's horse reared. What fool? The startled wizard started to curse, wrestling to keep his seat. The man smirked, eyes calm and golden and very, very cold. There's a realm shaking over abundance of idiot wizards riding Faerun today. Hunting spellfire, I presume? With all your best blasting spells burning holes in your brain? Shocked, the cult mage stammered, H Who are you? Architrave, I am called. It's always nice to know the name of your slayer, don't you agree? Black tentacles stabbed out like sudden spears. Thizalt twisted back frantically and fell head over heels from his saddle. Rolling furiously, he found a tree to get behind and another to claw his way along until he was upright. Gasping, he whirled. The mocking man had become a black, surging wave that rolled over his horse. Wild-eyed, it snorted, bucked, and lashed out with its hooves. Black tentacles closed around its neck with lazy grace, twisting. Thizalt muttered the only spell his terrified mind could think of to take him away from here. The dying horse rolled once more atop the black thing. Its tentacles lanced through the air toward Thizalt. He finished the spell, and it snatched him up into the sky. A single black tentacle streaked after him, but he soared frantically aloft, racing on toward Thunder Gap. In his wake, tentacles fell, a dead horse was flung free, and a glistening black bulk raged and coiled in a silent, quaking storm. Becoming a small, obsidian-hued dragon, it leaped into the sky and snapped its still-flowing jaws experimentally thrice. Flapping powerful bat wings, a trifle unsteadily, the false worm arrowed west in the wizard's wake. This was no day for mercy. Delg's head snapped up. Something had flashed past him, low above the trees. Too large to be a bird. Something that had lacked wings. A man? Whoever, or whatever it was, had been going fast and hadn't been witless enough to soar above the open road. Delg could see nothing of it now through the trees ahead. Another wizard? After Shandrel? Well, why not? Wasn't it time for every last dragon and leviathan and many-headed thing in all Faerun to join the chase? The dwarf shook his head and rode on, 
thinking of Berlain and Ferristil and Rymel, all dead now, never to laugh with him again. Mayhap he'd join them soon. Kicking his mule into reluctant hurry, he watched the road ahead, his axe ready. Chagrilar looked idly in its wake, past the few wisps of cloud, back along the road to... Another dragon? So small and as black as seawater on a still night, but coming like a summer storm, cleaving the air at great speed. The Dracolich eyed it, feeling fierce exultation, and dipped one of its wings to whirl and dive. What mattered who this worm might be? Now it would be Shagrilar's latest kill. Too long had it been since he'd pounced on something worthy of the effort. Too long. When it saw its doom, it had time only to acquire a look of terror in its strange golden eyes. Then Shagrilar gave it death, literally plunging through it in velvet silence, raking with razor-keen claws and biting with long bone fangs to tear it to wet scraps and cantles. Casting them away, the Dracolich whirled again and soared westward, as if nothing had befallen. Behind it, unregarded, the riven worm fell, dwindling as it tumbled, smoldering tentacles feebly clutched at the uncaring air, an architrave of the Malgram struck ground in a series of wet, spattering crashes. Shagrilar flew on. Ah, but that had felt good. Now, to the puny humans. They could not be much farther west, unless... Ah, there below, on the road, two human riders with mules, one female... Silently, Shagrilar descended, skeletal head peering. Yes, yes, this must be her. And if not, what matter? What pair of humans could hurt Shagrilar? Like a gigantic arrow, the great Dracolich plunged out of the sky. Silent death comes for you morsels. As it descended, Shagrilar could see that the she-human was beautiful. It opened bony jaws wide to give her death. Silently. Patiently. A bright net of stars blossomed in the shade of a roadside tree. Motes fell away, drifting and darkening. A slender figure stood amid the smoking gore, and tangled, twitching tentacles. Her white hand darted down, stretching impossibly long, to pluck something from the heart of steaming, malgram flesh. A dull, dark gem was cradled to a breast that trembled with sobs. You fool, Architrave, I warned you. Blue fire flashed. Another net of stars whirled up to enshroud the weeping woman and flared to snatch her back to a tower in water deep before a certain old mage could catch her. Stars faded and were gone, leaving only tears. Magusta watched those stars dwindle. She laughed, gloating. So they both earned themselves the fate of fools. Her brother shook his head. Who was the woman? Kin to us, or some human she-wizard? Someone who wanted a magic trinket back, not one of the blood, or she'd have tarried to do the usual things. Magusta turned away from the whirling brightness of her scrying spell. With them both dead, We've all Faerun to ourselves to play in, thanks to the Dark Decree, so long as we watch out for Elminster. Strelane's eyes flashed. I believe I'll pay that old mage a visit to test his vaunted vigilance and magical might. 
It could be that he daughters or has dwindled to half the mage he used to be. If I take a suitably innocent human guise, there'll be little danger. After all, he's only human. Magusta shrugged. Your peril, Strelane. I'd stay far from that wizard and keep him busy with meddling humans whom we set a-striving with a whisper here and a murmur there. Her brother snorted. So you forge your own cage and climb eagerly in, not me. He strode away and then turned, his tentacles curling toward her. Or are you playing a darker game, sister? Are you going to snatch spellfire for your own the moment my back's turned? Magusta shrugged again. Hardly. See what that seeking earned Sintre and Architrave? More than that, two score Zentilar ride hard after the spellfire made right now. She turned back to the scrying sphere. I wouldn't want to miss watching the fun that'll befall. Zents! I thought they were dragon cultists. The dragon lovers were riding down Little Lady Spellfire, too, but the Zents butchered them even as Architrave was dying. She turned the sphere so he could see its other side, where tiny warriors rode hard along a rising road. Thundergap's going to be a crowded place soon. Someone follows us, Norm said, peering back over his shoulder. Someone? Shandrel asked him. One? Alone? Yes, a child or someone short on a mule, Norm said doubtfully. An odd traveler to ride alone through wilder lands. Well, tis an open road. It can't be unused by any means. Shandrel turned in her saddle. Behind them, the land fell away in gentle hills to dark woods and Deepingdale. Peering, she thought she could see the rising moon, or where it must be. Tears touched her eyes, and then she saw bony death gliding coldly down out of the sky. Norm! She screamed, kicking heels to her mount and climbing onto its neck in wild urgency. Get down! Norm looked and saw. He frantically tore Torm's gift from his neck and threw it away. Shandrel had one glimpse of his white face before the world exploded. What in the name of the soul forger was that? Delg stood open-mouthed in his stirrups as the great skeletal bulk arrowed down out of the sky. "'Twas like a dragon, but... "'Twas a skeleton. "'Twas... "'Oh, by the load luck of the Iron Stars, "'it must be one of those dracoliches Elminster spoke of.' Delg swallowed and sat down in his saddle again. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. No dwarf stood a chance against that. Nor, he thought grimly, did little Shandrel, even with fire magic and a boy who could cast spells. The mule had slowed to a walk. Delg booted it mercilessly in the ribs, waving his axe so that it flashed in the sunlight. Get you going! He snarled into its ears. I'm late for a battle, and they'll be needing me. Never fear. Thizalt flew low over the trees to one side of the road. The wind of his flight whipped past his ears. He had to find them and get ahead of them. Soon. There was a flash and roar of flame ahead. Startled, Thizalt veered to one side, rising for a better look. Were they in a fight? This might prove even easier than he'd thought. A vast, dark skeleton wheeled in the air. Thizalt gasped. A sacred one. But how came it here? And who was it? He'd never seen one so large and terrible before. 
as he stared at the Dracolich. Its cold orbs met his own, and it turned toward him. Its skeletal jaws looked somehow amused. Blue-white lightning leaped and crackled from the great Dracolich's maw. Thizalt had no time to protest that he was an ally. It struck. All his limbs convulsed. He was dead, mouth open to begin his speech, even before Shagrilar's bony claws struck his body and tore it apart. His secret, long-guarded magic, fell to earth, lost in the endless trees below. Far away, Salvarad of the cult sighed and turned from his scrying font. The Zolt would never take the purple now. Chandral rose grimly. The stink of cooked horseflesh was strong. Faithful Shield had lived up to her name. Chandral's arms tingled, but she was unharmed. The Dracolich's flames had poured strength into her. But how had Narm fared? She ran across the smoking road, seeking him. Lightning cracked overhead, but she did not look up. Where was he? A heart-twisting, blackened tangle of horses' legs and smoldering mules met her gaze. She swallowed and ran forward, peering anxiously into the smoking slaughter. Narm! Oh, Narm! He had no protection against dragon fire. He could well be dead, and their child would never know its father. None of that find him first. There he was, moving weakly, half buried under scorched baggage. He was alive. Oh, gods be praised. Chandral crashed down on her knees beside him, tearing aside smoldering straps and scorched cloth. Narm moaned. His hair smoked, and the left side of his face was black and blistered. Oh, Narm, beloved! Cracked lips moved. Lids that no longer had lashes flickered open. Watery eyes met hers, lovingly, and then looked past her and widened. Look out, love! Narm hissed hoarsely. The Dracolich comes! Chandral looked up. The legendary Shagrilar wheeled directly above them, vast and dark and terrible. Though it was only empty bones, the undead creature was awesome. Chandral shivered as she gazed at its fell might. Soaring lazily, it turned and dived down the sky. Run, Shan! Norm croaked from beneath her. Get you hence. I love you. Chandral, go! No, Chandral said through threatening tears. No, Lord, I'll not leave you. Great, bony jaws opened above. Chandral lay gently atop Norm's blackened body, shielding him as much as she could. Norm groaned in pain. She braced herself to lift her weight off him. I love you. As the roar of the Dracolich's approaching flame grew in the air, Chandral put her lips to Narm's and gathered her will. Searing flame swallowed them. Clangadin, aid me, Delg muttered. His mule bucked under his aching thighs. The road ahead was one great smoking ruin. A cone of flames had just raked it, and in a moment the swooping Dracolich would be above. The mule bucked again. Oh, blast! Delg burst out. He found himself somersaulting forward through the air. His frantic grab for the saddle horn missed. At least he still had hold of his axe. He tucked it close against him so it wouldn't be chipped in the hard landing. The mule's saddle was empty when raking claws swept the poor beast skyward, rending and tearing. 
The Draculich let out the first angry sound it had uttered in many long years, a long, loud hiss of frustration. Shredding the mule as if it were a rotten rag, Shagrilar wheeled. Destroying foes had never taken this long before. Once more, just one last dive. In the heart of the inferno, Shandril strained to draw in the dragon fire that ravaged Narm's helpless body. Through their joined lips, she felt the fierce energy flowing, sluggishly at first, then faster and faster. Gods, the pain! Her lips were seared as if by hot metal. Tears blinded her. Her tormented body shuddered. Bright agony clawed and snarled through her. She held fast to Narm until the last of the flames swept over them and were gone. Energy flowed into her. Narm's own life force streamed into her. She was draining him to death. Hastily, she broke their kiss and stared down at his slack, silent face. His eyes were dark, unseeing. Oh, Narm, she'd no art to heal him. What had she done? Bitterly, Shandril felt the surging energy swelling within her. Her veins were afire. She was bloated with more than she could hold for long. The pain. Into her mind came Gorstag's voice, telling of her mother. To heal or harm. Heal. She could heal as well as burn? She gathered her shaking limbs, lay tenderly on Narm again, and set her lips to his. Closing her eyes, Shandril willed energy to flow out of her, gently, slowly, like cooling water. Energy flowed into Narm. She willed it into him, fiercely, and felt his feeble heartbeat strengthen. He moved under her, struggling to speak. Shandril shed fresh tears as she poured more energy into her beloved. Let him be once more whole and strong and... Bony claws raked agony across her back. Shandril was torn free of Narm and flung to the road beyond by Shagrilar's angry strike. Pain almost overwhelmed her. She shrieked aloud, flames gouting from her mouth. Oh, Timora, the pain! She had ignored another bolt of lightning from it as she healed Narm, but the great Dracolich could slay her with claws as surely as if she had no spellfire. Pain tore at her. She twisted and thrashed in the dust of the road. She could feel her blood pour out. Blood. Blood. She'd seen more spilled this ten day than in all her life before. And she was heartily sick of it. Well, now she could do something about it. Shandril opened her eyes and looked for the Dracolich. A fierce anger filled her, and exultation rose to join it. She could heal. She could use spellfire to aid as well as to slay. Crawling on hands and knees, Shandril saw Shagrilar sweep down again, eyes glimmering at her from its cruel skull, claws outstretched. The one-time thief of Deepingdale met that chilling gaze and laughed. From her eyes, flames shot forth, two fiery beams of spellfire that struck the bone dragon's eyes. Smoke rose from its skull, and Shagrilar screamed. Bony wings sheared away to one side. Shandril laughed in triumph, and a white inferno of flames roared from her mouth into the blinded Dracolich. It reeled in the air, blazing, and crashed to the ground. Ignoring its snaps and thrashes, she turned to finish Narm's healing. 
As she crawled back to him, she bent her will to heal herself. Soothing relief spread across her torn back, and the pain faded. Norm's skin was cold under her fingers, and he lay unmoving. Shandrel poured energy into him, but the fires in her were much lessened. She shouldn't have healed herself. She had too little left, and the Dracolich was still dangerous. It wasn't wasting spells on her any longer, so she couldn't gain more spell fire. Oh, Timora, was her luck always to be bad? No, it could be fatal. Just once. Now, perhaps, and all her worries would be over. Shandrel scrambled up, looking wildly around for the Dracolich. If it clawed her now... She heard a strange smashing and splintering sound. Peering cautiously over the smoking mules, she saw an axe rise and fall in Shagrilar's shuddering ribcage. Bone chips flew. The Dracolich had already lost its wings and two claws and was trying feebly to turn its head to blast its attacker. The bones of its neck were smashed in two places, and smoke rose from its blackened skull. A hearty kick sent more pieces of bone flying. The descending boot was planted firmly on one of Shagrilar's claws, ere its owner chopped brutally downward. Delg! Shandrel cried in happy astonishment. Racing toward the burly dwarf, she laughed and cried at once. His gleaming axe hacked tirelessly on the Dracolich's splintered bulk. Through whirling shards of bone, he grinned at her. Well met, Shan. Long days pass, and you've gotten into trouble, as always. Only this time you're in luck. Delg's here to lay low your pet. Shandrel swept him up in a happy embrace, clear off his feet. She let out a whoop of effort and staggered to set him down again. Delg, Delg, I thought all the company were dead. The dwarf nodded soberly before his fierce grin came again. I, so did I, he told her, beard bristling. But I've found you at last. Found me? Do you know what's happened to me? This Dracolich is but the latest. Scarce a day passes without someone trying to slay us because of... that which I wield. Spellfire, aye, so they've all been telling me. All? Aye, Elminster and Storm and the Knights and Harpers and all. I rode the legs of my mule a few finger widths shorter following you. You've become important indeed, lass, in less time than I've seen most heroes and legends rise. The dwarf waved his axe. So let's see this spell fire again, before we move Norm somewhere safer. Well enough, Shandrel said, and waved at the dismembered Dracolich. Do you know this one? Never seen it before I buried my axe into it. Does it matter? No, I suppose not, Shandrel replied, and let fly with roaring spellfire that blasted Shagrilar's flopping skull to bone shards. As the smoke died away, Shandrel looked at Delg, saw fear lurking in his eyes, and shrugged. I'm not safe to be near these days. So much killing since first I left the moon. Is butchery what all the legends are built on? Aye, the dwarf said gruffly. Didn't you know? He stomped toward Narm. Let's drag your lord a good distance from all this carnage and see what we can salvage before sunset. She walked beside him. We? You'll come with us? Aye, if you'll have me along on your bridal journey and all. The dwarf looked embarrassed. He squinted up at her almost defiantly, hands twisting on his axe. 
We're friends, lass. I'll stand true by you and your lord. Few enough such you'll find, mark you. And one needs little more in life than good food and good friends. The company's gone now, all save for you. So old Dell go ride with you. He swung his axe onto his shoulder. If you make it to Silvery Moon and are sick of me, we'll part ways. I hope you won't be. Tis a trial indeed when you be my age, befriending pretty girls anew. Folks get all the wrong ideas, you see. The old dwarf handed her his axe. Hold this while I carry your mage down the road a piece. Easy, lad. You'll feel better soon enough. I know. I've lived through battles enough to tell. Come, the sun waits not for all my talking. Nor did it. But it was a happy camp that sunset. In the morning, the dwarf walked with the young couple as they headed west into the mountains. It was a clear day, and the green dales spread out behind them as they climbed to Thunder Gap. All was peaceful. A lone black falcon soared high above in clear blue air. The day passed with no attack nor hurling of spellfire. Delg told Narm fierce tales of Chandral's daring with the company, and Narm told Delg of the struggles in Mithranor and Roglathgor's lair, and how his lady Spellfire had blasted apart the mountain top. The dwarf looked at Chandral with new respect, chuckling, "I'll not ask you to hold my axe next time." Near sunset on the heights, they turned and looked back over the marching trees. The road dwindled down, down from where they stood to high moon, hazy in the distance. Who could know, looking at it, that this beautiful land could be so dangerous? Narm asked quietly. Delg smiled and said nothing. Never mind," Shandrel replied, putting a hand on her man's arm. "We found each other, and that's worth it all." They turned and walked into the evening together. As soft stars came out above them, they thought of many mornings to be shared ahead, and were very happy.